Oh, quick, quick, she's coming. Oh, hide the flowers. The banner okay, isn't straight. It's a leaving do, not the Sistine Chapel. Is everyone ready? Yeah, yeah. Aggie, two, three, four. For, for she's, she's a jolly good fellow. For she's a jolly good fellow. For she's a jolly good fellow. Yes, thank you. Enough. And so say all of us. Enough, please. I do have a train to catch. Speech! 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 Come on! Speech. Oh, oh, oh dear. It is the end of an era, really. Uh, Mr. Pedman tells me you'll all keep your old jobs. Of course, you'll be Pedman promotions, not Raisin promotions. Shame! Thank you, Roy. And uh, I wish you all good luck. As politicians get grubbier and pop stars tackier, your lies will have to be even bigger. But never forget the lady who taught you all to lie so beautifully. Agatha Raisin. <laughs> Goodbye. Oh, Mrs. Raisin. Mrs. Raisin, I've got you a present. Oh, Lucy, you really shouldn't have. It's a photo frame. Yes, I guess that. I have seen one before. I uh, just thought you're at an age where your memories must be very precious to you. Thank you, Lucy. I must buy you a diary. One day you can get a life to put in it. Oh, Aggie, sweetie, we're going to miss you. Roy, it's the Cotswolds, not Timbuktu. You can still visit. Got you a present. Why does everybody want to be nice to me now that I'm going? Well, I couldn't get you a gold watch. I didn't want to remind you of your advancing years, so I've got you... A gold cigarette lighter. Thank you, Roy. Mm. Every time I light up, I shall think of you. Agatha Raisin by M.C. Beaton. Dramatised for radio by David Semple. Starring Penelope Keith as Agatha. Morning. Plenty Benson and Hedges, please. Oh. Good morning to you, too. Sorry, I have just spent half an hour behind a tractor that was going at five miles an hour. Five miles an hour? Must be in a hurry. Here, four ninety-nine, please. Uh, do you by any chance have a list of um, village activities? Well, there's line dancing in the village hall on Wednesdays. Yes, there probably is, but I mean evening classes, oh, societies. Let me have a look. Oh, you're in luck. You've come just the right time for the biggest event of the year, the Carsley Village Baking Competition. A baking competition? That's right. Who can bake the best cakes, the best pies, look, the best quiches. And that's the highlight of the year, is it? Well, thank you for the cigarettes. Just out of interest, this baking competition, who's the judge? Oh, Reginald Cummins-Brown. He lives next door to you. You're like him. He's an incomer, too. Oh, really? How long has he lived here? Twenty-five years. Vera! Ah, hello, old thing. It's only me. Reg, who was that woman you were talking to? Oh, oh that's our new neighbour, uh, Mrs Raisin. A huge PR lady in London, so she kept telling me. I know the type. Hair that comes from a bottle. And a mobile phone. She'll rip down the honeysuckle, and she'll stick up a satellite dish. Well, she seems a decent enough sort, asking me about the baking competition. Oh, I get the picture. She waltzes into this village and wants to take it over. She wants to run the place. Well, she won't succeed. We don't need that type around here. If you say so, dear. Evening, just after seven. Now on BBC Radio 4, it's time for Front Row. Francine oh. Stock looks back. Hello. Hi, Aggie. Roy! How's the Cotswolds? Been chased round the barn by any horny farmers? I've only been here a week. I haven't gone native. Well, you know what you said about how I could come and visit? Yes. Well, can I come and visit? Uh, you can come next weekend on one condition. And what's that then? Bring me a quiche from Economides Quichery in the King's Road. Don't they have any quiches in the countryside? They do, but I am entering a baking competition, and I want to make sure my quiche wins. Um, Aggie Love, I may be missing the point here, but if it's a competition, aren't you meant to bake it yourself? Roy, country people make things and grow things. City people pay other people to make things and grow things. Now, I am entering this competition, but I am obtaining my quiche the London way. Oh, Aggie, 
PR lost its number one star when you retired. <sighs> oh, smell that country air. It's much fresher than London. I know. I'm having to smoke an extra ten a day just to compensate. Now, uh, over there, that is Vera Cummings Brown. Her husband's judging this. Oh, the legendary Vera. Yes, mm. the woman who spent two weeks avoiding eye contact with me. Give me the quiche. Uh, Mrs. <clears throat> Cummings Brown. Yes. A quiche for your competition. Oh, well, don't give it to me. I don't want grease on my fingers. Put it down there. Now, I need your details. Name? Agatha Raisin. I live next door to you. Oh. Oh, so you do. I'm the one you stare at through your neck curtains. Oh, jolly dee. And your friend? This is Roy Silver. Hello. Oh. An assistant at my PR company in London. And did you make the quiche, Roy? Oh, not me, no. Oh, you look like the sort that might make quiche. Right. Put this label on your dish and take it into the tent down there. Judging is at three o'clock sharp. So, that's Vera next door, eh? Does she live in a thatched cottage? Yes, why? Just wondered if I could set fire to it. I'll lend you my lighter. Uh, excuse me, is this where we put the quiche? Uh, oh, that's right, miss. Ooh, made that pie yourself, didn't you? Of course I did. Oh, <laughs> you ain't looking for a new husband, are you? Been there, done that. Never again. Wow. Good luck, miss. You'll need it. If Cummings Brown is the judge, my money's on Nancy Cartwright. Really? Mm. Well, we'll see. I think the village might be in for a shot this year. Nice talking to you. I know. <laughs> you pulled there, Aggie. Don't be ridiculous, Roy. Right, I'm off to win some anchovies. Uh, keep your voice down and pretend to be normal. Special commendation for her superlative elderflower wine. And now, the prize for this year's peace competition. The overall standard was very high and does you all great credit. Oh, for God's sake, get on with it. But there can only be one winner, and she is Nancy Cartwright. Oh, what? For that pile of scrambled eggs? Aggie, shush. Oh, thank you, Frank. Thank you so much. And here is your prize. Ten pounds. Ten pounds? How's she going to celebrate? Crack open a bottle of leaf for our milk. <laughs> Mrs. Raisin, we do not have the facilities to retain unsuccessful entries. What would you like us to do with your quiche? I neither know nor care. Oh, there's no need to be quite such a sore loser. Well, waste not, want not. I'll take this home. Reg can have it for supper. I'm going out tonight. Fine. I hope his stomach can retain unsuccessful entries. Don't start. Come on. Hello? Mrs. Raisin? Cooey? Mrs. Raisin? Who the hell is... Oh, oh we meet at last. Uh, my name is uh, Mrs. Glocksby. Uh, my husband is the vicar here, and we were just saying we must invite our new neighbour round for toasted tea cakes. I'm on a diet. Oh, well, I'm sure we can rustle up some Malvita. <laughs> um, will we see you in church tomorrow? If you do, it'll be a miracle. Uh, nice talking to you. Come on, Roy, we're going. Um, sorry about my friend. She's just had a traumatic experience. Oh. Coming second. It's never happened before. Reg? Mm. Reg, have you mm. seen my Ouija board? What? What? What Ouija board? Oh, pay attention. Uh, the one I use in Blythe Spirit. I'm ten minutes late for rehearsals. Uh, I've got a splitting headache, and you make no effort to help. Oh, that's the microwave. I've heated up some of that raisin woman's quiche for you. Actually, it looks quite appetizing. Much as I can't stand the woman, I'm surprised you didn't let her win. Hmm. Well, she did face some very stiff competition. Well, I know why I didn't win. Because I haven't got what Nancy Cartwright's got. What? Boobs like twin airbags. <laughs> Shut up. Pour some more gin. I mean, I went to all the trouble of trudging around the shops. Uh, 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 excuse me, I did that. Well, I sent you. I hired London's very best pastry chef, but he gives the prize to salmonella on toast. Oh, well, I hate to interrupt your embittered rant, but I really do need some beauty sleep. I'm on the early train tomorrow. 
I'll drop you off on my way to church. Oh, no, Aggie. You've not found God, have you? I need all the friends I can get. I mean, right now, what have I got to look forward to? More gin? Hmm. Ah, <clears throat> uh, oh, hello. Uh, are you alone? Oh, good. Yes, yes, the old dragon's gone out too. <laughs> no, no, just staring at the box, eating quiche. It's rather good, actually. It's from that raisin woman. What? Of course we'll really do it. Oh, believe me, Nancy. We'll have... We'll have another go, and we will make a break for it. Uh, uh, we'll... Look, hold on. I, I'm not feeling too clever. No, it's... Uh, look, I... I better, I better go. Uh, <laughs> Very good sermon, Vicar. Very interesting. Thank you, Mrs. Harvey. Oh, Mrs. Raisin. So glad you could come. Yes, well, uh, I won't be able to make it every week. Oh, well, you're here today, at least. Oh, Mrs. Elman. Um, uh, excuse me, madam. Are you Mrs. Agatha Raisin? Yes. I am Police Constable Griggs. This is Detective Constable Wong. Perhaps we could have a word. You'd better come to the cottage. Now, look, if it's about that speeding ticket... It's I... nothing to do with that, Mrs. Raisin. It's about your neighbour, Reginald Cummings Brown. Oh, that old bore. What's he done now? Not a lot. He's dead. What? He's dead. And we believe he may have been poisoned. Well, what's that got to do with me? I don't feed him. His wife says the last thing he ate was your quiche. They brought it home last night. But that quiche came from... That quiche was homemade. Indeed. Well, perhaps you could show us how you made it. Yes. Right, right, of course. It's through here. Mm, nice kitchen. Perhaps you'd like to show us your ingredients. Well, it was a normal quiche with uh, normal things, like herbs. And where do you keep your herbs? I, I've run out. What else? The usual. Eggs. Uh, I, I think. Yes, eggs. De definitely eggs. And these eggs would be... Um... In the fridge. <laughs> I suppose you had the last one for breakfast, did you? And uh, what else? Um, uh, flour. And where's that then? In here. Uh, no, not, not that one, sorry. Uh, oh, heavens. Damn these cupboards. Things are never where you put them. Mrs. Raisin, perhaps your flour is behind the microwave Indian banquet or the boil in the bag spaghetti bolognese. Might be. Mrs. Raisin, in my humble opinion, you would have to look up the ingredients to make a boiled egg. Yes, officer. Guilty as charged. So, where did this quiche come from? Economides quicherie in Chelsea. Oh, dear. Please, don't tell anyone I cheated. No, I won't need to. They'll read all about it in the local paper. You've reached the answer phone of Agatha Raisin. Please leave a message. Oh, hello, Aggie. It's me. Just calling to say thanks for a fab weekend. I've been ever so busy. I'm sorry it's taken me so long. Uh, to Roy, it's me. Oh, yeah. Cool screening, eh? What have you been up to? Oh, dear. You haven't heard. Remember the quiche competition? Yeah. I poisoned the judge. You what? He took my quiche home, ate it, dropped down dead. It's cowbane poisoning, apparently. No. Hang on, a cowbane? Is that, is that like mad cow disease? No, it's a plant. It grows on marshland and somehow it got mixed up with the spinach. But I spent 25 quid on that quiche. It was organic. Precisely, so they don't use weed killer. Hence, weeds get mixed up with the spinach. I know, but even so, what are the chances? Right, I've been reading about it on the internet. It happens occasionally. Most people survive, but Reg had a weak heart. It still sounds strange. Is there anyone actually benefits from Reg being dead? Well, it gives us something to talk about. And uh, Vera is lapping up the weeping widow role. 
I'm not surprised she's such a star of amateur dramatics, swanning round the village, telling anyone who listened that she wants to be alone. Who else was close to Reg? Well, there's that woman who won. Nancy Cartwright. Terrible cook. Breasts like Dolly Parton. Perhaps I should go and talk to her. Where do women in white stilettos go for entertainment? Oh, like I'd know. Uh, oh, I don't know. Um, no, well, how about bingo halls? Bingo, yes. I'll try that. Look, Aggie, please be careful. People can get very angry if you poke your finger into things like that. Yes, that. thanks, Roy. I've got to go. Someone at the door. I'm coming! Mrs. Bloxby. Oh, my dear Mrs. Raisin, I do hope we're not disturbing you, but Mrs. Cummings Brown here wanted a word. Yeah. Uh, please, come in. Sit down. Thank you. Uh, would you like a tea? A coffee? Oh, no, thank you, Mrs. Raisin. This is very hard, but I just want to say, I forgive you. Well, we all make mistakes, and sometimes our mistakes have terrible consequences. You couldn't have known. I mean, such a lot of food scares these days that there must be something very wrong with the world. There, there, dear. Do you have a tissue? Oh, dear. I just feel so alone. What am I going to do with my life now? Well, you've always got your amateur dramatics. Yes. Oh, my poor Reg. I want to go home. Of course, my dear. I'll come with you. No. I want to be alone. Should we go after her? Oh, no, no. She needs a little while to collect her thoughts. One sees a lot of this as a vicar's wife. We're always here for the lost and the bereaved. I feel rather lost myself at the moment. And as if Reg's death wasn't enough, now the whole village knows I'm a cheat. Oh, dear. Well, there has been some gossip, of course, but people are still a bit sensitive. Last month, the village shop was raided by a man wearing a, a monkey mask. They're all convinced the robber must have come from London. Why? Oh, well, because, of course, no one from round here could do such a thing. Oh, honestly, <laughs> why are people so ignorant? Oh, I know, but once you've spent some time in Carsley, you'll find we're not as small-minded as you think. Well, right now, I'm tempted to sell up and go home. Oh, and I thought perhaps you'd found a new home here. I was going to invite you to the Carsley Ladies' Society. We have a charity auction coming up, and, well, with all your experience, you could have... Oh, well... Carsley Ladies, that sounds fun. But, um... Do you know, Mrs. Bloxby, living in a village, what I miss most is a really good game of bingo. Oh. <laughs> oh, Mrs. Raisin, forgive me, I wouldn't have put you down as an aficionado of bingo, but yes, we do have sessions in the village hall on Wednesdays. Thank you. I must go along and try my luck. Oh. <laughs> All right then, ladies, highs down, everybody, for your full house. Thank you. Oh, 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 here we go. So sorry. Excuse me, is this seat taken? Oh, you can have it. I'm off. My numbers never come up. Just a minute. I'm sure I've seen you before. Aren't you Nancy Cartwright? Well, you're Mrs. Reason. Oh, it's terrible business about Reg. I know. I still can't believe a perfectly ordinary quiche can kill someone. You're not the only one. What? Well, mind you, was Andy having an incomer in the village they could blame? Nancy, are you saying what I think you're saying? I might be. Oh, let's get out of here. Well, I live just across the road. The one with the... Ah, uh, that's right. The one with the rusty car on the front lawn. Yeah, that's me. Oh, it's dry London gin, Angostura bitters. I never liked the stuff till Reg got me onto it. Thank you. Nancy, what do you really think happened to Reg? I don't know. <laughs> Reg was a randy old bugger. He said I was the living spit of Marilyn Monroe, the only woman he'd ever loved. Oh, but he said that to lots of women. Did Vera know? Of course she knew. Never seemed to mind, though. Oh, come off it. Vera, Lady of the Manor, Cummings Brown. Well, they never seemed to last. Reg had his flings and then they'd leave him. I don't know why. But I was different. He was going to stay with me, run away with me. Oh, yes? Last hour of his supper, said he'd had enough of Lady Snobby controlling him, putting him down. He said he'd meet me outside the Red Lion after midnight. 
and we drive off together. Be two little lovebirds living up in the south of France. And yet you're still here, drinking pink gin. I couldn't do it. After the meal, I come home, pack some things and had a bath. I lay there. I could hear my husband snoring on the sofa. I just close my eyes for a minute. When I wake up, it's three o'clock in the morning. I've turned into a prune. I couldn't do it. No, I never can. That's it. Oh, no, that's my husband. I swim reading about Reg Cummins Brown. He had coming, if you ask me. Who's she? Well, this is Mrs. Raisin from Puddle Duck Cottage. Just call, social alike. What do you want? I'm collecting money. Children in need. What about out-of-work labourers in need? Uh, quite. Well, um, I'll be off then. Yeah, you've got a nerve. Begging for our notes from the likes of us. Haven't got a penny. Her seat to that. Oh, John! Oh, not in front of Mrs. Raisin. Nancy, if you want me to stay, I will. No, no. Please go. Well, you know where I am if you need me. Don't come back! Home, sweet home. Nicotine, sweet nicotine. Oh, honestly. Morning, Mrs. Raisin. Remember me? Constable Wong. How could I ever forget? Please call me Bill. Come in, Bill. What have I done now? Oh, nothing. I come bearing gifts. A little something in my basket here. Have a look. That's a cat. We can't get nothing past you, can we? Oh, <laughs> she's the runt of the litter, and if we don't find her a home, she's going to be drowned. There must be someone in the village. I've tried everyone. But I can't have a cat. Oh, dear. Well, I don't know what I'm going to do with her, then. Oh, I see. You come here as a friend, call me Bill, but you're testing me to see if I could do it. What? You want to see if I could allow a creature to be killed? To see if I'm capable of it. <sighs> Mrs. Raisin, no one's accusing you of anything. We're absolutely satisfied it was accidental. But I have got another reason for giving you this. Oh, yes? But a little birdie told me you were thinking of leaving. And I thought, well, an animal might make you feel more at home here. I mean, <laughs> she certainly made herself at home. Oh, uh, look at her there, scratching your furniture. No! Not the chaise long, oh. please. <laughs> So, um, why do you want me to stay? Maybe I like you. And with you here, I'm not the only outsider. Outsider? You're a pillar of the community. Well, I'm a Gloucester boy, but my dad's half Chinese. So do a lot of people. I'm an alien. Half the village thinks I'm an alien. And the other half thinks I'm a murderer. So, what do the police give me for protection? A terrifying, ferocious, tiny orange kitten. <laughs> we do things differently in the Cotswolds. Look... I'll leave you two to get better acquainted. No, wait. I'll call back tomorrow, see how you're getting on. But I don't want a cat. Oh, you'll come the lover. Bye. Thank you very much. No, not under the sofa. I'll never get you out, and I'm already late for the Carsley Lady Society. Come here. Come here. Oh, you need a name. I've never named a cat. Back in London, I'd hire market researchers and road test the alternatives with demographic groups, but I think I'll call you Chivers. Oh, Mrs. Raisin, I'm so glad you came. You find us in the midst of some embroidery. Embroidery? We're working on the Carsley Ladies' Tapestry. It's a pageant of 500 years of village life. We're displaying it at the auction. I haven't sewed since I was eight. Ah, well, your job is to wander around and say, that looks nice. <laughs> now, if you'd like to go on through, I'll join you shortly, but I must just replenish these macaroons. Oh, hello, Mrs. Raisin. Nancy, nice to see you again. Yeah. Sorry about my John. I mean, you caught him on one of his off days. How are things at home? Oh, fine. Absolutely fine. Come on, I'll show you the tapestry. This is beautiful. I know. All our lives laid out in six-inch squares. Over 50 years old, this is. Really? The village seems rather fond of animals. Why is there a gorilla in the village shop? Oh, that's the evil so-and-so what robbed my shop. 
That's right, the man in the monkey mask. Slightly unusual subject matter for a tapestry. Well, Mrs. Bloxby didn't want me to put it on, but I said it's traditional. We've always included everything what's happened. And there's his getaway car, see, pointing towards London. Oh, yes. And how did you deduce he came from London? Well, it stands to reason, doesn't it? A lot of bad things come from London. Oh. Oh, come on, Mrs. Raisin. Why don't you try a few stitches? Because I really don't want to ruin it. Oh. I didn't think you looked the type to sew. You'd pay someone to do it for you. <sighs> Mrs. Harvey, are your scissors blunt? No. No, they're fine. I'm surprised when you've spent ten minutes stabbing me in the back. Oh. I just like a bit of honesty in people, that's all. I know I cheated in the competition. I know you believe in the ethnic cleansing of anyone south of Watford. But why do you think I went to all that effort to win a pastry competition? I suppose you were in it for the money, like all London people. Do you really think I would spend £25 on a quiche so I could win a tenner? Well, you tell me then. Why did you do it? I did it because I want to fit in. I want to be part of a community, but if you don't want me, then that's fine. There's always Tuscany. Macaroons, anyone? Oh, oh Mrs. Raisin, may I have a word, please? I'm sorry, Mrs. Bloxby. I seem to turn every occasion into a blazing row. Oh, in the Church of England, we call it a challenging discussion. But it's not about that. Mrs. Mason and I were just discussing the charity auction. Now, usually she is the auctioneer, but she says, as you have such a lovely speaking voice, this year, would you do the honours? At last, something I can do. Making a noise and making money. I'd be delighted. Cheers! Where are you hiding now? Oh, not under the sofa again. My poor knees. Oh, what's the mat? Someone in the garden. Chivers! Chivers, mind, mind the glass! Come here! Let, let, let me pick you up. It's a brick. There's a note wrapped round it. It says, I should sell up and go back to London. Only a language I wouldn't dream of using in front of a kitten. Thanks, Charlie. Right, Mrs. Raisin, I should keep you safe till morning. If you give this number a buzz, they do very good security windows. I still won't feel safe. Someone in this village doesn't want me around. Some prat who doesn't have the guts to show his face is making a protest about outsiders moving in. I hope that's what it is. I hope it isn't personal. Oh, it's happened before. I have my suspicions. I'll get that. Oh, Detective Constable Wong. Is Mrs. Raisin all right? We heard there'd been a break-in. Come in, Mrs. Bloxby. Oh. I'm fine. Well, well, I'll leave you two ladies together. Mrs. Bloxby and Mrs. Raisin, I'll drop by in the morning. Thanks, Bill. Such a nice young man. Oh, my dear, you have been through the wars. Whatever happened? A spot of redecorating. Oh. Someone decided my window would look better without any glass. Oh, heavens. Well, is there any broken glass on the sofa? I don't think so. Why? Because that's where I'm sleeping tonight. You don't want to be alone in the house. Oh, I couldn't let you go to all that trouble. Oh, nonsense. You may come from London, where people don't know who their neighbours are, but we do things differently here. Come along now. Hello? Roy, it's me. Someone put a brick through my window. No. Are, are you all right? Get the police. They've been. It's like Fort Knox in here. Oh. And I've got Mrs. Bloxby downstairs, but I still don't feel safe. Well, what can I do? I'm 80 miles away. Well, I know it's short notice, but uh, can you come down for the weekend? I mean, there's a charity auction. You'd love that. Well, I'm snowed under with work. I'm doing an Easter egg campaign and I'm meeting Dawn French, who's going to be the Easter bunny. I... Oh, Dawn French is more important than me, is she? Oh, no, I never said that. Let's not forget who got you that job. Other people on the panel thought you were superficial, but I said, no, this is a man with real integrity. Oh, all right, all right. Also, also, I found out Reg had affairs with several women, which points the finger at Vera. But the police say she never cooked. She had a brand new fitted kitchen and she'd only ever used the microwave. Aggie, 
It's the middle of the night. Stop playing detective. I'm not playing. I'm deadly serious. I'll see you Friday. <sighs> All right. Night, night. That's right, darling. Still with Mrs. Raisin. Oh, at about midday, I should think. See you then. Bye. Good morning. Oh, Mrs. Raisin. Hope you didn't mind my using your phone. Did you sleep? I did. But I was woken by a hungry kitten and the smell of coffee. Yes, well, I was going to bring it up to you, but alas, you've beaten me to it. Sugar? Oh, no, thanks. I'm dieting. Oh, but I will have one of those nice chocolate digestives. Mrs. Bloxby, I've been thinking. Oh, yes, dear. This charity auction, I have some items to offload. Oh, what kind of item? Well, I have some useless trinkets from my PR days. Presents from pop stars, mm. gold discs. And uh, my furniture is too big for this cottage. I mean, look at this widescreen TV. It's blocking out the sunlight. Good heavens, you can't give that away. Have you seen what's on TV these days? No. Everything must go except me and Chivers. Oh, Mrs. Raisin. That's the most marvellous news. Well, I hope you get a few quid for them. No, no, not that. I mean, it's marvellous news that you're staying. But what made you decide to stay? The brick through my window telling me to go. I've never much cared for Nazis. If they want to fight, I can be very, very dangerous. Are you quite sure about this, Bill? No. I can usually tell if someone's guilty by the look in their face when they answer the door. Morning, Mrs. Cartwright. Is your husband at home? Uh, no, I, I don't know where he is. Hey, there he is! Oh, no! No, leave hey. him alone! Hey. Get on! Get off me! Hey, you're Bill. Look up there. <laughs> my, my, my. You have been a busy boy. Get off! I know my rights. I love you. I love you both. And blow me, there it was on top of his wardrobe. His own personal monkey mask. It was him who raided Mrs. Harvey's shop. We've been after him for months. Well, thanks for telling me, but what's it got to do with me? Get down, Chivers. Well, he put a brick through your window because he thought you were on to him. Apparently, you'd been to see his wife. Poor Nancy. Mm, she's better off without that ape. But one thing does puzzle me. Why did you go and visit her? It's a free country. And she makes a very good pink gin. Because if I thought you were trying to undermine a police investigation... Bill, look me in the eye and tell me. Do you think Reginald Cummings Brown was murdered? That is of no concern to you whatsoever. In other words, yes, I knew it. Agatha Raisin, when we investigate a murder, we find out the most terrible things and people get hurt. This isn't a murder, so why keep on digging? Why risk hurting people? Because it's what I do, Bill. I'm in PR. I spend half my life burying my clients' dirty secrets, the other half digging up other people's. I'm too old to change now. You could get your fingers burnt, Mrs. Raisin. You really could. Now, speaking of dirty secrets, you've got a man on your doorstep dressed in a cowboy suit. Oh, that'll be Roy. Roy! You made it. Oh, yeah, I did. And Dawn French is not a happy bunny. Uh, Bill, this is Roy. Roy Bill. Oh, hello. Uh, right. Well, I'll be on my way then. Uh, remember what I said. Well... Who's your boyfriend? He's not my boyfriend. He happens to be a police officer. Yeah. Well, they've obviously changed the height restrictions. He's a very nice man, just rather annoying. He says I should forget about this Reg business. I think you should listen to the little munchkin. I mean, so what if she did kill her husband? She's hardly likely to do it again, is she? Roy, that's a shocking attitude. I'm not surprised this country's going down the swanee. If you turn a blind eye to things like... Aggie. Do my eyes deceive me, or is that a cat? Oh, I forgot. You don't like them, do you? Indeed. Please, tell me you're collecting them to make a fur coat. It was foisted on me. They were going to drown it. What was I meant to do? Give me a bucket of water and I'll show you. Roy! I'm trying to change my image. It's goodbye, Cruella de Vil. Hello, Mother Teresa. Oh, that reminds me of the charity auction. Now... I need you to try on a medieval jester's outfit. You, you are joking. No. Cap and bells, the whole caboodle. Well, I look an absolute fool. Yes, that's the idea. Now, you're to stand by the A44 and drum up trade. Oh. 
What sort of trade? Well, you know, American tourists, people in flash cars, people I can fleece. And this is you being Mother Teresa, is it? No. The cash and carry are donating refreshments. I must double-check the papers are coming. And the brass bands say they won't. But if I threaten press exposure, I'm sure they will. <laughs> Just when you thought it was safe to go back to the Cotswolds, Earthquake Agatha, Force 9 on the Richter scale. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you to our wonderful village band. Now, on with the auction. Lot 17. It's a memento from my days promoting pop stars. It's a large turquoise hat with a hand-embroidered unicorn and a photo of the man who gave it to me. Boy George! And do I hear 20 pounds? Of course I do. Oh, Alf, dear, it's all going so well. We've raised hundreds. I do admit Mrs. Raisin is a bit of a human dynamo. Oh, here comes her friend. Oh, he looks like the picture. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Mr. Silver, you must be delighted. Do I look delighted? I'm stood by the A44, jangling me fool's cap while millions of Americans make home movies of me. It is for charity. <laughs> I've got compassion fatigue. I'm off. I've found a pub that does pims with little umbrellas. Here she comes, the woman of the moment. Oh, Mrs. Raisin, you must be absolutely exhausted. On the contrary, I feel cleansed. How does that song go? Imagine no possessions. Well, I don't have to imagine. From now on, it's me and Shivers and a whole new life. Well, I wish we all had that attitude. Well, I must go and thank the village band. Have they finished? We'll have crowds in here in a minute. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll help with the tea. Oh, goodness, you are keen. Well, you can assemble the cream teas. Right. Mrs. Cartwright can help you. Mrs. Cartwright, uh, didn't you hear? Her husband was arrested. It was because I... Oh, yes, I, I did hear, and that's why it's important you talk to her. Oh, here she comes. Um, I'll go and get some more plates. All right, Mrs. Raisin. Nancy, I'm so sorry. I had no idea your husband was involved with anything. I only wanted to know oh, about Oh, don't Red. forget yourself. But you done me more of a favour. At least I won't get no more of these. Your husband did that to you? That's right. Never mark my face, though. Cunning sod. Still, I don't have to say I walked into doors now. Now I can go through them. Oh, Mrs. Raisin, oh, one final favour. Uh, could you um, uh, pop across the road to the village hall, get some scones from the freezer, defrost them in the microwave? Yes, of course. Oh, now, uh, you want the little freezer by the door, not the big one under the window where Vera keeps her pastries. Vera keeps what? Oh, uh, Vera bought us a deep freeze last year. It's full of her cakes and pastries. Any dinner dance, harvest festival, Vera takes control. <laughs> They're all in there, colour-coded. No one understands her system except her. Let Mrs. Bloxby, is it all right if I go home? Oh, are you feeling poorly? No, I just have the sudden urge to organise a little tea party. Hello, Mrs. Cummings-Brown. Oh! M Mrs. Raisin, uh, how was the auction? We raised enough to save a few souls. Oh, I would have liked to have come, but I don't feel ready. Oh, where are my manners? Do come in. Actually, I was going to invite you to my house for tea. Oh, I'll just go turn off my television. And I'll go and put the kettle on. Uh, sugar? Oh, two, please. I couldn't trouble you for a biscuit, could I? Oh, yes. I think I've got some digestives. Oh! <laughs> My word, Mrs. Raisin, your cottage looks quite bare. I beg your pardon? I said your cottage looks bare without the television. Sometimes you have to lose things to make a fresh start. Uh, drink up, your tea's getting cold. Oh, so is yours. Well, thank you for the tea and biscuits. But I have a feeling you summoned me here for a reason. I wanted to talk to you about Reg. Ah. It's touching that such a lot of people miss him. You weren't the only weeping woman at the inquest. Mrs. Raisin, what are you suggesting? Well, I went to see Nancy Cartwright, and she told me that Reg had been planning to run off with her. But the night they were due to do it, she went home from the dinner dance and fell asleep. You cooked for that dinner dance, didn't you? I 
feed the whole village, Mrs. Raisin. Yes, I've seen your deep freeze in the village hall, a quiche for every occasion. One sends you to sleep, one sends you into eternal sleep. Well done, Mrs. Raisin. I wondered when you'd find out. There's even a quiche with a tiny dose of E. coli. A couple of Reggie's lovers suffered a nasty case of the runs, but Nancy was different. She just would not let go. So you had to find another way to end their affair. Well, it all seemed to fall into place. You moved in, a suitable outsider to take the blame. I already had three cowbane quiches in the freezer. Cowbane grows all round here. I remember that night. I came home. And I knew he had eaten it. I saw him laying there dead. But I could hear his voice in my head saying, Come on, old thing. Up the stairs. Don't look in the living room. It's not a pretty sight. You go up to bed now. You can wake up in the morning and find me, be grief-stricken for a while, and then start a whole new life. I've had my fun, Vera. Now it's your turn. Well, Mrs. Raisin, you're not saying anything. I'm so hot. I like the heat, don't you? It does seem to be making you rather drowsy. Oh, my God. What a profoundly stupid move to take tea with a poisoner. When your back was turned, I simply added some pills obtained from a doctor who oh. owes me a favour. They've even got your name on the bottle. Oh, Poor Mrs. Raisin, they'll say. It all got too much for her. Oh. Get out of my way, you stupid cat. Oh. Cigarettes? Such a filthy habit. And three days heat. Your house should go up like Guy Fawkes night. Mrs. Raisin? N nurse? Do you feel well enough for visitors? Oh, I think so. Oh, Bill. Morning, Mrs. Raisin. How are you doing? Still rather hot, shaky and scared. Well, it's all over. And I brought you a little picture for your bedside locker. Chivers. Oh, is she all right? She's fine. I'm looking after her. That little kitten saved your life. How? And when the fire started and she had nowhere to run, she climbed on your face, which made you vomit. How do you know that? She sold her story to the Corsley Gazette. Oh, yes, and I could tell by the scratch marks on your face. How's my cottage? Well, it'll have to be rethatched. That Vera Cummings Brown caused the death of five million weevils. She's under arrest now. Poor Vera. She was just like me, really. Didn't want anybody else stealing her prize. Well, you get some rest. Oh, here comes your friend. See you later. Aggie, you'll be pleased to know you're in all the papers. Midlands today is calling you the Columbo of the Cotswolds. Oh. And the Gloucester Echo calls you Miss Marple with Attitude. Shut up, Roy. Oh, charming. We're so glad to have you back in the land of the living. I'm alive, am I? That's nice to know. You certainly are. I think this country air must really agree with you. Indeed. Where are my cigarettes? In Agatha Raisin, Penelope Keith starred as Agatha. Jennifer Piercy was Vera Cummings Brown. Chris Emmett was Reg Cummings Brown. And David Holt was Roy. Mrs. Bloxby was played by Liza Sadovy. DC Wong by Ben Crow. And Nancy Cartwright by Beth Chalmers. Other parts were played by members of the cast. Agatha Raisin was dramatized by David Semple from the novel by M.C. Beaton. And the producer was Carol Smith. There, there, little Charlie. The nice vet will make you much better. All right, Mrs. Joseph. Mr. Blaine will see you now. Oh, thank you. Come along, Charlie. Come along. Hello, Mrs. Josephs. How's dear old Charlie? 
Oh, he's not at all well. Well, look at him. He's shivering. And if you try and stroke him, he winces. Well, he's a grand old gentleman now, and older doggies do get aches and pains. But he hardly touched his dinner last night, and it was lamb's liver, his favourite. Oh, I think it's just a flare-up of his arthritis. I can change his dosage of glucosamine. Uh, that'll make his joints a bit less creaky. I keep thinking there's something we must be missing. Well, aren't there some tests you could do on him? Well, I could, but it'll mean keeping him overnight. Oh, yes, but he's always happy with you. It'll be a little doggy holiday. <laughs> All right, Mrs. Joseph. Uh, I'll see you tomorrow, then. There's a brave soldier, Charlie. Mm -hmm. Good boy. <laughs> Oh, hello again, Mrs. Josephs. Uh, what can we do for you now? Well, if Charlie's going to stay all night, I've brought him his special blanket, and I've got a list of all the things he does and doesn't like. I'll pass it on for you. Now, he won't touch sausages, and anything in a tin makes him nauseous. I know just how he feels. I'll go and tell Mr. <laughs> Mrs. Josephs, you can't go in there. Uh, uh, Mrs. Josephs, I, I was just about to phone you. Hello, little Charlie. I... <gasps> What's happened to him? I'm afraid he reacted badly to the anaesthetic. Anaesthetic? Well, you, you never said he needed an operation. He suddenly took a turn for the worse, and I had to act fast. Oh. But I'm afraid we lost him. Oh, oh Charlie. My, my poor little Charlie. What has he done to you? <laughs> Agatha Raisin by M.C. Beaton Dramatised for radio by David Semple Starring Penelope Keith as Agatha The Vicious Vet Mrs. Bloxby, how lovely to see you. Oh, Mrs. Raisin, please tell me it isn't true. What isn't true? That you're leaving us. There was a for sale sign outside your house, and then that disappeared, and we all thought you'd gone back to London, but then your car appeared in the drive, and we thought... Mrs. Bloxby, very... I am not leaving this village. Oh, thank goodness. Oh, <laughs> I brought you round a lemon cake as a leaving present, but, um, well, if you're staying, uh, we can still eat it to celebrate. <laughs> <laughs> How could I ever leave a village which has people like you in it? Come in, I've just made some coffee. Oh. Oh, hello, Chivers. You must be glad you're staying in Carsley. London's no place for a cat. Tell that to Dick Whittington. <laughs> I, I can't remember. Do you take sugar? Uh, no, no, I'm still on my diet. Though it's a bit of a losing battle, I'm afraid. Um, shall I cut the cake? Yes, of course. So, where have you been the past few weeks? Well, in theory, I've been setting up a PR company in London. Here's your coffee. Oh, thank you. I thought you'd retired. And so did I. But then they made me an offer I couldn't refuse. Oh, I see. Is that what they call a big fat paycheck? <laughs> it wasn't exactly fat, more big boned. An old colleague of mine got in touch. He was setting up a PR company and needed a bit of help with the start-up costs. New company? How exciting. So it seemed. In return for my investment, I would be made a director with a substantial salary and he had some very high-profile clients. Jobson's Electrics, Hazelmere Food. Good heavens, that's a good start. Mm. That's what I thought. I was introduced to their managing director at a launch party I paid for. You know, everyone stands around eating little nibbles, pretentious ingredients in puff pastry. Sounds rather glamorous. <laughs> I hope it was. It certainly cost a few, Bob. And as I bit into a quail's egg volovan, I suddenly realised why this mm. man was strangely familiar. Why? He'd been on TV the week before in an episode of Casualty. Goodness! You'd think a top businessman would be far too busy to do any acting. <laughs> he wasn't a businessman. He was an actor. He played a surgeon on Casualty. And he certainly tried to stitch me up. You say he was a con man? They were all con men. The whole thing was a sham. My so-called friend had fallen on hard times and tried to get me to invest in a non-existent business. Oh, dear! That's why I like living in a village. The only major fraud is when someone cheats in a pastry competition. Please don't remind me. You know, Mrs. Bloxby, sometimes I think my year in Carsley has made me lose my killer instinct. <laughs> I must have a cigarette. Mm. 
So what's been happening while I've been away? Oh, we've got some very exciting news. You have a new next-door neighbour, a retired colonel called James Lacey. A colonel? Oh, sounds promising. He's moved to the countryside to write military history. That's not so good. Another wet drip comes to Garsley. It seems rather sweet in a bookish kind of way. Oh, and at long last we have a vet. And about time too. I'm fed up with taking Chivers all the way to Mercester. His name's Paul Bladen. He looks rather like Robert Redford. Really? I must take Chivers along for a checkup. Oh, why? She seems quite perky at the moment. Well, he can't be too careful. Yeah, nice shiny coat, lovely bright eyes. Mrs. Raisin, I have to say your cat is a picture of health. Now, if you're still worried, I could take a temperature. Thank you. That would put my mind at rest. Oh, just hold her steady. Here we go. Do be careful with her. Oh, don't worry, I've done this many, many times. It's all right, Chivers. It's all right. Yeah, 38 degrees. This is a very healthy cat. Maybe I'm just being overprotective, but she's not been the same since I collected her from the cattery. Oh, you've been abroad? No. I'm setting up a new PR company in London. Oh, you're a professional. I have run one or two international companies. Well, I'm impressed, I have to say. It's nice to meet someone who's got an interesting job. Carsley's a lovely place, but I, I do miss a stimulating conversation. I know what you mean. <laughs> Mrs Raisin... I hope I'm not being presumptuous, but I've heard there's a rather nice French restaurant in Evesham called La Lune, and I'd love to have someone to visit it with. That's not being presumptuous at all. And please, call me Agatha. Agatha. And I'm Paul. Oh, Chivers, I am so, so sorry about the thermometer. Let's get you home. Lucky, please, do calm down. Excuse me, can you keep your dog under control? I hardly think Lucky's going to bite through your animal's basket. Well, if he does, he'll soon be dead, Lucky. Oh, don't listen to her, Lucky. Lucky, Lucky, Lucky. You're Frida Huntingdon, aren't you? Do I know you? You're in the Carsley Lady Society. I went once. It was full of small-minded individuals. Is Paul in? If you have an appointment. Oh, I don't need one of those. Paul! Darling. Reader, come in. Don't worry, Chivers. The nasty animal has gone, and she's taken her dog with her. Well, Chivers, oh, what shall I wear to impress your lovely vet? I have got this little black dress. Oh, um... Hang on, I'm coming! Hello there, Agatha. Bill Wong, come in. Oh, thank you. Long time no see. Well, it's been very quiet round here. We haven't had any murders recently. You must have been on holiday. <laughs> <laughs> I was just uh, getting ready to meet a friend for dinner. Are you calling about anything in particular? No, no, just for a chat. Do I know this friend? You might do. It's Paul Bladen, our new vet. Oh dear, I had a feeling it might be. I saw you outside his surgery the other day. Why didn't you stop and say hello? Well, you walked straight past me. You had a faraway look in your eyes, and you had quite a job keeping your balance with those high heels you had on. Do I detect a note of ridicule? Agatha, when that man came to this village, everyone thought the sun shone out of his... Well, you know, where he sticks his thermometer. But now people are starting to talk. And what are they saying? They say he's not quite as caring as he seems. Mrs. Josephs insists he put her dachshund to sleep without even consulting her. Well, if he did, I'm sure there was a good reason. Vets do not kill animals. They keep them alive so they can fleece their owners. All I'm saying is be careful the company you keep. And if you're going out tonight, do watch the road. There's ice and snow on the way. It's a perfectly mild evening. Things can change very quickly in the Cotswolds. Hmm. Well, Agatha, how is your duck a l'orange? Do you want the polite answer or the honest one? Oh dear. Hit me with the honest one. On the positive side, the duck is definitely dead. On the negative side, why do they have to cremate it? <laughs> it is rather singed. The standards are definitely slipping. Oh, have you been here before? Um, uh, yeah, yeah, I did come when it first opened. As I recall, the food was quite reasonable. Uh, tell me some more about your PR company. That sounded fascinating. 
there's nothing to say, really. I ran it for th 20 years, and when the business was worth more than a cottage in the country, I sold it and bought a cottage in the country. <laughs> You're so lucky, Agatha. You had a dream, and you made it happen. It took more than dreaming. It was mostly fighting and kicking and screaming and shouting. <laughs> What's your dream? Well, well, I've always dreamed of having my own veterinary hospital right here in the Cotswolds. I mean, there's so much demand from farmers as well as pet owners. But as always, it's the funding. <laughs> you should try the Carsley Lady Society. They're awfully good at fundraising. <laughs> It'll take a little bit more than a few bring and buy sales, though I imagine a successful businesswoman like yourself could give me a few tips. Well, my first tip is never allow your suppliers to rip you off, no. which I have to say is what this restaurant is doing to you right now. Oh dear. Agatha, this was a terrible choice of restaurant, but I do know a place that does rather good coffee. And if you like, breakfast. <laughs> So, how long have you lived here for? Ten years. Before I started working in Carsley, I had a practice with my brother in Evesham. What made you leave? I'm always in the mood for an adventure. Now, let me take your coat. Paul, I'm... Oh, Agatha, please. What's the matter? Well, it's just been such a long time. Oh, don't worry. It's just like riding a bicycle. I beg your pardon? I mean, you don't forget. Thank you for that image, Paul. I, I'm sorry, uh, and, and thanks for, for supper. And if I have any fundraising ideas, I should be in touch. Oh, Agatha, can't you at least stay for coffee? I'm on a detox. You've had far too much to drink. Uh, then I'll, I'll drive slowly. It's snowing. Good, I'll have the road all to myself. <sighs> the woman's mad. Totally, utterly mad. Dear God, I know I haven't spoken to you for 30 years, but please get me home safe. <laughs> well, thanks for nothing. Two questions. Number one, are you all right? Yes, I'm fine. Just a bit shaken. Number two, where on God's earth did you learn how to drive? Excuse me. It is extremely hard to navigate on ice. Well, Torval and Dean always used to manage. My brakes weren't working properly. No, so you should have increased your stopping distance to at least six inches. There is no need to be so angry. I hardly touched your car. Oh, well done, you. Just a slight dent as opposed to the usual five-car pile-up. Look, I'm fully insured, and I take full responsibility. Here's my card. Oh, Lord. What is it now? You're my next-door neighbour. What? You must be... James Lacey. Oh. Well, at least that means we're both going in the same direction. Oh, so it does. You can go first. I refuse to be rear-ended twice in one night. Come in. Oh, excuse the bare boards, just uh, having the place recarpeted. <laughs> Here you are. These are my insurance details. Thank you. I am sorry if I flew off the handle, but my car is a very precious thing. It's my only way to escape from this world of coffee mornings, village fates, and infinite cups of tea. No, you don't like it here. No, it's not that. But I came to the countryside to write a book, and every day there's a queue of women popping in with... Homemade scones, gingerbread men, gingerbread cats. <laughs> they never did that for me. Oh, well, you're welcome to my leftovers. You're too kind. What's the book about? Uh, the Peninsula War. It's my uh, specialist subject. Is it? <laughs> my specialist subject is the price of cigarettes in supermarkets in Gloucestershire. <laughs> How's the book going? Very well. I'm just finishing the first chapter. Napoleon has persuaded Charles IV to abdicate, so we're about to have the uprising in Madrid. It's... Uh, it's a very exciting time. Mm, fascinating. 
Well, I must get back. I have a cat, and if I leave her too long, she phones up social services. And you know, I sometimes feel pet owners exaggerate the talents of their prodigies. Uh, well, nice bumping into you. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean it like that. Good night, Mrs. Rosen. Good night, Colonel Lacey. Hello, Chivers. Yes, that's right, it's me, the lady with the tin opener. I've just been to see your vet, only I wasn't quite ready for his treatment. I better phone and apologise. <laughs> Hello. Oh, um, is Paul there? No, I'm afraid he can't get to the phone at the moment. Excuse me, who am I speaking to? I'm Paul's wife. Who are you? Good morning, Lord Pendlebury. What? Who the devil are you? I'm Paul Bladen, the new vet. You wanted me to tie back the larynx of one of your horses? Oh, yes. Lucky Jim. Uh, that's him, over there in the stables. Oh, do you have any staff who can assist me with this? What? My staff have better things to do than holding your kit bag. Large chap always seemed to manage on his own. And I shall see you in an hour or so with my bill. <laughs> <laughs> ah, now you... Are a truly beautiful animal. Not like the mangy little flea bags I see in my surgery. It, 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 now, take it easy. This'll just send you to sleep. There you go. Don't you fight it. There you go. It, what the hell are you doing here? Look, I've done everything you told me to. I said that I would. Hey, hey get off me. No, no, please, no. Yes. Found him lying dead on the stable floor. At the moment, we reckon he fell on his syringe. But that's preposterous. Get out of the way, Chivers. Well, that's the official line. Nasty stuff in Mobilon. If it sends a horse to sleep, you can imagine what it does to a human. But surely he would have had an antidote with him. He, he did, but he didn't get to it. As with most things, it's easy to be wise after the event, but accidents do happen. Well, his wife must be devastated. Wife? He wasn't married? Really? Oh, I, I thought he was. No, he never married. I reckon his motto was why settle for one slice when you can have the whole cake. I see. So what was Paul doing to this horse? And tying back its larynx. What on earth for? Well, to stop it roaring on the racetrack. What a hideous thing to do to a horse. Oh. <laughs> Here we go, city folk getting soppy about animals. I'm sure he had a good reason for it. Lord Pendlebury loves his animals. Or suddenly died because there was no one around to revive it. When I went to see Pendlebury, he was weeping because a beautiful creature had died. Mind you, when I told him a human being had died too, he said yes, but that was only a vet. Hello. Oh, Mrs. Agatha. James. Have you heard the news about our vet? Yes, I have, and it's a terrible accident, but I am in the middle of writing a book. Accident? How can you accidentally stab yourself? Well, it, it's simple enough. He, he injects the tranquilizer into the horse, the horse gets a bit frisky and tries to belt, and knocks him onto his own syringe. That is the most ludicrous thing I've ever heard. Agatha is a military historian. I know many people have died through the accidental discharge of their own weapons. And as a PR executive, I know when something stinks to high heaven and someone's trying to hush it up. James, who are you talking to? Um, um it's only Agatha. Oh, Mrs. Rayson, you really do seem to haunt me. Mrs. Huntingdon? Oh, lucky you calm down. He's such a sweetie, but he can be a bit naughty with people he doesn't like. So I see. I'll take him through to the kitchen. Come on. I thought you said you were writing a book. Yes, well, I was in the middle of a chapter, but then Frida called. And then ten minutes later, you called. Oh, and Frida's helping you with the book, is she? Agatha. Or did she bring around a homemade cake in the shape of Napoleon? Now, don't be like that. I'm not. Well, uh, I'll leave you and Frida to get on with your book. I just hope you don't suffer from writer's block. Mrs. Bloxby. Sorry I didn't get a chance to speak to you in church. Well, that's quite all right, Mrs. Raisin. I had a lot of people to see. He was much loved. I think people feel he was taken far too young. Taken? Do you think it was deliberate? I mean, taken by God. 
Oh, yes, God. Oh, isn't that a beautiful reading the brother gave? Lord, you made us stewards of this creature. If it is your will, restore it to health and strength. Sorry, Mrs. Bloxby, did you say that was his brother? Oh, yes, that's right, Peter Bladen. He, he's a vet, too. Oh, not very imaginative parents. One named Peter, one named Paul. <laughs> I must go and pay my condolences. Uh, nice talking to you, Mrs. Bloxby. Oh, uh, uh, will we see you at the Carsley Ladies Society tonight, Mrs. Raisin? Mrs. Raisin? Uh, excuse me, Mr. Bladen? Uh, have we met? My name is Agatha Raisin. I just wanted to say I'm sorry about your brother. Thank you. I uh, appreciate that. My car is just round the corner. If I can give you a lift anywhere? No, thanks. I've got me on. Right. Um, uh, would it be possible at some point to have a chat about your brother? There's always been a lot of women who want to talk to me about Paul, usually after he's dumped them. Not much point in talking now, though, is there? Ladies, uh, ladies, now, uh, in view of this week's sad events, uh, we've cancelled Mrs. Mason's display of Turkish belly dancing, and so this evening is going to be a rather more subdued affair. Uh, but before we go any further, I must just read the minutes of last week's meeting. Um, on, on Thursday, 20th February, Mr. Jones... Mrs. Huntington, I thought Carsley ladies were too small-minded for you. I was desperate for company. Have a seat. Thank followed by a much-welcomed cup of tea. <laughs> this evening, Mrs. Harvey has very generously uh, brought in some homemade apple brandy. <laughs> and I have made some low-fat cinnamon flapjack, so please do feel free to sip and munch <laughs> and mingle. <laughs> Thank you so much, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Mrs. Raisin, he's all yours. Who is James Lacey? I'm through with him. I beg your pardon. What on earth makes you think I'm interested in James Lacey? The way you try to hold your stomach in whenever he's near you. Your imagination is even more lurid than your makeup. James is my next door neighbour. Nothing more. Oh, really? Well, anyway, I hope you do better than I did. All he wanted to do was talk about his book. When I just wanted to bite the buttons off his cardigan. Oh, Mrs. Huntington! How lovely to see you! Did Mr. Bladen get a good send-off? It was no less than he deserved. He was a wonderful vet. Oh, do you think so? I found him rather rough with Chivers. The man was a miracle worker. I mean, look how quickly he cured Lucky's middle ear problem. A miracle worker? What are you talking about? Bladen was a murderer. Oh, Mrs. Joseph, you're not still going on about your old Daphne, are you? Charlie was just suffering from a bit of arthritis until Bladen got his claws into him. I don't need to seem insensitive, Mrs. Josephs, but... Charlie was a rather old dog. Oh, just a bundle of bones, really. Not long for this world. Charming. I hope no one ever says that about me. Well, Mrs. Huntington, I'm not surprised you're standing up for him. Your dog wasn't the only one to get the full treatment on his operating table. How dare you? Still, at least he cared for one animal. Even if it was one with the morals of an alley cat. <laughs> Goodness, this is getting hot in here. Uh, Mrs. Huntington, uh, come and try some of my flapjacks. You malicious old crow. This, this way, Mrs. Huntington. Well, you certainly rattled up. I've bitten my tongue for long enough. They've all tried to hush me up, but I know things. About Paul? About why he came to Carsley and what he was up to. Come to my house tomorrow, Mrs. Raisin. I'll tell you all about Paul Miracle Worker Bladen. Oh, Agatha. James, are you busy? Well, I am in the middle of writing a book. Are you still doing that? Yes, it may surprise you to learn. They do take considerably more than a week. Well, there's someone that I want you to meet. Uh, not another coffee morning. No, somebody else in this village seems interested in Paul Bladen. You're not still hawking your conspiracy theories around, are you? I am looking for the truth. Something I thought would matter to an historian. Still, I suppose your book won't bother with that. You'll just recycle fashionable opinion. Mrs. Raisin, I don't know about you, but I pay a large amount of tax. So those nice chaps of Scotland Yard can worry about this sort of thing for me. James, some things in life are too important to leave to the professionals. This country would fall apart if it wasn't for volunteers. I mean, where would the NHS be without the St. John Ambulance Brigade? Well, I'm so glad to hear you're doing it out of community spirit. For a moment, I thought you were just being nosy. Will you come and see her or not? It seems it's the only way I'm going to get you off my doorstep. Uh, 
I'll get my coat. Mrs. Josephs is taking an awfully long time to answer. Well, Agatha, haven't you noticed? You know, whodunits, when anyone says, come and see me tomorrow, they'll always be found dead in the next scene. Don't say that, James. <laughs> Not even as a joke. Hmm. I do think his door is locked. Mrs. Josephs? Mrs. Josephs! She must have gone out. James, maybe I've spent too long living in London, but when I go out, I tend to lock the door. Oh. Well, I suppose she can be in the bathroom. Mrs. Josephs? Mrs. Josephs? Oh, no. It isn't possible. I'm afraid it is. Oh, what do you think happened to her? I don't know. She's stone cold. Doesn't seem to be any sign of a struggle, though. The poor woman. Uh, have you got one of those, um, um mobile things? Somewhere in my bag. Uh, he here it is. You phone the police. I need a cigarette. You can't smoke in here. Why not? There's a dead body there. And your point is? They will need to identify the cause of death. Well, they're not going to pin it on secondary smoking, are they? There's ash flying all over her. But will you just make the phone call? Well, how does one use this thing? I'll do it. Hold the cigarette. Uh, DC Wong, please. Bill, it's Agatha. I'm afraid we've got another body for you. In Agatha Raisin, Penelope Keith starred as Agatha, and Malcolm Sinclair was James. Mrs. Bloxby was played by Liza Sadovy, and DC Wong by Ben Crow, with John Glover as Paul Bladen, and Ewan Bailey as Peter Bladen. Jilly Mears was Frieda, and Joanna McCallum, Mrs. Josephs. Agatha Raisin was dramatized by David Semple from the novel by M.C. Beaton, and the producer was Carol Smith. Agatha Raisin by M.C. Beaton. Dramatized for radio by David Semple. Starring Penelope Keith as Agatha. The Body in the Bathroom. Oh, Lord. I came to this village for a quiet life. Now I'm stuck in a bathroom with a dead woman. Welcome to Carsley. We do seem to have more than our share of the dearly departed. She, she looks quite peaceful, though, sitting there with a book in her hand. Well, she was a librarian. Even in death, she looks as if she's glaring at us to be quiet. <laughs> the police are taking their time, aren't they? Probably stuck behind a tractor. Mm. Not that they can do much here. I suppose not. I hope when I go, I'm alone and peaceful with a good book beside me. Oh, look. <laughs> it's the new Maeve Binchy. What's that in her other hand? Agatha, I, I really don't think you should touch her. She's holding something. I'm going to try and wrench it out. Agatha, that's an appalling thing to do. Don't you dare! It's a syringe. <sighs> Thank you for listening to me. Don't worry, I'll put it back. With your fingerprints all over it. I hadn't thought of that. Insulatard Flexipen. Oh, that'll be insulin. Was she diabetic? She must have been. But what if it wasn't insulin? What if someone substituted some poison? Oh, you're not still trotting out conspiracy theories, are you? James, <laughs> last night she said she knew something about Paul Bladen and asked me to come and see her, but someone else got here first. I find it so hard to follow your train of thought. I'm not even sure if thought is the right word. You do come out with these extraordinarily lurid theories. Well, then you give me a better one. But right now, She's in the bathroom. Administering her daily injection, but she's so engrossed in this very exciting book, she accidentally injects an air bubble. You really haven't read much Maeve Binchy, have you? No, I, I'm, I'm more of a John le Carre man myself. Why can't you see that there is something very sinister going on here? Two tragic accidents in one week. It's sad, but it isn't sinister. Has the world gone mad? 
Or is it just me? Probably a combination of the two. A vet is found dead with a syringe full of tranquilizer, and the police insist it was accidental. He must have fallen on it. Well, needle stick injuries are very common in the medical profession. And the next week we find a woman dead in exactly the same way. And somehow you manage to pin the blame on Maeve Binch. I am just saying, don't jump to any conclusions. James, how many people have to die before you start to see a pattern? When the whole of the Carsley Lady Society are slumped on the floor with a cake in one hand and a syringe in the other? Oh. Well, that'll be the police. No doubt they'll agree with your version of events. Well, Mrs. Raisin, I am very disappointed in you. Bill, what have I done now? If you'd only told us what you knew last night, Mrs. Josephs might still be alive. If I told you last night, you wouldn't have believed a word of it. Hang on. Are you implying that her death might have been deliberate? We are currently investigating the possibility. Forensics have taken away the syringe for analysis. Oh yes, can I just mention, I did actually touch that syringe. You did what? I took it out of her hand. But, but I did put it back. And may I just point out, I did everything in my power to dissuade her from this course of action. I said it was ill-advised, but she wouldn't listen. Shut up, James. Of all the interfering, bungling amateurs. It was a moment of panic. We'll have to take your fingerprints. And then... I want the pair of you to go home, find yourself a hobby, and don't get into any more trouble. Message received. Loud and clear. Rest assured, as soon as we've left the station, I shall be straight back home, on with my book, and leave police business to the professionals. I do think Bill Wong's got a cheek, but I think of everything I've done for him. Agatha, will you remind me why I'm squelching my way through country lanes with a large black bin bag? You're looking for evidence. Oh. Now, we're not allowed to be nosy. But if we just happen to be two volunteers combing the hedgerows for litter... What on earth makes you think we're going to find any evidence? Do you never read detective novels? What is the first thing a murderer does immediately after the crime? I don't know. Twirls his moustache, retires to his opium den. He dumps the murder weapon. He can't risk being caught with it. So what exactly are we looking for? A blood-spattered knitting needle? Or has he left a, a signed photo with the words, I did it, honestly? I don't know. Pills, potions... Anything that could be thrown from a car window. Oh, Agatha, we're both wasting our time. So far, we have no evidence at all of foul play. Then get down on your knees and find some. Oh, I do not get down on my knees for you or anybody else. And at this point, I, I really feel we should listen to Detective Constable Wong and go home before we're charged with obstructing police business. Typical. When I heard an ex-soldier had moved in next door, I thought, at long last, a man of action. Instead of which, you turn out to be a pompous, pedantic, whinging, wittering, public school-educated waste of space. Right. That does it. I have never been so insulted in my entire life. You must have been sure. Mrs. Grayson, I was not put on this earth to be your slave. I'm going home for a cup of tea and, and the Daily Telegraph crossword. Oh, 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 that was that? James, are you all right? What do you think? I've now fallen in a ditch. This is unlikely to go down as the happiest day of my life. Hold on, I'll pull you out. No, please don't you bother. I know what would happen. You would fall in. And the only thing worse than being stuck in a ditch is being stuck in a ditch with you. All right. I'll go and get my car and we'll go home. A Agatha? James. It's poison you were looking for. Do you think it will be found in a small brown bottle with the word immobile on the label? Let me have a look. Just by my feet. James, you are a genius. If you weren't covered in mud, I'd climb down there and kiss you. Yes, well, I am, so please don't. Whatever you do, don't touch the bottle. No, of course not. That would be the action of a headstrong idiot. I'm just going to phone Bill Wong. I know he said not to interfere, but I think he'll change his mind when he sees this. Right. That's it. I just pulled myself out. Oh, dear. Oh. I can't seem to get a signal. Uh, well, I'm not surprised. Did you read the local paper? Only if I'm in it. Why? What did I miss? Well, they're going to build a mast here, but the village has organised a petition to stop them spoiling an area of natural beauty. Honestly, some people are so selfish. Well, I'll go to the Red Lion. I'm sure they've got a payphone. Right. I'll see you at home later. No, James, you have to stay here and guard the evidence. I beg your pardon? Why should that be my job? You used to be a soldier. Pretend you're on sentry duty. But look at the clouds. I'm going to get wet. You're already wet. But I'll be back soon with the police. But, Mrs. Raisin, I have other things to do. My, my book on the Peninsula War won't write itself. I've got, I've got so many things to worry about. Uh, the death of Napoleon. 
Seat of Saragossa. Oh, hello there, Mrs. Raisin. Mrs. Huntington. We've just heard the news about dear Mrs. Joseph's old poor thing. She was looking a little frail last night. Mrs. Joseph's was in perfect health until someone broke into her house and killed her. Oh, dear. You're not still acting out your little Miss Marple fantasies, are you? For your information, I have just found the poison the killer used. No. Yes. Now, where's the payphone? Uh, it's just at the end of the bar, but someone's using it. Oh, get a move on. You can't be serious, then. How do you know it's poison you found? We don't at the moment. That's why we need the police to confirm it. Who's we? Myself and James Lacey. Oh, are you still trying for that little flirtation with him? It's so nice when someone has a fling later on in life. Yes. Although, with your alcohol consumption, I doubt you'll live long enough for many more. <laughs> In any case, James and I are next door neighbours, nothing more. Well, I don't blame you. When I first met him, I thought, ooh, a colonel. How exciting. How does that song go? There's something about a soldier. Well, I looked everywhere for it, but I couldn't find it. Well, James has been a bachelor so long, he's not going to throw himself at just anybody. Anyway, I've got bigger fish to fry than James Lacey. I've bumped into an old flame, and we're giving things a second chance. Much as I would love to discuss your emotional ups and downs, the phone is now free, and I have a life. Are you wasting your time with him? All he cares about is that wretched book. I mean, I've been with married men before, but not one who was married to Napoleon. Hello, Bill. It's Agatha. We've got something for you. Now, Mrs. Raisin, I thought I said something about staying at home and finding yourself a hobby. I found one, keeping the Cotswolds tidy. A likely story? Anyhow, I'm glad you saw sense this time and let us in on your little detective games. Don't patronise me. This bottle is going to solve the case for you, and it's all thanks to me. Oh, and James, who's standing in the rain looking after it. So whereabouts did you leave it? Well, it was somewhere around here. I recognise those stinging nettles and the abandoned supermarket trolley. Uh, pull in at this lay-by. All right. I'm sure it was here. It must have been. What's that sticking out of the roadside? Where? Down there. Little flag or something. Oh, I don't know. Let's go and have a look. Well, oh, Mrs. Razor, are you sure this is where you left him? This is definitely the place. It looks like he got fed up of waiting. He's tied his handkerchief here to mark the spot. Give me that handkerchief. I shall use it to throttle him. Anyway, the bottle's just down there. Whereabouts? In the ditch. And try not to fall in. All right, I can see it. And? That little bottle is what is commonly known as Newcastle Brown Ale. But it was a medicine bottle. I saw it with my own eyes. Well, maybe it's time you got down to the opticians. <sighs> Don't worry, Mrs. Raisin. It's an easy enough mistake to make. What the hell do you think you were doing? Oh, good afternoon, Mrs. Raisin. Do come in. I told you to stay put until the police got there. You know, until I moved to this village, I really believed in the concept of free will. And will you turn off that racket? That so-called racket is the greatest composer who ever lived. Oh, thank you so much for turning off my stereo. I find it so hard to manage those little buttons. And by all means, do have a seat. Oh, do you mind if I smoke? You can do anything you like if it shortens your life expectancy. Our one chance of proving it was murder. And you not only abandon the evidence, you leave a helpful little sign so the killer can come back and dispose of it properly. I had no intention of freezing to death just so you could prove your crackpot theory. And you mind not flicking ash on my aspidistra. Oh, sod your aspidistra. When we found your carefully knotted handkerchief, the bottle of poison was not only gone, it had been replaced by a bottle of beer. Oh. Precisely. Oh. So, whoever did that must have guessed that we were on their tail. The sheer brilliance of the military mind never ceases to amaze me. Now, let's go through the facts. First, Paul Bladen is killed. Well, that's debatable. Then Mrs. Joseph says she knows his secret, and by the next day she's dead too. Uh, do you have a black sweater? 
And there's one thing I love, it's a non sequitur. And you'll need black shoes, black trousers, and if possible, a balaclava. Whatever for? We're going to break into Paul Bladen's house. Oh. Oh. Well, I've managed to remove one of the hinge pins. Take your time, no one can see us. Will you just remind me how you persuaded me to do this? Was it hypnosis? Did you slip a, a capsule or something into my gin and tonic? James, you're doing this because deep down you know it's the right thing to do. And so breaking into someone's house is an act of moral virtue, is it? I obviously wasn't paying attention in my religious education classes. Ah, right. That's it. Ah. Ah. At last. Now give me the torch. Sure, this place is empty. He lived on his own. To the best of my knowledge, the only family was his brother, and he lives on the other side of Evesham. You don't have to make so much mess. How am I going to find anything if I don't empty the drawers? The estate agents can tidy up. Let those parasites earn their exorbitant fees. And what are the estate agents reported as a burglary? Don't you read the papers? The police don't solve crime nowadays. They just offer victim support. James, look. What do you make of this? It's a betting slip. There are two drawers full of them. Uh, let, let me see. This is Joseph's dog. Two milligrams of Domitor administered. Odds survival, five to one. Instant death, three to two. Comatose, five to four. Mrs. Joseph's dog? Paul was a vet. And he took bets on whether animals would live or die. The question is, who was he betting with? Well, I hardly think he arranged it with Ladbrokes. No. Must all have been carried out in secret, like badger baiting or cockfighting. Oh no, this is interesting. What is it? Some kind of list. Miss Sims, five hundred pounds. Frida Huntingdon, five thousand pounds. Agatha Raisin? Question mark. Oh dear. Uh, when I spent an evening with Paul, he told me he wanted to set up a veterinary hospital. You spent an evening with him? It's a free country. Yes, fine. Yes, why would not? Yes. And at the end of the evening, he asked for a donation. A donation? What sort of an evening was it? A donation for his veterinary hospital. Mm. Not that there was ever going to be a hospital. I imagine not. It looks as though he needed every penny for his gambling debts. The strange thing is, I went home early that evening. He wanted me to stay for a nightcap, but uh, I, I changed my mind. But I phoned to thank him for the meal, and a woman answered, said she was his wife. You didn't mention a wife. I, I thought you said his brother was the only relative. Oh, he wasn't married. But I have a fairly shrewd idea. It was your friend, Frida Huntingdon. Hmm. So you slipped out into the night, and he found Frida. She was prepared to drop everything for him. That's one way of putting it. Mm. But the one thing that doesn't make sense to me... Yes? If he was trying to con money out of people, why on earth would he kill their pets? Well, a single woman with a cat, she loses her pet, becomes very vulnerable. And it's so much easier for Paul to move in and be sympathetic. And then maybe the best way to pay tribute to that much-loved animal is, um, just a small donation to my hospital? Oh, that reminds me. Chivers hasn't been fed. We'd best get back. Just one thing, though. If he conned money out of all these people, why did they call him a miracle worker? It was only Mrs. Joseph who, who turned against him. Oh, that's easy. You like opera, don't you? Oh, well, well, I like the old stuff, but I do draw the line at Benjamin Britten. I mean, all those sailors and fishermen and fairies and the Yes, wood yes, and... yes, all right. Anyway, if you went to see oh, Aida, and it was all done in modern dress and set on a building site in Wolverhampton, what would you tell people afterwards? I'd say the English National Opera has a lot to answer for. Yes, yes, but you've just paid £100 for a load of rubbish, and that makes you an idiot. So you might say it was innovative, challenging, oh. ahead of its time. Anything but admit you were wrong. So all these women were waxing lyrical about the vet. Because he screwed them for every penny they had. Right. Let's get back before my cat starts eating the wallpaper. Oh, dear. Well, I'm too old for this. If God had meant us to be out this late, he wouldn't have invented Horlicks. Will you stop whinging and learn to live a little? Did you ever speak to the brother? Ah, uh, I tried to. At Paul's funeral, but he didn't want to know. I think he loathed his brother. So what have we got? Two brothers, both vets. You don't get on at all. One named Peter and one named Paul. James, look. There's a policeman down there. 
Where? At the other end of the lane. I think he's coming towards us. What on earth are you going to think? It's two o'clock in the morning. Uh, pretend we're lovers. What? What else would we be doing in a country lane in the middle of the night? Uh, bet you're watching. Do I really look the type? No, um, fair point. Uh, yes. Uh, Put your arms around me. Look, is this absolutely essential? Uh, do you want to spend the night in a police cell? No, right. Uh, where do I put my arms? Uh, up here? A little bit lower. Good Lord. Kiss me. No, I really do think that's quite unnecessary. Kiss me again. Well, I suppose if it does add to the overall verisimilitude, then I may as well. Just keep in this position. Don't move. Stay very, very close. Agatha, please, can you stick to the passenger seat or you'll set off the... Horn. Quiet. He's looking in. Oh, dear. He's gone. Thank goodness for that. You don't need to say I'm quite so relieved. Right. Well, if the coast is clear, home, James, and don't spare the horses. Well, I think you did that rather well for a beginner. Mrs. Rayson, there are some things in life one doesn't wish to be given marks out of ten for. Pity. I would have put you down for at least 7.5. Do you know, when that policeman went past, I was almost inclined to give myself up and get arrested. At least that sort of thing wouldn't happen to me in prison. You really have led a sheltered life, James, haven't you? to sulk. I haven't exactly had a fun-packed evening either. Chivers, come on. Where are you? Chivers, come on. Chivers, Chivers, please. Let me pour you some more tea, Mrs. Raisin. What makes you quite so sure she was abducted? Because Chivers can't open doors. I'm sorry to take it out on you, Mrs. Bloxby, but it's all been such a shock. Oh, don't worry, my dear. There's quite a search party out looking for her. Mrs. Mason, Mrs. Harvey from the village shop. Oh, and I even saw James Lacey on his knees with a tin of tuna fish, which was quite a sight, I can tell you. Before <laughs> I got chivers, I didn't know you could worry so much about another creature. Now, oh, I wish I could go back to being selfish. Oh, you don't mean that. Now... I knew you wouldn't be in the mood for eating much, but I have brought along a very nice pineapple upside down cake. Thanks, Mrs. Bloxby. I'll have a cigarette, if you don't mind. Oh, well, if it helps you relax. Oh. I seem to be the last smoker left on this planet. One day they're going to round me up and shoot me for it. So until then, I've just got to cram in as many as I can manage. You know, Mrs. Raisin, at times like this, I'm really glad I live in a village. I mean, everyone's turned out to help. I've got the whole of the Castle Ages Society combing people's gardens. Oh, all except Frida Huntington. Well, she's never liked my cat or me, come to think of it. Oh, no, she's far too busy with her new gentleman friend. I think she said they were going into Evesham. Do you know who this old flame is? Oh, it's Mr. Bladen. Don't you know? Paul Bladen is dead. No, 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 the other one, the brother, Peter. Apparently they had a relationship some years ago, but Frida broke it off. Then they met again at the funeral, and although it seems a strange place to find romance, somehow the flame was rekindled. Mrs. Bloxby, do you mind? I have to go somewhere. Oh, is something the matter? I think I know where my cat is. You've reached the answer phone of James Lacey. Sorry, I'm not available at the moment, but please do leave a message. James, where are you? Oh, sorry, I know. You're looking for chivers. It's eight o'clock in the evening, and I'm in Evesham. I'm about to break into Peter Bladen's surgery. If I'm not back by ten o'clock, then will you please... For well, Frida, how's your foie gras? Delectable. <laughs> Oh, Peter, I'm so glad to be back with you. You're on the side of the angels. And I've spent so long with little devils. Like my brother. Oh, poor Paul. He was such a dreamer, but he meant well. That's one way of looking at it. Did you know I put £5,000 in a phone for his veterinary hospital? You and God knows how many others. He was like a black hole. People kept giving him money, but he still died in debt. Is there any way I could get it back, do you think? We'll see. When the sale of the house comes through and I've paid off his debts. Thanks. Do you know there are still people in the village believe he was murdered? Oh, the village is for you. 
In a city, your next-door neighbour could be a serial killer and you'd turn a blind eye and wouldn't want to get involved. <laughs> you'd be lucky if you knew your neighbour's name. Yes, yeah, right. <laughs> but in a village, someone dies and everyone's gossiping. It's got to be murder. Yes. <laughs> Though it didn't help Mrs. Joseph's going so soon after this. I told you Mrs. Raisin was convinced she'd found poison in the woods. Yes. Uh, hopefully she'll be too busy looking for a cat to do any more snooping. More wine. Peter. Yeah? How did you know about Agatha's cat? I saw the search party on my way here. I thought you came here straight from work. Please, don't give me the third degree. It's been a rough few days and I just wanted a nice quiet evening. Uh, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry. Now, if you don't mind, I've got a few things to check on my surgery and I really need an early night. Peter, no, don't go, please. He hasn't hurt you. Come on, come on, you're safe now. Well, well, well. <gasps> Our very own Miss Marple. Peter, so you're a kidnapper on top of everything else. Stand back, up against the wall. You wouldn't dare touch me. I think I would. Do you know what's in this bottle? I imagine you're going to tell me. Immobilon. A syringe full of this can knock out a horse, so just imagine what it does to a human. Like your dearly departed brother. Was he human? You could have fooled me. Stay away from me. The police are already on their way, so don't make things worse. Oh, they're on their way, are they? They just sent you on ahead. I left a message with them. I told them what you did to Paul and Mrs. Josephs. This little message of yours. Did you mention what Paul did to me when we were in partnership? The thousands of pounds of debt, the theft, the lies. He bankrupted me. It is still not worth taking a life for. I didn't take his life for that. When I found out he robbed me, I sent him to Carsley. I told him, get my money back by any means possible. Well, you should be proud of him. He did his best to swindle me. Well, you can afford it. And if he spent the night with you, I think he earned it. But then he moved on to Frida, the only woman I had loved. And there are some people too precious to be wounded, to be hurt. So you killed him for that? I'm a vet, Mrs. Raisin. My job is to remove cancerous tissue. And that's what I did with Paul. He was your brother. We're not the first. Do you know why Cain killed Abel? Because Abel was the pretty one, the one who always got his own way. Look, what he's done is done. And if you let me and Chivers go, I'll say no more about it, and you and Frida can start all over again. So the police aren't on their way then? Well, that makes things a lot easier. 200 milligrams, that should do the trick. Go on, Chivers. Go! Go! Come on, all of you, let's get out of Leave here! Leave those animals alone! No, we're all getting out of here! Peter Blake, I'm arresting you on two charges of murder and one attempted murder. You do not have to say anything, but it may harm your defence. Agatha, Agatha, are you all right? James, I have never been so pleased to see anyone in my life. This way, Mr. I got your message. In future, will you please leave the heroics to people who are suitably qualified? James, there are some things in life which are too important to leave to the professionals. Thank God you're alive. Oh. Let's get these animals somewhere safe. Oh, and so DC Wong took Mr. Bladen into custody, and I got Chippers back, safe and sound. Oh, oh. Mrs. Raisin, thank you so much. What an amazing story. Wow. Uh, well, ladies, ladies, uh, unfortunately, we've had to postpone Mrs. Mason's Turkish belly dancing yet again. Oh. But don't, don't worry, Mrs. Mason, I'm sure we'll get round to you next week. <laughs> oh, and may I just thank everyone for the search party? Peter Bladen didn't stand a chance against the women of Castle. Oh, don't mention it, Mrs. Raisin. <laughs> It's always nice to have a poke about in other people's gardens. Hey, <laughs> thank you, Mrs. Mason. Uh, just one thing, though. Yes? Now, I enjoyed your story. In particular, the bit where you pinned Peter against the wall, you shoved his hands in the filing cabinet, and you held him tight till the police got there. Well, it's astonishing what you can do when adrenaline kicks in. Oh, I discovered that at my karate classes. So then, are you planning to sue the police? Because they're insisting they overpowered him. Well... We all have our interpretation of events. <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Mason. Uh, well, I don't know about you ladies, but I think Mrs. Mason should form her very own detective agency. Maybe with Mr. Lacey alongside you. Oh, <laughs> like Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Or that Poirot and Mrs. Marple. Oh, yes, like my favourite was always Emma Peel and Mr. Steed. <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Bloxby. I'm working on it.
In Agatha Raisin, Penelope Keith starred as Agatha, and Malcolm Sinclair was James. Mrs. Bloxby was played by Liza Sadovy, and DC Wong by Ben Crow, with Ewan Bailey as Peter Bladen, and Jilly Mears as Frieda. Agatha Raisin was dramatized by David Semple from the novel by M.C. Beaton, and the producer was Carol Smith. Oh, Mrs. Raisin, it's so kind of you to take our old folk out for the day. Mr. and Mrs. Boggle can't get about as much as they used to, so they'll be so happy to take advantage. Mrs. Bloxby, it's a pleasure. I'm always happy to help someone less fortunate than myself. Oh, careful! You're not much of a driver, are you, Mrs. Raisin? No! That's three near misses in the past half hour! I am doing my best, Mrs. Boggle. I am not familiar with Bristol's ridiculous one-way system. Well, Mrs. Fortune never had no trouble, did she, Bardo? No, Mrs. Fortune never complained. If Mrs. Fortune is so magnanimous, where is she now? She's a very busy woman. Yes, uh, can't always manage to take us. No, she's probably up in the trees teaching baby birds how to fly. Right, Mrs. Raisin, pull over! Why? I need to spend a penny in them bushes. Mrs. Boggle. I was prepared to be your chauffeur, your skivvy, and your banker, but I draw the line at lavatory attendant. Well, it serves you right for dragging us away from them tea rooms so fast. You won't be doing that again in a hurry. That is correct, because I will not be taking you out again. Oh, Mrs. Raisin, why ever not? Because first thing tomorrow morning, I am going to sell up and move back to London. Agatha Raisin by M.C. Beaton. Dramatized for radio by David Semple. Starring Penelope Keith as Agatha. The Potted Gardener. Agatha. James! Oh, she made me jump. <laughs> Sorry, didn't mean to. I've just been doing a spot of gardening. Thought I'd pop over and see how you were getting on with yours. Getting on fine with my garden. I stand in it, have a smoke, it provides me with weeds to look at. Agatha, <laughs> you really ought to do something with it. You're letting it go to ruin. Life's too short to mow the lawn. Besides, it'll only grow back again in six months. You should join the Carsley Horticultural Society. It's awfully good fun. Oh, yes. Discussing the Latin name for a Michaelmas daisy. That does sound fun. Anyway, if you think the garden's bad, you should see the house. I can't get a cleaner for love nor money. Good Lord, you... Don't tell me you're actually having to get down on your knees and do it yourself, are you? Don't you start. <laughs> I've had a very trying day, chauffeuring the boggles. Oh, it was your turn this week. How was it for you? Absolute hell. But at least now, I know where I stand on euthanasia. Mm. Mrs. Bloxby wrote me into it last week. By about two o'clock, I was so desperate to get home, I actually faked an angina attack. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on, that's, that's my front door. I didn't hear anything. Oh, it's Mary. Fortune. Mary. I I'm over here, in Agatha's. The divine Mrs. Fortune. Yes, do invite your guests into my garden, please. James, darling. <coughs> Hello, Agatha. Mrs. Fortune. James, I've brought you some fuchsia cuttings. Oh, excellent. What variety? There's Moon Glow, Bouffant, and Baby Blue Eyes. I'm experimenting with Galahad this year. Marvellous pale Corolla. Oh, that is exciting. We can do swapses. <laughs> Oh, Mrs. Raisin, this is an interesting garden. I see you've gone for the wilderness look. Yes, and it's taken a lot of work to achieve this effect. And what are those chippings in all the beds? Is it some kind of organic mulch? No, they're my cigarette butts. Oh, well, I'm sure this sort of garden is very eco-friendly. Weeds make such a good habitat for moths. Well, come now, Mary, even moths have standards. <laughs> Oh, it must be so frustrating for you, James, when the seeds blow into your garden. Still, I suppose at a certain age it's tempting to just let everything go. At least in my case, I had something to let go of. If Agatha was just saying how hard it is to find a cleaning lady. Oh, I know. I am so lucky. Doris Simpson does for me. She's such a treasure. But I don't think she'd have time for your place. I do keep her busy. We'll see about that. Treasure has a way of changing hands. Right, then, I think these future cuttings need to be potted on. Uh, are you coming with us, Agatha? No, thank you. I've just remembered I've got some wet paint and I want to watch it drying. Good evening. Oh, goodbye. Don't you find Camellias an absolute joy?
Hello? Doris Simpson? Yes, that's right. Good evening. My name is Agatha Raisin. Now, I understand you do cleaning. Well, I do, but I don't see as how I could manage any more, and that's a fact. Mondays is Mrs. Chumley, Tuesdays Mrs. Barr, Wednesdays Mrs. Fortune, Thursdays... How much does she pay you? Who, Mrs. Fortune? Yes, just out of interest. Three pounds an hour. That's slave labour. Come to me and uh, I'll give you five. Well, I don't know if I can. And sick pay. Word. That's very generous. And seven weeks holiday. Well, I don't think Mrs. Fortune would be too happy. No, I don't suppose she will be. Mrs. Raisin, how dare you? Ah, Mrs. Fortune. Lovely evening. I have spent months building up a relationship with my cleaner. Oh, I see. Paying someone peanuts, never giving them time off, and following them around the house tutting. That's a relationship, is it? Fine. You can keep Doris. I hope you're very happy together. But I'm having James Lacey. Well, everybody, thank you for coming. This is an all-time record for the Carsley Horticultural Society. Yes, we're spreading like the fronds on a Dipsonia fibrosa. Oh. <laughs> Mrs. Reason, over here. Hello, Mrs. Bloxby. Now, tonight is a very special night for us. Mrs. Fortune will present an illustrated lecture entitled The Gardens of California. And to celebrate the occasion, Mrs. Bloxby has baked some Californian-style chocolate chip cookies. Oh. <laughs> yes, yes, they're just on the table. Do help yourself. Now, I have to set up the slide projector, so do feel free to stretch your legs for a few minutes. Ah. This is great. I didn't know you had green fingers. There's a lot of people around here don't know about me. Why does everyone think of me as some kind of townie? Well, this lecture should be interesting. Mrs. Fortune spent quite a few years in California before she came to our little village. Hmm, that must be where she got her facelift. Oh, Mrs. Fortune, do you know Mrs. Raisin? How lovely to see you, Mrs. Bloxby. Oh, Mwah. Oh, Mwah. Heavens, we're going all continental this evening. Yes, I have met Mrs. Raisin. Uh, we were just discussing your time in California, Mrs. Fortune. It must be quite a culture shock going from somewhere that's the heart of the film industry to a place with just one video rental shop. Oh no, it's an absolute joy. Towards the end of my time in California, I grew so tired of actors and models and glamorous people. Really, I'd far rather be with people like you. Oh, that's so kind. Well, I must go and hand out my glamorous cookies. <laughs> oh, look, it's darling James. Uh, don't make me drop my seedlings, Mary. I was going to give you some of these. Oh, super. I've got some too. We can do swapsies again. Excuse me, Mrs. Fortune. Could you just come and check the slides are in the correct order? Dear Bernard, mwah, mwah. isn't this man a treasure? He runs the Horticultural Society, he organises meals on wheels, the Boy Scouts. Well, there's no point sitting at home moping, is there? <laughs> we are so modest. But really, you are an incredible man. You're such a doer. Now, let's sort out these slides then, shall we? You're very kind, Mrs. Fortune, but really, I'm just an ordinary man. Wonderfully flamboyant character, Mary. James, that woman snares men the way a Venus flytrap snares insects. Look at the way she's flirting with Bernard Halitosis breath. She's just rather vivacious, that's all. She collects men like little potted seedlings. Probably keeps them in her greenhouse with a name tag on their ankles. Beware, my lord of jealousy. It is the green-eyed monster that doth mock the meat it feeds on. I am not jealous. <laughs> Right, I am off to fill my face with chocolate chip cookies. Fine, and I shall go and sit next to someone a little less censorious. Chivers, please. That is a puddle, not a drinking fountain. Agatha! James, I thought you'd be over at Mary's, examining her seedlings, doing some swapsies, going to the shopsies, eating pork chopsies. Yes, no need to take that, eh? I thought, now that you're taking an interest in gardening, I could uh, come round and give you some tips. Oh, I see. Unwanted horticultural advice. What are you, a Jehovah's gardener? Now, look, your soil is absolutely sodden. 
He hasn't seen a hose since the relief of Mafeking. As recently as that? But with a bit of vigorous sticking. Oh, oh, God. Oh, oh, oh. What's the matter? Have you stabbed yourself in the foot? Oh, I can't get out of this position. Well, it serves you right for sticking your fork in where it isn't wanted. I can please. I'm in agony. Let's get you into the house. Oh. At least you can be in agony on a comfy oh. sofa. Oh. 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 Come on in. Oh. Can you sit down? Good Lord, I can hardly lift up my head to see which way I'm... Yeah. Sorry. Going. Oh. What oh. exactly is the matter with you? Well, my back's giving me hell. And I've got this lump right here in my abdomen. Let's have a look. It's just here. Take your shirt off. Agatha, I don't think that's really necessary. Well, you don't expect me to examine it by Braille, do you? Oh, fair enough. I suppose you're right. Take it right off. Oh, oh very well. Oh, look. Here it is. It's the size of a golf ball. Do you think it could be a hernia? That's possible. I'm assuming you didn't get peckish on a golf course. Oh, can I have my shirt back, please? Oh, hold on. I'll just get that. Oh, Agatha, I'm... I'm Okay, it's me. Surprise, surprise. Roy, what are you doing here? Oh, there's no need to sound quite so underwhelmed. Oh, hello. Good evening. <laughs> Roy, there is a reason I've got a half-naked man in my living room. I'm sure there is. My name is James. I'm from next door, and, and my back just gave out, and Agatha was taking a look, and so I... I Do really you think should... it's lumbago? Uh, no, no, what? no. I, I suppose it could be. I, I don't think it's... Because I could give you a massage. I'm an absolute wizard, she had so... No, no, thank you. I, I really must step back to my cottage, um, house, and, um... James, let me come with you. No, no, I think I can manage 45 <coughs> yards. Ooh. I'll pop round later. Thank you. Oh, here's your shirt. Thank you. Thanks, thanks. Right, why didn't you phone to say you were coming? Because someone's been leaving her phone off the hook. Oh, yes. I've been getting abusive phone calls. I kidnapped someone's cleaning lady. It's a long story. Well, it's not as long as the tale of woe that I'm about to tell. Oh, dear. Shall I pour some gin and we can drown our sorrows? Oh, sweetie, there isn't enough gin in the world. So, how are things in PR? I don't do PR anymore. Your Mr. Pedman has given me the old heave-ho. No! I said if he wanted the company, he had to keep on my staff. Well, he did keep me on, but we had a bit of a contretemps. Oh, Roy. It was all to do with the British Legion poppy appeal. Now, we needed a top celeb to wear a poppy on their chest, and thinking chests, I naturally came up with Jordan. Oh, no. But Pedman insisted on using June Whitfield. Thank goodness. So... Since he didn't understand my vision, I got some photos of his face, put them on the body of a porn star and posted them all over the internet. That is appalling. No, it was quite nice, actually. I printed you out a couple of copies. You really shouldn't have. Oh. So, here I am, 21 years old and on the scrappy. Your 21st birthday is a dim and distant memory. Oh, between you and me and the lamppost. But I'm hoping if I knock a few years off, I won't be on the scrap heap for quite so long. Oh, hello, Chivers. Come to join us. Yeah, oh, you've still got the flea bag. Don't be so jealous. Now, I shall make you up the spare bed. Oh, I need an early night. Oh, something exciting in the morning. The highlight of my humdrum life. Wednesday's the day we put the wheelie bins out. More gin? Oh, morning, Agatha. James, how are you? Well, uh, I've been to the doctor and, um, it's not good. Roy, I've got wonderful news. How do you like your sausages? Crisp, charcoal or burnt to a frazzle? Never mind about that. Just listen. James Lacey has a suspected abdominal hernia. And the good news? That is the good news. Oh, Abdominal hernia. Oh, bring on the champagne and the dancing girls. No, no, no. The point is, in a month's time, we're having the Carsley Garden Festival. We all open our gardens up for charity and vote for our favourite. Oh, one sausage or two? Three, please. Now, James was an absolute dead cert to win, but if he has to give up gardening, I'm in with a chance. 
again, how can I put this? A garden is a delicate thing. It needs love. It's not like people where you can just shout at them. I can do caring and nurturing. These sausages are vile. No, there's one simple way to win this competition. And that is? Buy everything from a garden centre. Pop there the day before, have everything installed overnight and hey presto, instant garden. No frost damage, leaf rot or mealyworm infestation. Aggie, I hate to bring up the past, but don't you remember last year? You cheated in a quiche competition and the judge popped his clogs. Well, that's not going to happen again, is it? The judge isn't likely to nibble my deadly nightshade, is he? Well, there is the small matter of your next-door neighbours. I mean, won't they be a teensy bit suspicious when this magic garden suddenly appears? I thought of that. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to build a ten-foot-high fence. No one will see into the garden for the next six weeks except for you and me. Oh, lovely. Checkpoint Charlie comes to the Cotswolds. Now, when can you start? Sorry. Start what? You're my horticultural consultant. I mean, you're not working, so I need a ten-foot-high cedar wood fence and an aerial plan of my prize-winning garden. Aggie, I don't know the difference between a herbaceous border and a sebaceous cyst. Right, where's my checkbook? Aggie... I am incorruptible. I will play no part in this web of horticultural iniquity. Will this change your mind? Right. What would you prefer, water feature or decking? Morning, Mrs. Raisin. Ah, oh, Bernard. Mrs. Fortune, come to give me some tips. I'm just wondering if you have planning permission for this alteration. It's only going up until open day. I'm sure it contravenes planning regulations. What do you think, Mary? Well, I really don't see how your plants are going to get any light. This is fortune. I've worked in public relations, show business really, and we always believe in keeping an audience in suspense. So, when the 7th of June arrives, I can promise you something quite spectacular. What a particularly vulgar woman that Mrs. Raisin is. Let's not talk about her, Bernard, darling. You promised to look at my conservatory. Oh, yes, of course. You mentioned that you picked up some interesting propagating techniques in California. Oh, I pick up techniques wherever I go. Goodness. How did you get planning permission for this? Mm, I had to pull quite a few strings with the council. Now, Bernard, do take your coat off. It does get rather steamy. Yeah. It's like the Garden of Eden. Mm. Why don't you try some fruit? At this time of year. Morello cherry, the first of the season. Mm. A little too tart for my liking. Oh, mind you don't get juice down your shirt. Thank you. That's a very powerful humidifier. My seedlings like the atmosphere to be moist. I've never used a humidifier, but uh, I always feel if you can keep consistent atmospheric conditions, then your plants... Has anyone ever told you you're a very attractive man? Uh, no. They haven't, actually. Well, it's true. You're so boyish, so full of energy. Well, I try to keep fit. I would say I'm every bit as athletic as I was when I was 21. Oh, I'm sure you are. But why don't you show me? Mrs. Fortune. Please call me Mary. Mary, Mary, quite contrary. And you join us today on Gardener's Question Time from the potting shed here in Sparsholt. We've got the... Mrs. Bloxby. Oh, Mrs. Raisin. May I come in? Of course. Oh, thank you. You look as if you've seen a ghost. I've seen something much worse. Goodness. I would offer you a cigarette, but I know you're far too clean living. Oh, that's all right. I just need to get my breath back. Take your time. Now, sit down. Tell me oh. what happened. Well, I was taking an early morning walk round the village today, and I saw Mr and Mrs Boggle leaning on their garden gate. They didn't ask for a day trip, did they? Uh, no, 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 no. They, they were very upset. Someone had been into their garden in the night, taken their garden gnomes and chopped their heads off. Well, they do live very close to the Red Lion, and it can get a bit rough on a Friday night. Well, yes, that was my first thought, but then I just popped into James Lacey. James? Yes, yes. He, he's got some beautiful white roses. He really thought they were prize winners. 
but someone went into his garden last night and spray-painted them black. Oh, well, perhaps it's a practical joke. If it is, it's a very cruel one. Then I saw Bernard Spot. He was standing on his front lawn in floods of tears. What happened to him? Someone poured weed killer in his goldfish pond. Ugh. You could see all the poor dead fish floating on the surface. That is appalling, but surely it was just someone who'd had a bit too much to drink. I don't think so. I think something terrible is happening in the village. Right, Mrs. Raisin, I've hoovered your carpets and i dusted all of downstairs. Doris, you are worth your weight in gold. But there's something I wanted to ask you. Far away. Can't I take those Venetian blinds down and give the windows a proper polish? Absolutely not. No one is allowed to see into my garden except my horticultural assistant, Roy. Uh, Mrs. Raisin, I don't mean to speak out of turn, but this garden festival, it's only meant to be a bit of fun. Precisely. And if you open your presents six weeks before Christmas, that spoils the fun. If you ask me, the whole thing has got out of hand. And now we've got some lunatic cutting the heads off innocent garden gnomes. Doris, that's got absolutely nothing to do with me. Oh, no, no, Mrs. Raisin. No, 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 no. I wasn't accusing you. Now, I'm not one to gossip, but if I had to lay money on it, I'd go for that merry fortune. Doris, that's a terrible thing to say. Do go on. Well, she's one of those people, all nice and smiley on the outside. But you look at her face. There's something there you can't quite trust. Well, the surgeons did their best, but they couldn't remove all traces of personality. Surgeons? What are you talking about? Didn't you know? When she was in California, she had a bit of a nip and tuck. That woman's never been to California in her life. Before she came here, she was living in Solly Hole. Solly Hole, my word. <laughs> Doesn't have quite the same ring as Beverly Hills. What made her leave? Not that it was much of a wrench. Well, she had a very nasty divorce, my dear. Husband left her for someone half her age. The usual empty-headed bimbo, I suppose. Actually, no. It was a pizza delivery boy from Wolverhampton. If you ask me, that's why she's quite so keen on chasing men. Just so she knows she can still work her old charms on them. Uh, uh, Doris, would you mind getting that, please? Will do. Afternoon, Doris. This is Raisin about. Oh, Constable One. Yes, I'll just give her a call. Mrs. Raisin, police gentleman for you. Ah, the old Bill. Or rather, the young Bill. Uh, Doris, can you do the back bedroom, please? Yes, Mrs. Raisin. Come in, Bill, please. Thank you. What have I done now? Nothing, I hope. But what with all this vandalism, I'm having to look in everyone's back garden. Bill, it's really not convenient. I'm doing a lot uh, of work. Ah, I cannot my... show favouritism. So if you could just open your back door, please. Can you keep a secret? That depends on how wicked this secret might be. Well, you're about to find out. Oh, me. Someone's stolen your garden. I've been doing a bit of digging. Chivers, get out of the mud. There's nothing left. It's like the craters of the moon. Well, it isn't finished yet. <laughs> I should hope not. You won't win any prizes with this. We don't go for avant-garde in the Cotswolds. Well, I was going to add a few things. I'm sending a lorry down to the garden centre the night before the competition. Oh, no. She's gone back to the dark side. Well, it's not the worst thing in the world. I am gardening. I'm just using a credit card instead of a trowel. Agatha, what is it with you? Just when you seem to be settling in, just when you seem to be part of the scenery, you have to pull off a stunt like this to get one over on people. Bill, I try to do things properly. I bake little cakes, I take old people for rides in the countryside, but something in me just needs to win things. Oh, well, at least I can tell the boss you haven't got the Buggles gnomes. In this great big pit, there's no way you could hide them. Hello? Aggie, we're here, and we've got your secret garden. Oh, what time is it? Two o'clock in the morning. Can we start unloading? 
Uh, I'll, I'll be down in a minute. Uh, don't make too much noise. Oh, we wouldn't dare. There's a breathless hush down in Lilac Lane. Agatha Raisin is cheating again. Azaleas on the left. Now, over here, my particular pride and joy, Free Montedendron Californicum. Mrs. Raisin, that is most certainly not Free Montedendron. It's very clearly a Fagelius capensis. You don't know what you're talking about. Now, over here... Agatha, uh, when did you plant out these begonias? The last week in April. <laughs> so did I, but mine died of ground frost the first week of May. Beginner's luck. Now, over here, a lovely example of hydrangea. Hydrangea? Hydrangeas have veins on their leaves, and the flowers are in clusters. This is, in fact, a Robinia pseudoacacia called Frisia. Anyone like some tea? Oh, this is amazing. What a beautiful garden. It's like something from a fairy tale. Indeed, it is quite beyond belief. Oh, hello, Bernard. Oh, Mr. Lacey. How was your operation? Went rather well, but uh, it'll be a long time before I do any weightlifting. Oh. Um, has anyone seen Mrs. Fortune? She put so much effort into her garden. I thought she'd be doing the rounds. I haven't seen her for weeks. Well, let's pop round, shall we, Bernard? Thank you for rescuing me, Mrs. Bloxby. Uh, I was coming up the garden path, and Mr. Spot did seem to be going for your jugular somewhat. Well, he's noticed quite a lot of this garden didn't actually grow here. Old habits die hard, Mrs. Raisin. <laughs> I'm off to Mary's now. Congratulate her on winning first prize. <laughs> Mary? Mary? Mr. Lacey, I really feel we should come back later. It is somebody else's property. Bernard, look around. Someone's been here before us. How'd you come to that conclusion? For God's sake, look. These plants look as though they've been hacked up with a with a machete. Well, it won't win any prizes for topiary, but I really feel it's none of our business. Here she comes now. Oh, Mary. Oh. It's you. Thank you, James. I do like a nice warm welcome. What happened here? Looks as if our mysterious garden vandal has struck again. James, what's in that terracotta pot? Hmm. Judging by the shape, it's some variety of palm. Dixonia fibrosa? But why has she wrapped it up in a bin liner? I really feel we should leave now and put the matter in the hands of the police. I'm going to open it. Oh, no. Agatha, Agatha, please don't. It, it, it... Oh. It's Mary. In Agatha Raisin, Penelope Keith starred as Agatha, and Malcolm Sinclair was James. Roy was played by David Holt, Bernard Spot by Paul Brook, and Mary Fortune by Sally Grace. Liza Sadovy was Mrs. Bloxby, and Ben Crow was DC Wong. Agatha Raisin was dramatized by David Semple from the novel by M.C. Beaton, and the producer was Carol Smith. Agatha Raisin by M.C. Beaton. Dramatized for radio by David Semple. Starring Penelope Keith as Agatha. The Gardener's Legacy. Hello. Hi, Aggie. Just calling to ask how you got on at the Garden Festival. Oh, Roy. Well, were they wowed by wisteria? Did you... Peonies win prizes? Did your nasturtiums knock them dead? <laughs> You've been practising that all week, haven't you? <laughs> it's a gift. Well, the garden festival didn't go exactly as planned. Do you remember Mary Fortune, the woman with the Gucci shoes and the matching facelift? Oh, yes, I remember her. She reminded me of the screen by Edvard Munch. She's dead. No. <gasps> James and I found the body. Whoever killed her, wrapped her up in a bin liner, buried her head in a terracotta pot and tied her ankles to a hanging basket. That's awful. Anyway, how did you do in the competition? Roy, did you hear what I just said? A woman was killed. Whether I won any prizes or not isn't really relevant. You came second then? Thanks to you, I was disqualified. Oh, Aggie, what happened? Did they see the van from the garden centre? 
those little labels you put on, Fremontidendron rhubarbia or whatever, they were all attached to the wrong plants. Now, that's not my fault. I told Gary to put them on from left to right. It was all written on a piece of paper. Well, it doesn't matter anymore, does it? Are you still coming up this weekend? Well, I'm not sure. Every time I visit, someone seems to drop down dead. Yes, well, it's a small village. It's not likely to happen every week. Uh, fair enough. Well, in that case, I shall be round on Friday with a chocolate fudge cake and a bottle of Bombay Sapphire. <laughs> well, I've got to go now. I'm seeing the police this morning. Oh, dear. You're not going to confess to the whole grisly murder, are you? Can I get you a cup of tea, Mrs. Brayson? No, thanks. I think DC Wong is calling me back in a second. right -o. Agatha. So they've been interrogating you too, have they? Yes, James, for the past two hours. I'm beginning to wonder, are they investigating her murder or turning her life into a musical? Well, I've had it up to here with the whole business. It has not been the best week of my life. First there was the hernia operation, prodded and poked by a team of doctors, one of whom appeared to be eating a tuna sandwich. Oh, I forgot to ask, how did that go? Well, they, they put back all the bits that came out. I just hope it's not the start of a slippery slip. I expect my internal organs to stay put and wait for their orders. Look, at a certain age, you really have to start listening to your body, because it certainly doesn't listen to you. I do not take lessons on health matters from someone who smokes like a dark satanic mill. Anyway... Well, that surgery was nothing compared to the ordeal I've just been through. They didn't throw you down the stairs to get a confession, did they? No, I could handle that. But I've been asked the most impertinent questions by young men who do not appear to have started shaving yet. Don't tell me the policemen seem much younger these days. Everyone looks younger these days. Even the Dalai Lama has a spring in his step. Well, one thing about being a certain age, at least they're less likely to suspect you of murder. I mean, you didn't hoist Mary up and bury her head like that two days after a hernia operation. I'll have you know, with modern surgery, in less than 24 hours, you can be swimming, cycling, jogging and presumably killing people. Really? I'm amazed they don't put that in their brochure. Right, you two. Would you both come down to my office, please? Oh, dear. I think this is the bit where he tells us to keep out of this investigation. And leave it to people who've only just given up their paper rounds. No, first things first. There are tabloid journalists all over the village. And I probably know each and every one of them. I was in PR for 30 years, remember? I've eaten most journalists for breakfast. Well, in that case, you are to go home, don't answer the door, and take the phone off the hook. I don't want you talking to them. Bill, I can handle the press. I know how to speak the language of reptiles. Well, you're not doing your Dr. Doolittle routine this time. I do not want to read according to James Lacey, or according to Mrs. Raisin, or according to an unnamed source with a cat named Chivers. Now, hold on. I thought you chaps used the press as your main line of attack. I mean, how are you going to get information if you don't have appeals for witnesses? Mr. Lacey, we use the press, not you. That way we can control it, and any dangerous rumours get knocked on the head. With respect, Bill, you have as much control of the press as David Attenborough has over herds of rampaging wildebeest. Uh, phone call for you, Bill. Whoever it is, tell him I'll talk to him later. Right up. And another thing. Yes. I do not want you two sticking your noses in. Whoever did this is extremely dangerous. Well, whoever did this is unlikely to live in this village. I mean, the killer picked her up like a sack of potatoes. I can't visualise someone from the Carsley Lady Society doing that. Mrs. Mason could probably manage it. We are currently following all lines of inquiry. And until this case is solved, you are not to talk to anyone about it. Understood? Yes, I, I think that's a reasonable request. Agatha? My lips are sealed. I'm well, glad to hear it. In the past, I've been very grateful for your help, but this time I... Re Bill, is the chief constable on the line and he really won't hold? All right, you two. I'll just be a second. Right, James, who should we talk to first? Well, Bernard Spot seems quite promising. I mean, he was rather close to Mary. I want to save him for later. How about the boggles? What about the coffee shop? Can you read my letter? All right. Look who's here. Oh, it's you two, is it? I've been watching neighbours on the telly, so you'll just have to wait. I don't expect tea or coffee neither. I've got better things to do with my pension. We just wanted to talk to you. I said I'm watching neighbours. What's going on around here? And I don't like it. Right, that's it. That's done. Don't know that is. Um, we were hoping to talk to you about the late Mary Fortune. Mary Fortune. Trollop. Tart. 
But I thought Mary took you for trips in the countryside. Oh, well, she did once. But the second time she come round here and I said I wanted to go to Bristol to look at the ships, didn't I, Boggle? Yes. She said it were too far and I said, didn't I, Boggle, that it was her duty to help the old get about? Not all of us had money to go gallivanting about in large cars. And what did Mary say to that? <laughs> that painted hussy had the cheek to say we should be in an old folks home. I mean, did you ever hear the like? So I told her to get out and take her trollopy ways with her. Yes, you told her. You certainly told her. Is there any chance of opening the window? I'm boiling in here. It's like being in a greenhouse. No, you can't open a window. I'm not going to freeze to death for the likes of you. Now, where was I? Oh, yes. Next thing I know, all our garden gnomes have had their heads chopped off. And there's no doubt in my mind who did the chopping. Well, that seems very strange behaviour for a middle-aged woman. Oh, you would take her side now, wouldn't you? I think it was disgraceful the way you two carried on. I mean, in my day, we got married before there was any of that. Right. Um, thank you for your help. <laughs> but it suddenly got much too hot in here. Well, when are you going to take us out again, Mrs. Reason? We had a lovely trip last time. Aye. Uh, sorry, my car's out of service. Oh, uh, you get a fix? No. The only mechanic who was qualified has moved to Kuala Lumpur. So afraid not. Oh, dear. Come on, James. Uh, goodbye. <laughs> hey, hang on. Why don't you take it? Life is far too short to be nice to old people. Really, Agatha? Now, about Mary. Oh, yes. And Mrs. Boggle started talking about you two. I thought I was going to have to hose you down. Well, she was just a friend, but one night she did invite me back to her conservatory. I see. And did you exchange seedlings? Well, it was a moment of midsummer madness. Sorry. I don't know why you're apologising. It's not as if I'm jealous or anything. Oh, good. Well, excellent. Well done. Right. Well, I think we should visit Bernard's spot. The Boggles had their gnomes decapitated. He had his fish poisoned. There has to be a link. It's going to be a bit tricky to pull that one off. I mean... D.C. Wong is rather expecting us to go home and keep our noses clean. We don't have to tell him. Yes, but, but if Bernard is being besieged by the massed ranks of Fleet Street's grubbiest, what happens if we get photographed on his doorstep? There's one surefire way to make sure you never get your picture in the papers. What's that, then? Uh, join the Liberal Democrats? No. Close your eyes. No picture editor will ever use a photo where the subject has their eyes shut. It looks terrible. Oh, so uh, we make our way there by Braille, then, do we? Exactly. Eyes shut and try not to step on the reptiles. Excuse me, are you any relation to Mr. Spot? No comment. Ow! Oh, terribly sorry. Was that your foot? Have you got the sun in your eyes, mate? I, I refer you to the answer my colleague gave earlier. Are you just scared of looking at the village of death? No, that's really unfair. It's not at all like that. If you live here... No, rise to the bait. He just wants a photo of you looking angry. Oh, I'm sorry. No comment, old chap. <laughs> Come in, Mrs. Raisin. Mr. Lacey. The rest of you can bugger off! Oh... How long will these siege conditions continue? Oh, another couple of weeks, I'm afraid. This week, the tabloids will write about the village of death. Next week, all the posh papers will say how appalling the tabloids have been, and then they'll quote every salacious detail. Makes me ashamed to be British. And the police are no better. How will they ever find Mary's killer? They don't even know who killed my goldfish. Well, Bernard, I, I know this is going to sound strange, but there is a theory going round that, that Mary was responsible for the garden vandalism. Mary? Mary Fortune? It's inconceivable. Well, why not? Mrs. Raisin, Mary was a wonderful, generous human being. And when I think of all that beauty extinguished in one barbaric act... Well, that may be the male point of view. Some people see her as a manipulative floozy who slept with anything in trousers. Get out. What? Get out of my house. Ooh, I was just making conversation. Well, may I suggest you offer your crackpot theories to the police? Well, I thought you said the police were no use. I'm prepared to be interviewed by the police. I consider it one of the more unpleasant duties of being a British subject. When it comes to the likes of you two, it seems like vulgar curiosity. Oh, Bernard, we're not doing this for ourselves. We're doing it for Mary. Do you mind? I have a Boy Scouts jamboree to organise. Kindly leave me to get ready. Oh. 
Well, what do you expect from a geriatric scoutmaster? Agatha, have you ever considered a career as an international diplomat? With your skills as a peacemaker, the world will be plunged into Armageddon within seconds. Eyes closed, James. Don't let the reptiles see you. I mean, how did you work in PR so long without anybody hitting you? Usually I hit them first. Come on, you two. A joke's a joke. How about a nice picture? Oh, hey! Oh, dear. Was that your camera? I do hope it wasn't too expensive. There you go, Chivers. I know I've been ignoring you, and yes, I am trying to fob you off with food, but it is that rather nice turkey with a little bit of jelly in it. Is it all right if I stay for a bit? Oh, are we friends again? <laughs> Just I don't fancy running the gauntlet of the press anymore. It's been a rough few days. Yes, I'm feeling the strain too. Time for a cigarette. <laughs> oh, well. To your life, you're smoking away. <sighs> Do you have to be so sanctimonious? The vat on my cigarettes pays for every hospital in Britain. Though I suppose you don't approve of dialysis machines, CAT scans, children's wards. Oh, don't answer it, James. That'll be a tabloid newspaper wanting us to pose with a terracotta pot and a length of rope. Oh, yes, some dreadful rag. Oh, probably the Guardian. You've reached the answer phone of Agatha Raisin. Please leave a message. Oh, um... A message for Mrs. Raisin. This is Mr. Wilmot here from Wil... Hello? Hello, Chivers. Yeah, yes, it is. You're a clever old cat, aren't you? Oh, yes. Who do you think murdered Mary Fortune? Well, what's that got to do with me? Was it strange old Bernard? Did she really? Nasty Mr. Boggle. Well, when can I come round? His evil wife. Right, I'll be there this afternoon. Or none of the above. I'll see you later. Bye. Who was that, then? Wrong number. <laughs> that was Mary's solicitors. Apparently, she's left me something in her will. Oh, you too. What? She left me something as well. I got the message this morning. Really? And when were you going to tell me? Well, to be honest, I found it a little difficult. I, I wasn't sure if you'd be jealous. Jealous? Me? Yes, you. I am old enough and ugly enough to accept that Mary had a thing for you. After all, you are her type. What does that mean? You wear trousers and you've got a pulse. Oh, I see. So that's why women queue up outside my door with homemade cakes. That's why I can't get my book written because of constant interruptions from the Carsley Lady Society. It's because I have a pulse, is it? Well, it gives you the edge over most of their husbands. Yes, I suppose men are a bit of an endangered species in the Cotswolds. At least I shall never want for a Victoria sponge. So... Let's go and see what your last fondant fancy left for you. And more to the point, what she's left me. Mm. Ah, there you are. Uh, take a seat, please, Mr. Lacey, Mrs. Raisin. Thank you. Thank you. Now, you will um, understand that I'm duty-bound to read the exact words that Mary used in her last will and testament. Certainly, yes. Although some of these words are calculated to wound. Far away. I've probably heard worse. Very well. Uh, uh, to Mrs. Agatha Raisin of 10 Lilac Lane, Carsley, Gloucestershire, I leave the sum of £5,000. This is to pay for a tummy tuck and a much-needed course of Botox. Now I'm being bitched from beyond the grave, am I? Uh, would you like me to continue? Yes, please do, by all means. To James Lacey of 8 Lilac Lane, I leave £5,000 for services rendered, although these services were not really worth that much. You had a wonderful sense of humour, Mary. <laughs> and that is the sum total of your bequests. When will the money come through? Well, it is, of course, subject to a police investigation, but dependent on the outcome, I should be able to extract the grant of probate and convert your legacies within this fiscal cycle. Before you become a solicitor, do you need a degree in gobbledygook? Mrs. Raisin, you will have your money all in good time. Of course, I was forgetting. There are a hundred days in a solicitor's month. <laughs> right, James, I'll see you back in the car. Um, you used to be offended by Mrs. Raisin, uh, and... Thank you for reading it all with such a straight face. Well, it 
sounds as if it was more than just one night of midsummer madness. It's not illegal. Of course not. I just thought you had better taste. Are you going to accept your money? May as well. It'll pay for my ridiculous garden, and I only bought that to keep up with her. Well, where do we go from here? Left of the light, straight past Mr. Wu's heavenly pagoda, and then we're in the village. No, I mean with a murder investigation. Oh. Whoever killed Mary must have had incredible strength. It rules out 99% of the village. We really aren't getting anywhere, are we? Well, do you have any bright ideas? No, I mean the traffic. We're gridlocked. Oh, yes, it's, it's the Boy Scouts Jamboree. You remember? Bernard Spot's little extravaganza. So what's all that scaffolding on the village green? Let's get out and have a look. Come on, boys. Hoist yourselves up. Just your forearms. Don't use your whole body. Just the forearms. You know, I really feel short should be illegal for anyone over 50. Well, he's managed to shake the press off. The press wouldn't want to come here. They don't want happy pictures of people getting on with their lives. They want empty streets, tearful faces, the village of death. As opposed to our very strange rural customs. Yes, what exactly are they doing on that haystack? It's some kind of mountain rescue display. They're picking each other up with ropes and pulleys. How useful. Once they've learned to do that, they can break into upstairs windows. Oh, don't be such a killjoy. It's amazing how much weight one boy scout can carry. What did Archimedes say? If I had a big enough lever, I could lift the world. Or, oh, if I had a rope and pulley system, I could pick up a heavy corpse. Well done, boys! Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. The next display will be at five o'clock sharp. Should we go to the police? Not yet. Let's pop round to Bernard's garden. Agatha, you know that feeling you have when you absolutely know something is the right thing to do? Yes. Well, I'm definitely not having that now. In fact, I'm feeling quite the opposite. If you don't want to help, you can go home. I'm sure you've got a crossword puzzle to solve. Good idea. And the only thing in my life that still makes some kind of sense. Go on, then. No. I couldn't go home. I'm not having your death on my conscience. I am perfectly safe. Bernard is half a mile away teaching Boy Scouts how to be cat burglars. Well, what are we looking for? I don't know. Rope, weed killer, sharp implements. Good grief, Agatha. You could arrest all of Carsley for possession of those. And please don't disturb the fish. Looks as though he's got some new ones. Aren't they the most boring pets in the world? Do you like goldfish? Actually, I do. Although I prefer koi, which is what these are. Do you have to be so pernickety? The correct word is pedantic. Give me strength. James, what are those? Oh, huh. by the pond? They're tiny little headstones, look. Must be some sort of pet cemetery. In loving memory of Judith Victoria, who was taken far too soon. Must have been a cat or a dog or something. I'm going in the shed. I get that. No, you really mustn't. I absolutely forbid you. <sighs> And what fiendish item are you hoping to find in there? Trowel. I want to know what's buried here. Now, now this time you really are going too far. I, I, I insist that you stop. No, I demand I demand it. Or you'll do what? Write a strongly worded letter to the Daily Telegraph? What are you going to say if Bernard comes back? I don't know. Good evening, Bernard. When he sees the way you've picked a bat in his garden, he'll be seething. Middle-aged scoutmasters do not seethe. They quietly stew inside their shorts. Bernard comes back, I'll improvise. I always get away with it. I know you do. That's because you always have people around to help pick up the pieces. I think I've reached something. I guess it's going to be a Jack Russell or a cat. Well, it isn't. It's smaller, about the size of a fish. In my opinion, anyone who builds a graveyard for fish is not quite the full shilling. It's a bit of a sweeping statement. Right, open the box. It is a fish. To a normal person, it's a fish. To Bernard, it's dearly beloved Judith Victoria. What are you doing with Judith Victoria? Why have you desecrated her grave? Bernard, thank goodness we found you. We just wanted to warn you that the police are on to you. They tested the rope that hanged Mary and they've traced it back to you. They couldn't have done. It was the scout's rope. Oh dear, I think oh. you've just given yourself away, old chap. The world's better off without that woman. And her sneering, and her lies. She led me on, you know. She told me to come and see her in her conservatory. You weren't the first man to visit her conservatory. We used to spend many happy evenings there, discussing leaf mould and pest control. And then she told me that she'd broken up with her lover. 
he'd had an operation, so he was no use to her. And she asked me where she was going to get another man in this village, and I told her to look no further. And did she take you up on the offer? She just laughed at me. She said I was a sad old man who wasn't in her league. She did have quite a vicious streak. So do I, Mr. Lacey. I told her it was far too hot in there, and she'd better watch out or her face would melt. How did she take that? She just giggled. Didn't seem to mind. But that night, she crept into my garden, poured weed killer all over my beautiful, innocent fish. Now, now take your time, Bernard. Take your time. <laughs> she didn't know I'd seen her, but I did. A very light sleeper. So what did you do? I did nothing. I'm a gardener, Mrs. Raisin, and the one thing you need more than anything else is patience. Next time I saw her, she was friendly with me, as if nothing had happened. She carried on giving lectures to the Horticultural Society. I carried on exchanging cuttings with her, and eventually she started inviting me back to her conservatory. But how did you do the deed, Bernard? It wasn't rocket science. We sometimes enjoyed a glass of brandy of an evening. And I told her that when I was in the Navy, I could polish off a whole glass in one gulp. But I didn't think a woman would ever be able to manage that. Well, if there was one thing Mary liked, it was a challenge. In the, uh, it wasn't brandy, was it? Some of it was. The rest was weed killer. And she downed it in one. Surely she tasted it. She must have put up a fight. She struggled for a few minutes, but it wasn't hard to restrain her. Like holding down an inflatable doll. Bernard, it's a very good thing that you've told us this. And I think it would be better in the long term if you went and told the police, no? Oh, the police. Thank you. Yes, I've got a lot to do before they get here. What are you talking about? Well, I'm just going to brush my hair. My photograph will be in all the newspapers. Typical. I couldn't get them to come to the Jamboree, but they'll be swarming all over my doorstep any minute now. James, what are we going to do? We wait here till he comes back. Are you mad? He could have gone to get a gun. And there's nothing more likely to make him pull the trigger than the sight of us running down the garden path. I'm phoning the police. Oh, we're quite safe. He's in the kitchen, combing his hair. Bill, it's Agatha. In Bernard Spot's back garden. He's just confessed to the murder. He's gone inside. Right. What does he say? He says we're to get out of the garden immediately. Really? I'd rather stay here. I'm a bit concerned about old Bernard. James, what's got into you? I thought I was the headstrong one. He's just been pottering about in the kitchen. He had a glass of water, and then he disappeared. Are you sure it was a glass of water? Oh, Lord! Bernard! Bernard! Oh. Uh, James, can you do first aid? I was in the army for 30 years. Oh. Weed oh. killer. I should have guessed. Oh. There's not much I can do here, Agatha. Well, pick him up. Make him walk up and down. That only works in films, I'm afraid. And I don't think anything's going to work now. Oh, Roy, thanks for coming to stay. I still can't sleep without terrible dreams of dying scoutmasters. That's what friends are for, Aggie. And to build designer gardens for you. I never did get to the bottom of that. Why were all the labels on the wrong plants? I was publicly humiliated. Nothing to do with me, sweetie. I numbered them one to a hundred, left to right. I told Gary, just follow the path round. Never mind. Anyway, Bill Wong was furious with us. He claims they were already on to Bernard, but thanks to us, all they've got is another body. Uh, well, at least he won't do it again. I mean, he could have poisoned the entire Carsley Ladies Society, anthrax and the angel cake. Roy, right, don't make jokes about it. It's not nice. I'm just trying to take your mind off things. That James Lacey seems a nice chap, especially when he's got his shirt off. He is. He's a thoroughly decent human being, and in spite of that, I still get on with him. <laughs> well, shall we pop round, then? Maybe we can have a look at his earlier scar. I'd rather not. Funny thing is, when he told me that he had a hernia, the only thought in my mind was, oh, good, now I'll be able to win the gardening competition. Yeah, that's your gift, Aggie. You're always able to draw comfort from the suffering of others. But when I heard he'd had an affair with Mary, it really hurt. I don't know why. 
I mean, the man means absolutely nothing to me. Oh, dear. I sense a maudlin moment coming on. I'll just get some more gin. No, Roy, it's in the cupboard on the left. What? No, I said the left. Oh, I'm sorry, I get confused. Right, you don't know the difference between left and right. All right, you don't have to go on about it. You know I'm nine-tenths dyslexic. So that's why I was humiliated at the garden festival. When you told Gary to put the labels on left to right, you meant right to left. Honestly, Aggie, so you were humiliated. It's all you ever think about, self, self, self. Anyway, it doesn't matter now. I'm getting rid of it all. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to rip up every last plant and put down a patio. Oh, Aggie, you can't do that. You can't destroy my beautiful back-to-front garden. You can watch me. I've had it up to here with green things. From now on, I'm sticking with concrete. In Agatha Raisin, Penelope Keith starred as Agatha and Malcolm Sinclair was James. Roy was played by David Holt, and Bernard Spot by Paul Brook. Liza Sadaby was Mrs. Bloxby, and Ben Crow was DC Wong. Agatha Raisin was dramatized by David Semple from the novel by M.C. Beaton, and the producer was Carol Smith. Here, please. Ooh, get We've just had a letter from the National Ramblers League. Ah. Ten things for all Ramblers groups to remember. One, always close the gate. <laughs> Two, never light fires on open farmland. Ah. <laughs> yeah, right, whatever. Okay, thank you, Kelvin. I've got something a little bit more interesting. That stuck up little weasel at the library has finally got me the new rights of way map. And it's just as I thought, there is an ancient route straight through Sir Charles Whittaker's land. Yes! Deborah, yes. what are you going to write to old Charlie Moneybags? Yes! <laughs> Thank you, Kelvin and uh, Jessica. Yes, I, I have written to Sir Charles and I have now had a reply. Really? And what do the old fascists say? He's um, invited me round for tea to discuss the matter. Mm. Oh, no! <laughs> oh, great, with a real life. Oh, lovely. <laughs> Your teeth, Sir Charles, ah. and a selection of sandwiches. Thank you, Gustav. Don't worry, I'll pour. As you wish, sir. No, Miss Camden. <laughs> Deborah, please. Well, Deborah, I must say I did enjoy your little letter, but there's one thing that slightly puzzles me. Oh yes. Why are you quite so keen to walk through the Barfield estate? Uh, that will be all, Gustav. Very good, sir. Well, um, it's our democratic right, you see. They've just published the conclusive map and the right of way goes straight through your land. Ah, yeah. Let me have a look. Ah, yes. I notice it also goes through the council estate. And are you writing to them to ask if you can march through their gardens? Um, no. I, uh, I don't think so. Not quite. No. Well, you seem a charming young lady, and I'm very happy for your merry little band to walk through my estate. But there is one condition. Oh, right. So, Deborah, how was your tea party with the enemy? Hey, did he threaten to set the dogs on you? <laughs> uh, no, he, he was quite nice, really. Nice? We're talking a bloated parasite who lives on 200 acres of land stolen from our ancestors. Well, he said we can go through it. There is one little field we have to go round. He's um, growing rapeseed, so he's diverted the path round. He can't do that. It's a public right of way. He's not allowed to obstruct but it. But he did say we could walk round it. Oh, he's tugging our forelocks as we go. Not only is he a parasite, the man is breaking the law. Jessica, I thought you were an anarchist. That isn't relevant. Well, if he wants to put barriers in our way, then it's up to us to smash them down. Agatha Raisin by M.C. Beaton. Dramatised for radio by David Semple. Starring Penelope Keith as Agatha. The Walkers of Dembley. Come on, oh. Oh. oh, 
Mrs. Broxby, come in. Oh, thank you, Mrs. Brazen. Uh, have you been back long? We flew in last night, so I thought I'd just pop by with some of our holiday snaps from Fuengir order. <laughs> oh, and the Battenberg cake. You really shouldn't have. Uh, let me take the cake from you and, and, and do sit down. Oh, thank you. Is anything the matter? Bit of a domestic emergency, I'm afraid. Chivers has climbed onto that antique tall boy and has no idea how to get down again. I think she has difficulty reversing. Oh, the poor thing. They never quite lose that panther-like urge to climb, do they? No, but when she gets to the top, she suddenly turns into a scaredy cat. Oh, come on, Chivers. Come on. Oh, poor Chivers, don't be scared. It's not that far. I'm just going to get a stool. Oh, good idea. I don't think she's going to jump without a parachute. <laughs> right. Here we go. Oh! Oh! oh. oh. This is Raisin. Are you all right? I'm fine. The stool is ruined, oh. though. And you managed to make your own way down. Oh, well, well done. Let me help you with that. Ouch. Ooh. Oh. I'm astonished it wouldn't take my weight. Oh, don't worry about it. I'll put the kettle on and slice the button back. Mrs. Bloxby? Yes, dear? Do you think I'm putting on weight? Well, I can't say I've really noticed. Since moving to this village, I've given up work, stress and activity, and I've discovered cakes, soft furnishings and daytime television. You should join the Carsley Walkers Society. Oh, not another society. No, no, honestly, this will be much better than the line dancing. It's only been going a couple of months. James Lacey runs it. James Lacey? He never said anything to me. Well, he did put a leaflet through everyone's letterbox. Oh, I see. Uh, those things go straight in the bin. It's really rather good. He's always pointing out fascinating bits of village history. Things Alf and I never knew in spite of all our years here. <laughs> All right, I'll give it a try. It's either that or the Carsley Porkers Society. <laughs> Where can I buy some Wellingtons? And over the brow of the hill. Now, the road we just crossed was Wayne Body Road. Anybody know what Wayne Body means? Um, uh, yes, Mrs. Bloxby. Is it Wayne as in to wane or fade away? No, not quite. This Wayne is Old English for wagon, and Wayne Body is where wagons full of bodies were driven to... Jimmy uh, Hill. It goes to Chibbin Hill. Exactly. Well done, uh, Mrs. Raisin. Throughout the 17th century, wagons full of bodies, uh, the enemies of the crown, were taken to Chibbin Hill, where they were hung from gallows, or gibbets, as an example to the others. They think of one or two people, they should do that to these days. <laughs> uh, I'm sure you can, Mrs. Boggle. Now, Chibbin Hill is part of the Barfield Estate, so it's probably best we walk round it. Everybody fit? Yeah. Don't look at us. It's you young'uns always straggling behind. <laughs> well then, Mr. Boggle, let's head for the hill. Shall we have a sing-song? Oh, Lord, do we have to? Well, I, I always think it makes the going a bit easier. All together now. One man went to go. Went to go and let go. One man and his dog. <laughs> Uh, wolf, wolf. Yay! Went to mow a meadow. Two men went to mow. Went to mow a meadow. Two men, one man and his dog. Wolf. Yay! Oh, stop! Oh, 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 my legs! Oh. For heaven's sake, you're killing me! Me heart! Me heart! Take me home before I die! Hey, look, can we stop a minute, please, everybody? you got no respect for your elders tearing off like that! Uh, Mr. Boggle, would you like me to take you and your wife home? My car's just down the hill! No, no, uh, just take us back to the pub. We just need a glass of water. We'll be all right there. All right! I'll catch up with everyone later! Bye! Bye! Oh, dear. Was it my singing, do you think? Oh, Mrs. Bloxby, she's a martyr to the boggles. Uh, hang on a minute, please. Uh, do you need to catch your breath as well? No, I just need a cigarette. Honestly, Agatha, as a penalty, you can lead the sing-song. Are we all fit? Yeah. Yeah. All right. One man went <laughs> to mow. Oh, went to mow a meadow. One man and his dog. Wolf, wolf. Hey, went, went to mow a meadow. Two, two men went to mow. <laughs> Uh, don't, don't, don't worry, everybody. J just a spot of clay pigeon shooting. It came from Gibbet Hill. It's nothing untoward, I guess. This is the countryside. People do shoot things. Including other people from time to time. Uh, give me your binoculars. Ah. Can you remove the strap from my neck before you grab them? Looks like a diplomatic incident between a farmer and some rather scruffy ramblers. Let me have a look. Ah, ah, they were warning shots. Oh, Farmer Giles seems to be throwing his weight around all the 
18 stone of it. They're probably having an illegal rave on his land. Nothing like an open mind, is there, Agatha? I'll just pop down and see if I can help smooth things out a little. You're not going on your own. Yes, I am. I think this calls for diplomacy and tact. I can do tactful. I just prefer to do ruthless. Agatha, why don't you stay here and make a daisy chain? You cheeky devil. Right, everyone, I'm oh, off I... to see what's going on down there. Oh, I'll, I'll be back in ten minutes. If they don't use you for target practice. Hello, everybody. What were those gunshots? A little fracas between some ramblers and the farm. Captain Mannering Lacey has gone to investigate. Oh, that could be the other ramblers group, the Walkers of Dembley. Dembley? It's the next village along. We don't really have much to do with them. No, you're not going no further! Take your hands off oh, me! Jessica, please, don't provoke me! I can handle this! Good morning! Oh. What seems to be the trouble? Oh, look who it is, Lord of the Manor! Uh, actually, my name's James Lacey, a rambler just like you. Another waste of space, then! <laughs> you people got no right to be here! This is Sir Charles's oh, land! We have every right to be here, and it's one of the few democratic rights that haven't been snatched away by the power elite that run this country. You tell him, Jessica. Don't you lecture me, young lady. I don't take orders from work shy layabout. I am not a layabout. I happen to be deputy head of Denby School. Well, I feel sorry for them kids, then. Now, all this bickering isn't really helping. Is there a particular reason why these people can't walk through your field? Yeah. Are you blind? It's full of oilseed rape! I'm not having this lot ruining my crop! Well, th there is a path round the edge. Oh, but I suppose our working class feet aren't good enough for your path. Yes. You're not getting in and that's fine. Look, oh, Jessica, couldn't we just walk around? Please. I am not letting this capitalist lapdog tell me what to do. Aye. If you won't open the gate, I'm climbing over it. Ah, Don't yes. you dare! No, 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 look here! Well, I respect your right to protect your crop. We don't live in the Wild West, and firing a warning shot is strictly illegal. Ah, you tell him, pal. I don't think the Chief Constable would renew your license if he knew what you'd just done. Don't you threaten me! I am not threatening you. I am pointing out the facts. I very much hope you will let these people pass through your field, and that they will respect you by keeping it tidy. Well, they know what to expect if they don't. Well... It looks as though Action Man Lacey has saved the day. Oh, good. Oh, what's the matter? You appear to be turning into a beetroot. Oh, I really don't like rapeseed. It always makes me sneeze. I mean, it's lovely and gaudy to look at. It brings a touch of Las Vegas to the gods. Oh, but I, I do wish I brought my antihistamines. Well, they oh. call the truth. Oh. He won't shoot them, and they won't trample on his crook. Oh. You haven't got any bullet holes in Thank <laughs> heavens. Now, how about that quiet walk in the countryside? <laughs> One man went to mow, went to mow a meadow. One man had a gun to mow a Mr. Charles, I I'm so sorry about what happened. I, I tried to tell everyone to go round the field, but they insisted Deborah, that we should... Deborah, it's not your oh. fault. I'm appalled. I thought my estate manager was high-handed, cavalier, and downright boorish. Well, we weren't exactly angels. At least you didn't wave a gun about. He must have taken leave of his senses. Yes, sir. It was rather frightening. I tore a few strips off him, I can tell you. He threw down his tools and walked off in a half. I think we all got a bit overheated. The thing is, you have such a beautiful place. Oh. And everyone was just so overwhelmed by it all. Lord but when we actually... Charles. A selection of pretty four. Oh, thank you, Gustav. Oh. Put them down there. Ah. So, anyhow, I just wanted to say I'm sorry and it won't happen again. Please don't mention it. Oh. Right. Milk and two sugars, wasn't it? Oh, you've got a good memory, Sir Charles. Oh, just call me Charles, please. Oh, Lord. Who is it now? Ah, hello, Agatha. Jet, are you busy? Uh, not especially. Um, come in. Coffee? No, thanks. I just have one. Uh, what are you up to at the moment? Actually, I'm uh, still wrestling with the first chapter of my book. The first chapter? Is that the same first chapter you were wrestling with six months ago? Has it really been that long? Well, the Peninsula awarded last six years, and I'm beginning to think the book will take about twice, uh, Maybe it's time you waved a white flag and surrendered. Never. Any minute now, inspiration will strike. 
Though I do realise I've been saying that for six months. <laughs> Have a seat. Thank you. Are you after anything in particular, or is it just a social call? I wanted to talk about the Walker Society. Oh, yes. The one thing in my life that's an unqualified success. Yes. Well, I was looking at possible ways to improve it. I mean, would you like some help with the organisation? What organisation? We put on our boots and we walk. That's just it. Would you like me to organise a proper membership structure, a newsletter, an annual subscription fee? A fee? What will we do with the money? You could buy a computer. I have a computer. What do you think I write my book on? Wax tablets? You need a dedicated computer for the group. Why? To store your membership database on. Agatha, I fear this conversation is a long walk leading nowhere. I was only offering to help. I appreciate that, but you must understand that not everybody needs your help. Sometimes the world turns very nicely by itself, and you've got to learn to sit back, relax, and smell the roses. Fine. I'll leave you to your book. And when social services find you slumped over the first paragraph in a year's time, I'll say, poor man, but at least he took time to smell the roses. The point is, Sir Charles thinks that parasites like him own this country and we should be grateful for the crumbs from his table. Exactly. Well, I propose that next Saturday we break into his estate and destroy his precious race. That, that, that's criminal. Well, then it serves him right for setting his estate manager on us and stopping us walking through his fields. Oh, hang on, Jessica. He did let us walk. Yes. Only because a man with a gun was marching beside us. But, Jessica, I've got a letter from Sir Charles here. He says we can visit any time so long as we make an appointment. We should oh, need oh, oh, to make appointments. Oh, it's our right. Let me see that letter. Give it back, Jesse. You've got his phone number. But it's something to do You've with you. You've actually got the old fascist phone number. But he's much nicer than you'd expect. He, he's really not like the other. Well, since none of you have the courage of your convictions, I shall walk across Gibbet Hill on my own. You lot can stay here. It'll soon be time for bingo. Jessica, please don't go. Please don't spoil things. Debbie. Why are you standing up for this man? That weekend at the teaching conference, have you forgotten all the things we said and all the things we did? What happened in Scarborough was a mistake. I don't want to talk about it anymore. <sighs> Fine. I'm off to Barfield House. And I'm prepared this time. I've got wire cutters. Oh, Jessica, no. You have reached the office of Sir Charles Whittaker. If you wish to leave a message, please do so after the tone. I've got a message for you, Charlie boy. This is the sound of your fence being cut. And this is the sound of your crop being destroyed. And this is a wake-up call for people like you. People who hide behind their wealth who send out slaves to do their dirty work. Your days are numbered. Go! Oh! Oh! What do you want? Get off me! Go! Oh, get off! Get... Oh! There you are, Chivers. Half a tub of cottage cheese. No, I didn't fancy it much either. Hold on. Agatha, can I come in? I suppose so. What are you up to? Teaching my cat to like health food. I'm hoping she can finish off my diet for me. Well, have you read the local paper? No. I haven't been to the news agents yet. I've been in the garden smelling the roses. Now, now stop it, Agatha. This is important. Remember those ramblers who had that little rumpus with the landowner last month? Oh, yes, the Socialist Walkers Party. One of them's been murdered. Let me see that. Police are investigating the death of Miss Jessica Keller, whose body was found on the estate of Sir Charles Whittaker. Miss Keller, 35, was involved in a long-running dispute with Sir Charles over rights of way, and it is believed that at the time of her death she was trespassing on his land. Do you get the impression the editor wants us to think it was Sir Charles? Well, it is rather a good story. Evil landowner wreaks his revenge on Bolshe activists. Oh, look, she was bludgeoned to death with a spade. Very Edgar Allan Poe. What thing, though? According to the article, she had a degree in classics from Cambridge, but she was a teacher at Dembley Primary School. That's not surprising. An awful lot of intellectuals get a job at the village school. They can throw their weight around more if they're with people less qualified than they are. Yes, I know the sort. 
They're holding a memorial service at the school today. It must be a shock for the children. I think at that age they don't really know what death is. Well, they do now. I suppose DC Wong will be there, talking to all the teachers, hoping for some little nugget to fall into his lap. Oh, Constable, it's all been such a shock. Take your time now, Miss Kelly. Yes. Well, last week she helped me take a class and she got all the kids to cut little men out of newspaper. And today I can't bear to look at a newspaper. Would you like us to have a short break? No. Oh, it's all right. I, I'd rather get it over with. You must have been very close to Miss Keller. No. Yes. I mean, we were colleagues and, and both in the walking group, but we, we weren't especially close. And were you aware that she was trying to break into the Barfield estate? She told a few of us at the pub, but we didn't know if she was being serious or not. Did you make any attempt to stop her? Oh, we all tried. But Jessica was a very headstrong person. I keep thinking I should have tried harder. And that's going to haunt me for the rest of my life. Agatha. We really should install a connecting door between our houses because we'd be popping in and out all day. I've got something rather interesting. Hey, hold on for a moment. Right, what is it? An invitation to Barfield House. What? Who's Sir Charles's place? The very same. Why has he invited you? There's no need to look quite so gobsmacked. I assume he's heard of my detective skills. I suppose he reads the papers like everyone else. Sir Charles is keen to clear up this murder as soon as possible, and I've been invited to tea so that we can discuss it. Oh, murder and crumpet, eh? Would you like to come? What? With you? Yes, James, with me. If you went on your own, it would be gate-crashing. Well, I would like to see the old place on the inside. Well, that's settled. Let's go and get changed. Uh, Agatha. Yes? I'm rather surprised you're inviting me. You'd rather pour cold water over your ideas for the rambling society. Forgive and forget. And uh, there is one other reason. Oh, yes? I've never much cared for stately homes. I keep thinking a well-built butler is going to pearl me down the ancient stone stairs. Oh, no, no, they wouldn't do that. They're very well trained, and that's definitely not de rigueur. Well, <laughs> I'm worried that they'll see I'm not one of them. They'll work out where I come from. I go, what are you talking about? Where do you come from? Birmingham. Well... <laughs> I must say, you've totally lost your accent. I know, it's hardly surprising, really. <laughs> that sounds rather attractive, actually. Where did you leave? As soon as I could afford the bus fare. Well, there are worse places you could have come from. No, I'm hard-pressed to think of any of her. <laughs> Thank you, James. <laughs> but Charles will see what the rest of the world sees. An extremely irritating, but um, rather marvellous woman. <laughs> Thank you, James. Well, I'll phone him up and tell him it's crumpets for three. Ah, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Colonel... If you would be so kind as to use the tradesman's entrance into the rear of the house... Actually, we're invited to tea. Mrs. Raisin and Colonel Lacey. I will see if Sir Charles is available. I think the butler did it. Unfortunately, we do need to look at the evidence. When I ran my PR company, we didn't bother with evidence. We had instinct. We turned edible underwear into a worldwide bestseller. And you don't do that by looking at the evidence. The butler's taking his time. He's probably gone to set the dogs on us. <laughs> I told you he'd see straight through me. Oh, now stop the Pygmalion Act. I think he's in the hall. Let's listen. They are just outside. A gentleman and, for want of a better word, a lady. I don't know if they're journalists or photographers or just trying their luck. Gustav, what are their names? A Mrs. Sultana or some such. Good God, man, I invited the woman. Now, uh, my dear Mrs. Rayton, we meet at last, and uh, you must be Colonel Lacey. How do you do? I'm very well, all things considered. Uh, do come in, please. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Now, if you'd like to come through to the drawing room. Gustav, some tea and scones for our guests, please. Very good, sir. Oh, I must apologise profusely for Gustav. 
We have been somewhat plagued by what I believe are called paparazzi. One or two of them have tried to inveigle their way into the house. Well, then I can understand why he's on end. In any case, he does see it as his duty to frighten off the outside world. Really? A Rottweiler would be cheaper and better looking. Mm. <laughs> well, shall we sit by the window? Gives us a clear view towards Gibbet Hill. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, before we go any further, I'd like to know why you invited me. Because you're the famous Agatha Raisin. Am I? Uh, and when did I become famous? When you spend as much time as I do on the internet, looking at local news and gossip, you notice some names crop up more than others. Agatha is rapidly becoming a village institution, mm. solving murders and uh, cheating her way to victory in competitions. Well, <laughs> I find myself in need of your services, Mrs. Raisin. As you know, there was a murder on my land last weekend. I was in London and have several witnesses, all of whom have been interviewed by the police. Good. I can check that out with my police sources. No, you don't do things by halves, do you? Anyway, I know I didn't do it, and the police know I didn't, but there will always be a suspicion that it was my staff possibly acting on my orders. Well, the papers do seem to be hinting at that. Indeed. So... I would like to employ you both as private detectives. Oh. Your job will be to clear my name. I thought our job would be to find out the truth. Uh, you will find the two things aren't mutually exclusive. I'd like to take some photographs of the field where the murder took place. Oh, well, the police have cordoned it off for the moment. They would have a huge tent. <laughs> Looks as if the circus has come to town. Have they found the murder weapon? Yes. It was a shovel, belonging to my estate manager, but any fingerprints were washed off in the rain. How did the killer get hold of it? Two weeks ago, my estate manager had um, a bit of an altercation with some ramblers. Uh, he became extremely abusive, and when I went out to reprimand him later, he threw down his shovel and stormed off. Mr. Charles, I was involved in that little skirmish. I, I tried to make peace between the ramblers and your estate manager. Oh, good heavens, was that you? Yeah, yeah. Oh, Deborah told me about that. Oh, this is good news. <laughs> this is very good news. Gone, Mr. Charles. Ah. Thank you, Gustav. Anyway, I'm keen to know more about the woman who was killed. And by the looks of things, you've already won the trust of some of her friends. I hardly said a word to them. No, but they think you're on their side. Now, here's my plan. I have a flat in Dembley, little pied de terre and I propose that the two of you move in for a few days and try to get to know the walkers a little better. Uh, <laughs> won't we look a bit like undercover police officers moving in just after the murder? Oh, you'll have to spin a yarn about why you're there. I think you should pretend to be a married couple. Uh, maybe on holiday? Uh, let's say it's your golden wedding anniversary. I don't think we've quite reached gold yet. Oh, sorry. Uh, silver, I mean. Uh, do you think you could pull that off? Well, I really don't know. I am... Um... I've never been married before. <laughs> you won't have to do anything beyond the call of duty, old boy. <laughs> uh, have I whetted your appetites? Well, it's close enough to home. At least I can pop back and feed the cat. Well, I can do with a bit of a break from the Peninsular War. And did you say something about money? Yeah, I'll go and get my checkbook. Well, this is a turn-up for the books. Our first paid murder investigation. Are you excited? <laughs> no, I just take it in my stride. A brand new murder. And a brand new marriage. In Agatha Raisin, Penelope Keith starred as Agatha. And Malcolm Sinclair was James. Mrs. Bloxby was played by Liza Sadaby. And DC Wong by Ben Crow. With Rachel Atkins as Deborah. David Holt as Mr. Boggle, Philip Fox as Sir Charles, Alice Hart as Jessica, and Bertie Carvel as Kelvin. Agatha Raisin was dramatized by David Semple from the novel by M.C. Beaton, and the producer was Carol Smith. Agatha Raisin by M. C. Beaton. Dramatized for radio by David Semple. Starring Penelope Keith as Agatha. A Marriage of Convenience. Right, I've just unpacked the mugs. We need tea bags, milk, uh, anything else? Agatha, 
This is never going to work. What do you mean? People are never going to believe we're a married couple. Why shouldn't they? Well, I just don't feel very married. It isn't a medical condition. I'm totally new to this sort of game. I mean, do I call you darling? Only if we're living in a 1950s sitcom. Now, here's your ring. You get a full refund if you take it back within 28 days. <laughs> well, that's longer than most marriages these days, I suppose. Uh, oh. James, not on that finger. Unless you're on a business trip and you've told your secretary the divorce has come through. <laughs> well, at least this flat is a decent size. I, I, I'm so glad we don't have to share a bedroom. <laughs> mm, yes. So am I. Now, uh, let's get down to the pub and mingle with the murder suspects. So anyhow, we go over the fosse way and down into Baggett's Green. Oh, that seems a really good route. Excuse me. Can I help you? Where do I find out about the Dembley Walking Society? Oh, this is it, but we're not walking this week. Um, we've had a death in the group. Yes, uh, my, my wife and I read about that in our local paper. Uh, uh, didn't we, darling? If you say so, dear. Hang on. <clears throat> I know you. You're that man we met at Gibbet Hill. That's right. Oh, you cut Sir Charles's estate manager down to size, didn't you? Oh, yes, I remember you now. I, I'm James Lacey. Uh, my wife and I have, have just moved to the area. Uh, this is my wife, uh, Mrs. Lacey. Agatha. Uh, I'm Kelvin. Uh, and I'm Deborah. Goodness, it's a small world. Well, um, can I buy you good people a drink? That's very kind of you. Uh, I'll have a pint of badgers. I'll have a uh, fizzy mineral water. And I'll have my usual. Oh, uh, what's that? You know perfectly well, dear. Gin and tonic. Oh, of course. I, I, I've got a memory like, um... What do you call those kitchen things with all the holes in them? Sim. That's the ticket. <laughs> right, um, pint of badgers, carbonated water, gin, and it. A tonic. Right. right. Mrs. Lacey, your husband's a scream. That's just what I was thinking. Scream. So, what made the Perriers move to Dembley? Quality of life, really. We're both keen walkers, both retired, and this is a very beautiful part of the country. Oh. Yes, we are lucky to live here. In spite of all the recent horror, mm. it must have been a shock losing uh, Jennifer, was it? Jessica. And yes, it was. I keep waiting for her to walk through the door, tell us to rise up and march through the wheat fields of our capitalist oppressors. Oh, is that the kind of thing she was likely to have said? Oh, Jessica had very strong views about that sort of thing. I didn't always agree with her, though, of course, she had every right to express her opinion. If you ask me, that was what did for her in the end. She was attacked by one of Sir Charles's lackeys. Oh, yes. She was found in his field, wasn't she? Though, what makes you think it was one of Sir Charles's people? Oh, just a hunch. Mind you, they'll never prove it. It's the old, old story. If you've got the money, you can get away with anything. Oh, oh do you think so? Most prisons these days seem to be social clubs for MPs and pop stars. Right, right, here we are. Uh, uh, badgers. Fizzy water, g and and a scotch. Cheers, pal. Thank you. Your, uh, your wife was saying that you've retired. That's right. I was in the army for 30 years. Oh, you're a military man. Yes, but, but I gave it all up for love. The day I met Agatha. There's some things in life too precious to lose. <clears throat> and the day I cast my eyes on this, on this wonderful woman, I thought, forget your country, forget your job, forget your social status. All that matters is this lovely, sweet lady. Oh, Mr. Lacey, that's so beautiful. That's really, really beautiful. <laughs> well, that was the most convincing display of marital bliss since Liza Minnelli last staggered down the aisle. Oh, for heaven's sake, I was only acting. Well, you're a terrible actor. That's not what they said at the Army Benevolent Fund when I gave them my nanky poo in the Mikado. No wonder morale is so low in the armed forces. I need a cigarette. Agatha, this is Sir Charles's flat. Does he really want his wallpaper to be sepia-tinted? If you don't shut up, it'll be blood-spattered. Well, I think with that display of man's evolutionary origins. Anyway, what did you think of young Kelvin? He was giving you some very funny looks. I think he saw right through you. So does that mean he might be feeling a bit guilty? He might think someone's onto him? No, it just means he has a brain. Now, what about Deborah? Sweet little thing, yes. Rather charming, actually. I thought so. Men always go for women like that. Women like what? Little mousy ones who giggle inanely at their jokes. It makes a pleasant change. Now, 
Deborah was the mediator between the Ramblers and Sir Charles. She's been to Barfield House a couple of times, and she was friendly with Jessica. So, she was familiar with the murder victim, and with the scene of the crime. Uh, well, who can that be? Nobody knows we're here. Probably the gas board selling us electricity. Or the electricity selling us gas. Afternoon, folks. Bill Wong, <laughs> how on earth did you manage to find us? It's my business to keep an eye on what's going on round here. You may think we spend all day putting up new speed cameras, but there's more at the job than that. Well, you'll have to get up early to keep an eye on Agatha. <laughs> I know, I'm thinking of having her electronically tanked. <laughs> I hear congratulations are in order. Are they? What have we done? Mr and Mrs Lacey? <gasps> oh, goodness me, sorry. No, no, can I just clarify? We're not really married. It, it is just an act. There's no need to sound quite so defensive. Actually, I'm aware of that. And I'm also aware of who owns this flat and that you're trying to clear his name. Well, the thing is, we really don't think Sir Charles did it. And why is that, then? Because he's got such a nice face. We have our reasons. And I suppose you're here to say, be good, leave it to the police, go home and take up macrame. No, no, Mrs. Raisin. It's Mrs. Lacey, please. Mrs. Lacey. You do all sorts of things we couldn't get away with. You go undercover, you tell lies, you generally stick your nose in. Now, obviously, we can't condone that, but I just want you to promise, whatever you find, you give it to me first. Have I ever kept things from you in the past? Frequently. Now, where are you off to next? Well, I'm off to the library to look at back issues of the local newspaper, and I'd also like to have a look at the electoral roll, find out where our suspects live and their, and their nearest relatives. <sighs> I'll pretend I didn't hear that. Then I suppose our Agatha's going to pay them a visit? No, I want to talk to the neighbours first, get a clearer picture of who these ramblers are. Oh, I don't like the sound of that. People don't take kindly to strangers snooping on their doorsteps. I won't be snooping. I'll be carrying out market research. It's amazing what people reveal for a £5 gift voucher. Oh, dear me. She's got a clipboard and she's not afraid to use it. Hold on! I'm coming! I'm coming! Yes. Mr. Witherspoon? That's right. I don't care what you're selling. I ain't having it. I'm from the Council's core service delivery unit, and I'm conducting a survey on whether people are happy in their neighbourhoods, whether you feel safe, whether you like your environment, whether you get on with your neighbours. Neighbours, eh? I could tell you a tale or two about them if I had a mind. Well, there's a five-pound gift voucher if you can spare the time to help. Is there? Well, what I've got to say is worth five pounds of anyone's money. Come in, my ducks, before they see me talking to you. Sit yourself down. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> now, there are six questions I need to ask. How long have you been living here? I've oh, been living here since they built the flats. Uh, 1960, um... Nineteen. Yeah, nineteen sixty, and we'll be fine. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you get on mm. with your neighbours? Well, not as well as what I used to. Here next door, she come from Zanzibar. Don't speak a word of English. I don't speak much Swahili, so there ain't much we can talk about. And what about your neighbour across the hall? Mm. Eh? No, that's another story. That is. Did you read in the paper about that woman got murdered on Jibbet Hill? I think I might have. Well, that's her lover. What? <laughs> She's one of them homo sapiens. You mean homosexuals? There's the one. How do you know about this? I've seen it with my own eyes, my dear. I've seen things they don't even allow on Channel 4. Uh, Mr. Witherspoon, with respect, if they were lovers, I'm surprised they invited you in to watch. Ooh, I seen it with a spy holding my door, I did. The two of them kissing goodnight. Well, it started as a kiss, but then they got very excited. And that Jessica with a huge hand, she stuck up. Uh, down thank you, of that's absolutely mm -hmm. fascinating. I only wish I had a box to tick for it. Uh, the love that dare not speak its name, they used to call it. Oh, nowadays it's the love that will not shut up. I don't know what the world's coming to, I really don't. Mr. Lacey, here's the book you requested. Thank you so much. And just let me know if there's anything else you need. I, I will do. Thank you again. James, I've got something to tell you. Uh, darling, do pull up a chair and try to remember there are people reading. I 
was talking in a perfectly reasonable volume. Yes, yes, but your talking impinges on those people who have come here to improve their minds. James, you may see the library as a place of learning, but to me, it's where old people come to save on their heating bills. <laughs> You'd be yes, I, I, I'm, I'm so sorry about my wife. Uh, darling, uh, let's go to the periodical section. Well, have you found anything? Not a lot. I do have an address for Deborah's mother, but the local papers only go back six months. I did find some very cheap flights to Barcelona there. Bugger Barcelona! I have what I think we might describe as a bombshell. Well done, you. What is it? Deborah was having an affair with Jessica. What? Dear sweet little Deborah, she couldn't have. They don't all have shaven heads and look like bricklayers. Well, Jessica certainly did. Haven't you seen her picture in the Dembley Gazette? <laughs> there are lots of reasons why people sleep with each other. Sometimes it's looks, sometimes personality, sometimes it's the bulge in their trousers caused by their wallet. Well, if it was a power thing, I, I suppose Jessica was a bit of a catch. Oxbridge educated deputy head teacher. But there's a much bigger fish in the sea now, isn't there? What do you mean? Deborah has been to Barfield House at least three times, negotiating on behalf of the Ramblers. You don't think she's after Sir Charles, do you? If my theory is correct, sweet little Deborah is about to bait her hook and dangle it in the water. Deborah, it's so sweet of you to come and visit. Oh, I couldn't bear to think of you alone all weekend. Well, it can get quite terrifying, what with the howling wolves and the ghosts of my ancestors <laughs> rattling round in their chains. <laughs> You're always teasing me. <laughs> anyway, Gustav will be back on Sunday. You're really lucky to live in such a beautiful house. Beautiful, is it? Baedeker described it as architecturally undistinguished. Still, there will always be critics. I used to visit places like this when I was little. And all the interesting bits seem to be fenced off with a rope. Those weren't the interesting bits. Those were the staff lavatories. <laughs> <laughs> well, I used to dream that one day the owner would come down, lift up the rope and say, You don't need to bother with that. Come with me and I'll show you all the hidden nooks and crannies. <laughs> well, we were open to the public once. I cannot tell you how soul-destroying it is to have herds of people trampling across one's childhood memories. I could have cheerfully picked up the rope and strangled them with it. I know. People can be ever so disrespectful of beautiful things. I'm fed up with beautiful things. I prefer beautiful people. Oh. So, are you here for the whole weekend, Deborah? I'm all yours, Charles. Well, let's lift up the rope. And I'll show you my private area. Oh dear. In the times like this, I really wish I'd taken up watercolours instead. It's Deborah. I know it's Deborah. I can feel it in my gut. But how can you be so certain? I can't be. Which is why we're going to visit her mother. Oh, well, that'll clear it all up. Mrs. Camden, is your daughter a decent sort? Yes, dear, apart from her habit of bumping off ex-lovers. James, I know she'll try and protect her daughter, but something will slip. The police have probably interrogated her till she's blue in the face. But we are not interrogating her. We are two journalists writing a sympathetic piece on the local tragedy and all the people affected by it. And uh, which paper are we meant to work for? The Grave Robbers Gazette? All you have to do is nod your head and keep chewing your pencil. Fine. I know my place. And when Mrs. Camden attacks you with a steam iron, do I use the pencil to defend you? Here we are. Oh, Lord. Here we go. Over the top. Hello. Mrs. Camden? That's right, Pet. My name is Agatha Lacey. I'm the editor of Cotswold Life magazine, and this is my assistant, James. How do you do? Ah, you'll be wanting to talk about the wedding. What? I can hardly believe it. My Deborah and a real-life baronet. What? Y yes, it's, it's an absolute fairy tale, which is why my editor is quite lost for words. <laughs> Let's go inside, and, and you can tell us all about it. No. My Deborah. She always said she would make something of her life. When she were a kiddie, she said to me, Mum, I'm going to be a teacher. 
And she worked so hard for her exam. She had no help from her father, mind. He was no use to her. Right, right, I get the picture. A very well-motivated young person. Yes. So, when she says to me, Mum, I'm going to marry Sir Charles Whittaker and live at Barfield House. Oh! I was so happy for her. But they've only known each other a few weeks. Well, that's just the sort of person my Deborah is. If she wants something, nothing will stand in her way. Nothing, or, or indeed no one. Oh, it's going to be a dream wedding. Everyone will be there. Famous people from the television, maybe even the royal family. I imagine Lord Lucan will put in an appearance. Oh, and they're having a cake with little marzipan models of themselves looking like Romeo and Juliet. Uh -huh. Mrs. Cumbers. Yes, Pat. Does Sir Charles actually know that he's going to get married? Well, he, he hasn't got round to asking her yet, but you know what men are like. Yes, indeed. But she said to me, Mum, tonight I know it's going to happen. After all these years on the shelf, I finally found my handsome prince. Well, Deborah, mm. oh. that mm. was a wonderful... Wonderful evening. And I never want it to end. All good things must come to an end, oh. my dear. Mm. Let's celebrate a very special night. Where did that come from? I always keep a bottle by my bedside. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Here's to our future. Yes, to both our futures. Mm. Well, I'm going to go and run us a bubble bath. Oh, Deborah, you're spoiling me. When we get married, I want all of this wood panelling painted white. It's so gloomy in here. Uh, what did you say? I just think this panelling looks so dark. Never mind the panelling. What do you mean, get married? around waiting for you to pop the question. Deborah, we're having fun, that's all. I never said anything about marriage. I'm not the marrying kind. But you've got to marry me. Deborah, let's not argue. We've had a wonderful evening. Let's not spoil it. No. I wouldn't want anything in the world to spoil it. Do you have to drive so fast? I keep thinking we're going to crash into a sheep or something. What would a sheep be doing out at this time of night? I don't know. Sleepwalking. Come on. There's got to be a quicker route. Oh. James, put a cigarette in my mouth. What? It helps me to think. No, it doesn't. It clogs up your arteries and makes you irritable. No, James, you do that. <sighs> Just put it in my mouth. They're on the dashboard. Oh. Uh. 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 Come on. Oh. Sorry, I... I've never been any good with these. You'll just have to wait. Oh, will you stop faffing about and gig here? Oh! 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 Are you all right? Not really. Are you happy now? Well, it's not my fault we're in a haystack. Only one way to get to Sir Charles now. What's that? Cross-country running. Oh! Oh! Your bath warm enough, Charles? Uh, yes, yes, it's it's quite lovely. If it isn't, I could always go and get a kettle. No, no, it's quite all right. Oh. Uh, someone at the door. Oh, don't worry, they'll go. Away. No, I don't want them to go away. I, I, I mean, it, it could be important. Nothing is important except you and me and our future together. Oh, no, Deborah, I'm, I must get out of the bath. Okay, uh -huh. I'll let you if you tell whoever's there. That you're going to marry me. Deborah, you're absolutely crazy. Crazy, am I? Is that what you think of me? <laughs> it's no good. He's not going to answer. James, we have got to get into the house. I'm sure I had shouting. In that case, this calls for action. Get out of my way, Aggie. Let's see if I can still pull off the old unarmed combat training. One, two, three. Ah! Oh! Obviously not. What did you do that for? Because I love the sound of my shoulder dislocating. Honestly. Let's try the tradesman's entrance. Oh. 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 
Come here, Deborah. Just come here. Don't talk to me like that. I'm not a dog. Right, everyone take it easy. Oh. Tell me what's going on. Phil, thank goodness you're here. Deborah has something to say to you. Hello, Constable. It's like a party in here, but then I suppose we've got so much to celebrate. Uh, all right, Miss Camden. Let's come this way. Another cognac, Mrs. Rayson? No, it's all right. I've stopped shaking. I just need a cigarette. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll have another sniff, sir, if I may. Cheers. Cheers. Hmm. Well, I really can't thank the pair of you enough. I mean, you saved my life. You really did. There is the small matter of our fee. No problem. And the damage to my car. Consider it paid for. And the farmer's fee. Don't worry, I'll take care of everything. I wonder how Deborah's getting on. Do you think she'll ever stand trial? I shouldn't imagine so. She'll probably spend the next 20 years in a psychiatric hospital writing obscene poems about it. Oh dear, I do feel wretched. I keep thinking it was my fault that somehow I led her on. Right, Fox. I thought I'd just inform you, Miss Camden has admitted everything. Oh, she good. says she was in love with Sir Charles, but Jessica got in the way. <laughs> and I have a visitor for you, Mrs. Raisin. Oh, yes? If you'd like to follow me. Uh... Bill, I just want to say, whatever I've said about the police in the past, at least you were there when it mattered. Well, there a boy hangs a tail. Oh, yes? We weren't actually after Deborah. No. We were after you for dangerous driving, hence the patrol cars from three counties. Typical. Absolutely typical. Oh, Mrs. Fraser, I'm so glad to see you. We heard there'd been a crash, and I phoned Bill, and he and said... Mrs. Bloxby, I crashed into a haystack. The haystack came off work. Oh, thank goodness. Well, I'll leave you ladies alone. I'll take your statement later, Mrs. Raisin. Thanks, Bill. I have to say, we've all been a bit worried about you, Mrs. Raisin. Oh, yes. We heard you'd moved into a flat with James Lacey. Well, I could think of scarier people one could move in with. So the rumours were true? Mrs. Bloxby, you must never listen to rumours. What were they saying? Well... Tongues have been wagging as to whether bells might soon be ringing. Oh, dear. I don't think we'll be booking the church hall just yet. James and I have been involved in a murder investigation. Oh, that's a pity. I'd almost persuaded Alf to buy me a hat. So it was business rather than pleasure. I'm afraid so. Though there was the odd pleasurable moment. Well, Mr Lacey can be very good company. Yes, when he's not nagging me to give up smoking, whispering on about Napoleon or begging to go home. <laughs> you know, Mrs Bloxby, it's been quite a few years since I lived with someone and I thought it would be a complete nightmare. But uh, it wasn't entirely hell on earth. Coming from you, Mrs Raisin, that's praise indeed. Yes. Given time... I think I could almost get used to it. Goodness! Perhaps I might still get that hat. <laughs> <laughs> well, I must say, you and Mrs. Raisin made a very handsome couple. Oh, yes, well, that was just character acting. Uh, we were both uh, playing a part. Oh, come <laughs> now, James. I did chemistry at school, and you two certainly turned the litmus paper blue. Have you taken leave of your senses? I find the woman an irritant, huh? like a toothache one can never get rid of, like a Leylandi eye, forever blocking one's view of the heaven. Oh, don't <laughs> try and pull the wool over my eyes. I really think you should go for it, old boy. I really think you should stay off the source. You're protesting far too much. Carpe donna, I say. Seize the lady. <laughs> Clearly, this cognac has hallucinogenic properties. I do not have the slightest wish to seize Agatha Raisin. Cheers. Good morning, Chivers. Have you been a good girl this week? Well, so have I. Despite what the Carsley Lady Society is saying. Still, what do you care? 
So long as I can still use a tin opener. There you go. You enjoy that. Oh, hang on, I'm coming. James. Good morning, Agatha. Come in. Hello, Trivers. You must be glad to see Agatha. Everything's back to normal now. <laughs> Are you calling for anything in particular? You left these in my car. Two packets of cigarettes. Well, hey, well, that's breakfast taken care of. Have you ever tried giving up? I did once. It made me even more irritable. Is that possible? Don't start. <laughs> How's the book coming on? Very well. I've uh, finally made a breakthrough. Really? Yes. I, I've changed the name of the opening chapter from The Rumblings of War to Rumblings of the War. Bravo! You're in the home straight now. Well, it was fun pretending to be married to you. Now do we pretend to get a divorce? My imaginary solicitors will be in touch. <laughs> James? Yes, Agatha? Why don't we go out for dinner? You know, to celebrate our divorce. An imaginary dinner? No, James, a real one. Well, that's a good idea. There's a new place just opened in Evesham called um, Serenissima. Oh, is it Italian? I believe so. Good. I'll pick you up at eight. I shall look forward to it. Well, um, back to the Peninsula War then. <laughs> Thanks for the cigarettes. You're welcome. Well, Chivers, a night of Serenissima with James Lacey. Whatever next? In Agatha Raisin, Penelope Keith starred as Agatha, and Malcolm Sinclair was James. Mrs. Bloxby was played by Liza Sadovy, and DC Wong by Ben Crow. With Rachel Atkins as Deborah, Philip Fox as Sir Charles, and Bertie Carvel as Kelvin. Agatha Raisin was dramatized by David Semple from the novel by M.C. Beaton, and the producer was Carol Smith. Agatha Raisin by M.C. Beaton, dramatised for radio by David Semple, starring Penelope Keith as Agatha. The Curious Curate. Ah, oh, Mrs. Raisin. Oh, Reverend Bloxby. I'm so sorry I let you down with the Harvest Festival. Not to worry. Mrs. Dougal did her best with the root vegetables, despite all her recent surgery. Now, the others are waiting for you in the drawing room. Mrs. Brendel, I couldn't trouble you to pass round the cream horns, could I? I'll do my best, Mrs. Bloxby, but I do have tennis elbow and I'm lactose intolerant. Uh, hello, everyone. Oh, hello, <laughs> Mrs. Bloxby. Yes, I've just been confessing my sins to your husband. Oh, no wonder you're so late. <laughs> um, no, it hasn't started yet. Um, Mrs. Wendell, could you squeeze up and make room for Mrs. Raisin? I'll try, but my left leg is playing up. I, I think it's deep vein thrombosis. Yeah. Right, everyone, it's nearly time. Where's the remote control? Now, there. Oh, it's so exciting, our little village on the television. Yes, <laughs> Mrs. Beccarelli. It's just a pity about the circumstances. I expect it's all a bit old hat to you, Mrs. Raisin. You must have been on television before with all your years in public relations. Mm, once or twice, but I gave it up when television became cheap. Uh, shush! It's starting! <laughs> <laughs> And in tonight's Crime Time UK, we're off to Carsley, the perfect postcard village. But look up close, and it's not such a pretty picture. We spoke to the vicar of Carsley, the Reverend Alfred Bloxby. Well, this has always been a very peaceful place. Of course, it's less so now with all the incomers coming in, which is why a curate was appointed to assist me with my duties. Tristan Labelle, 23 years old when he moved to Carsley and was murdered. Oh dear, poor little puppet. Such a sad loss. 3am on Friday the 13th of September, 
Tristan LaBelle was stabbed in the heart with an antique letter opener. At the time, he was checking parish donations when someone came into the room and disturbed him. He was a very conscientious young man, which is why he was working so late. We found him here lying in a sea of money, but not a penny was taken. Your husband looks so nice on the television. Yes, it totally gets rid of his crow's feet. Oh dear, it's me. <laughs> oh, Tristan was so popular. Oh, he was standing oh. lonely when he took a service. In fact, I think Alf was a little bit jealous of... Well, I, 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 I mean, I, I don't mean... That he was... And did you hear anything on the night of the attack? Um, no, but I do sleep with earplugs. Alf has a tendency to snore. And besides, you often hear groups of men in the churchyard. I think they must be badger watching or something. I'm sure it's all perfectly innocent. Uh, oh, look who it is now. He was so charismatic. I mean, mm. whether he was raising money for the church roof or famine relief, he knew how to charm people into giving everything they could. Mm. And he was a breath of fresh air in the pulpit. I mean, compared to some of the sermons we're used to. Mrs. Reason! No, no. I, I didn't mean your husband. I was thinking of, um, of other churches. Oh, don't be quiet. It's James Lacey. Well, on the night in question, I was driving home from a regimental dinner, and I happened to go by the churchyard about 2 a.m. And I, I thought I saw someone lurking behind this rather fine 18th century obelisk. Mm. I, I wondered if I should go and investigate. Then um, thought the better of it. A decision that will haunt me till the end of my days. James Lacey, couldn't you just smother him in whipped cream and lick it off oh. slowly? I thought you were lactose intolerant. <laughs> I'm now crossing the churchyard to the house where Tristan lived with his really? landlady, Maria Beccarelli. Oh, <laughs> you, Mrs. Beccarelli. He was a good boy. He was a kind boy. He used to tell me all his plans, but now it seems none of them will come true. Oh. Were you in the Carsley area on the 13th of September? Perhaps you were in the woods, badger watching. Please phone Crime Time on... Oh dear, I do hope they get some calls. They will, Mrs Bloxby. Everyone who's ever heard of Carsley will ring up. They ignore all the police signs and the calls for witnesses, but as soon as it's on the telly, they suddenly remember they saw something. Yes. Well, that's one less eligible bachelor. Where do we go now to find interesting single men? You would always become a prison visitor. You're a fine one to talk. You seem to spend all day, every day, sniffing after James Lacey. Oh, Why don't you move out of the way and let someone else have a go? Have a go? He's a human being, not a dodge and car. And the reason I spend so much time with him is to protect him from harpies like you. Oh, Mrs. Raisin, do not push me. I'm already on mood stabilizers. Really? A pity they chose such a rotten mood to stabilize. Oh, oh, lady, please. This is meant to be a solemn occasion. That's all right. I'm going out for some fresh air and a cigarette. <laughs> You're still smoking. I thought you'd given up. I can't afford to. It's the one thing that's keeping me healthy. Not sure that I follow. Well, now that it's banned in every public place, I'm constantly running in and out of restaurants. I've never had so much fresh air and exercise. Mrs. Wendell's remarks about James, they rather touched a raw nerve, didn't they? Mrs. Bloxby, do your eyes ever get tired from seeing into people's souls? Oh, I don't have to squint too hard to see into yours, Mrs. Raisin. But I thought you and James were getting on so well. Of course, the one thing that might bring you closer together is this murder investigation. Mrs. Bloxby, you usually tell me to leave that to the police. Oh, well, perhaps you should, but the police don't seem to be getting very far, and I admit, if it were cleared up, my life would be a lot easier. Why is that? Well, I... I don't think anyone really believes that Alf did something terrible to Tristan, but people do gossip. And Alf has become so grumpy because of it. It's as though he's a different person. If they could only find out who did this, I could feel as though I was getting my husband back. It's all right, Shivers. The chef hasn't forgotten you. Now, there's poached salmon with cream and a little bit of lamb's liver from yesterday. Your usual table in the corner, I presume. Now, what do I have? Oh, I'll just shove something in the microwave. Uh, hold on, I'm coming. Mind please, Hold her, Agatha. Bill, come in. 
Don't mind if I do. It's a bit nippy out there. Well, I'm honoured. I thought you'd be up to your eyeballs with the investigation. TV appeal hasn't done much. Though James Lacey has received several proposals on marriage. Oh. Uh, would you like me to put my ear to the ground to see if I can discover anything? No, that is exactly what I don't want. I've come here to, to beg you for once in your life not to interfere in police business. Bill, you always do this to me. Do what? Tell me not to get involved, then you'll pop round in a week and ask me if I've heard anything. Oh, really? Well, I guess it's what we criminologists call a pattern of offending behaviour. Hold on. I'm coming. James, are you busy? No, Agatha, I was standing here waiting for you. The hoover in my hand is just a prop. Are you doing housework? I thought you did it last week. Well, you know, to keep a place in apple pie order, you have to do it at least once a millennium. <laughs> Oh, do come in. And please tread some mud into the carpet. It's about the murder investigation. Oh, yeah. Terrible business. I've just been watching the news. Bill Wong says we're not to get involved. Sound advice. Well done, Bill. So we're getting involved. What? Sometimes when a policeman says no, he really means yes. Remind me never to get into a car with you. Sometimes a red light really means go. We must know there's something going on, but he doesn't want us to get hurt. Because I'm told being stabbed with a paper knife hurts quite a lot. Now look, why don't we leave this whole business to the police? May as well get some value for our council tax. And I can get on with writing my book and you can get on with your, um, well, with your cat. Thank you so much for that, James. Though, I suppose you have a point. Maybe I'm just doing this because I'm bored. Uh, I didn't say that. The thing is, Tristan used to give us all so many things to do. When he was alive, he was always organising fundraising and charity events. What will the single women of Carsley get up to now? <laughs> Hold on. Hello there, James. <laughs> now, I hope you don't mind, but I've made you a rather nice lamb casserole. Uh, Mrs. Wendell, you really shouldn't have Now, can you take it from me? <laughs> oh, uh, I'm not good at holding <laughs> hot things. <laughs> I've got that condition, um, I don't know what it's called, <laughs> but Catherine Zeta-Jones has got it. Oh, right. <laughs> well, aren't you going to uh, offer me a coffee? Oh. Mrs. Raisin seems to have wandered in. Good Lord, so she has a... I must put up a bigger fence between our houses. <laughs> Mrs. Wendell, lovely to see you. And you brought a mutton casserole. Lamb casserole. That's so hard to tell. Well, shall I nip home and get a pudding? How about gooseberry fool? That's quite all right. I won't be staying. James, I'll drop by sometime when Mrs. Raisin's not here. <laughs> I'm sure she must have to leave eventually. <laughs> Oh, God. Will I forever be pursued by women with hot pots? Well, there's one way to escape them. Oh, yeah. Let's go investigating. You know, there's nothing quite so peaceful as an English churchyard. Yes, except when people are being murdered in them. So, where did you see this mysterious figure? Uh, it was just about here. Right behind this tombstone. Hmm. Very good place to lurk. Sacred to the memory of John Bandiscum. In death do our dreams become smoke. Ooh, that reminds me. Must have a ciggy. Those anti-smoking campaigns are worth every penny. Well, you get a very clear view of the house where Tristan was staying. And the vicarage. I want to know why he got out of his bed in the middle of the night to go and check donations. Well, perhaps he was a light sleeper. Or perhaps he was helping himself to church funds. No, not Tristan. Surely not. No, of course not. He didn't have a striped jersey or a large sack with swag written on it. James, I knew him. Well, you think you did, but isn't it possible that the reason the police are getting nowhere is that no one in the village believes anything bad about Tristan? Such as? Such as perhaps his nocturnal visit was to get some money for a quick getaway. But whatever he was trying to get away from, somehow caught up with him. No, I still don't believe that. Agatha, do you mind not stubbing your cigarette out on somebody's headstone? Well, you know what they say. Ashes to ashes. Oh, hello, Mrs. Raisin. Oh, Mr. Lacey. Fancy seeing you two. We were wondering if we could have a word with you. Of course. Let's go home and put the kettle on. Have you been doing your rounds, uh, Mrs. Bloxby? Oh. Parish does keep you busy. Oh, well, to tell you the truth, I just came up for some fresh air. 
My husband is in one of his moods at the moment. Oh, thank goodness you're here, Margaret. I've just seen that dreadful woman having a cigarette in the churchyard. <coughs> that dreadful woman's now having a cigarette in your living room. Oh, sorry. No, I, I didn't mean you. No, there's a Romany woman keeps calling round with lucky white heather. You should buy some. Right now you need all the luck you can get. Oh dear, I do apologise for my husband. Uh, we really want to talk about Tristan. Oh yes? We have a theory, and it is just a theory, that Tristan might have occasionally taken things that didn't belong to him. I see. So the cat's out of the bag then, is it? Oh, there's a cat in a bag, is there? Well, yes, there's a bag at least. My rather shabby handbag. You see, whenever Tristan had come round to visit, I'd often notice there was money missing from my purse afterwards. Not huge amounts, a pound here, a pound there, but... Well, Alf and I aren't very well off, so we do tend to notice that sort of thing. But, Mrs Bloxby, why would he go to all the risk of exposure for the price of a scotch egg? Oh, you tell me, Mrs Raisin. At the time, I thought I was imagining things, but now I wonder, did we have a very damaged person living amongst us? So perhaps the divine Tristan did have a dark side. Well, don't say that to Mrs. Beccarelli. Why not? Because she worshipped him, from his tousled blonde hair to his Tommy Hilfiger trainers. Don't worry, I shall tiptoe around the subject of my very fashionable hush puppies. Mrs. Beccarelli. Oh, it's you two. I knew you were the girl. Come in, come in. Thank you. I was uh, looking at these photographs of Tristan. He's such a lovely boy. Please, mm. sit down. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, may we have a look? Of course. This is the tug of war he did for the old people's home. He made over 2,000 pounds for them. Oh, now that's what I call money for old rope. <laughs> this is the church where he worked in London. They were so sorry to see him go. I can imagine. Interesting. An interesting face, Tristan. Kind of face that... Looks as if he's got a story to tell. <laughs> of course. And wouldn't you love to know what the story was? Uh? I'm sorry? You two want to know about his murder, don't you? I knew you would come. But I have decided. His secrets are staying with me. Uh, Mrs Beccarelli, we're trying to make sure that what happened to Tristan doesn't happen again. Now, if you could just tell us... No more talking, please. It upsets me. Fine. Uh... Oh, may I use your bathroom before we leave? Of course you can. It's at the top of the stairs. Thank you. Well, Mr Lacey, when are you going to make an honest woman of Mrs Rayson? Oh, uh, I, well, I'm terribly sorry. I, I think you've got the wrong end of the stick there. It's, I uh, see the way you look at her. <sighs> I know she is special to you, and I know how hard it is for you to say your feelings. I haven't got any feelings. Well, I mean, I mean obviously, I... I have some, but just not those sort of feelings. Oh, darling, you don't want to go through your life all alone. Don't wait till it's too late, like a book, Tristan. No, no, yes. Uh, speaking of Tristan, did he no, ever... No, Mr Lacey, no more questions. Here, I give you something. For you and Mrs Rayson. Goodness. Is this homemade? It is. Elderflower wine. It was a very good year this year. I don't drink so much anymore. It's too strong for me. But you and Mrs. Rison will enjoy it. Homemade wine? What's that made of? Uh, nothing. Well, I may as well have it. I'm fresh out of insect repellent. Uh, did you manage to find anything in Tristan's room? I assume you dropped in on your way to the lavatory? She's locked the door to stop any skeletons escaping. Did you get anywhere? Afraid not. It's like talking to a brick wall. A rather nice, moss-covered Italiante wall. But there was something strange in one of those photos. Oh, the tug of war, yes. Very ill-disciplined, no sense of strategy. Not that. The leaving party at his old church. Did you recognise the man standing next to him? No. Yeah. Should I have done? You should, if you read the Daily Telegraph. That was Richard Binser. What a savoury snacks millionaire who's now ruining our railways. The very same. 
I've done some PR work for Bincer's Crisps. I might just be able to wangle a meeting with him. Why? You're having to wangle a few cheese football. I think he may know something. What? Because he once stood next to Tristan three years ago. May I remind you, Bill Wong once said I have an almost psychic ability to jump to the right conclusion. Yes, except when you jump to the wrong one. We'll draw a discreet veil over that. No, I'm afraid Mr. Bimser simply can't see you today because he's far too busy. We made an appointment. We have travelled 100 miles to be here. He has no right to stand us up. I'm sorry you feel that way, but Mr. Bimser is an extremely busy man. Oh, I know. Those peanuts don't dry roast themselves. Why don't you give him this piece of paper? He might just see things in a different light. If you wish uh, to send a letter, you will find our address listed in the telephone directory. Uh, oh, for heaven's sake, why can't you just give it to him? For several reasons, not least of which is security. Listen, dear, if we wanted to hurt your boss, we could just wring your scrawny neck and kick the door down. Really? Well, you might find my neck a little tougher than you think. Oh, Mrs. Raisin, Mr. Lacey, so glad you could make it. It's all right, Miss Partle. The Tasmanian meeting has been cancelled. <laughs> Come this way, please. <clears throat> Do have a seat. Mm. Thank you. So, you want to know about Tristan, do you? That is correct. We understand you knew him, uh, briefly. Uh, maybe I did. But is this of any concern to you? Who are you, exactly? We are private investigators, hired by Tristan's former employer. May I see your licence? It's a pending. Oh, I see. So you're nosy Parkers. Well, at least you're not rummaging in my bins. I met Tristan LaBelle on three occasions. He managed to charm his way past my secretary. As you can see, that takes quite a lot of charm. And two years ago, he invited me to donate money to a youth club he was setting up. He was rather good at getting other people's money. No, he didn't get much from me. Only 5,000 pin money, really. That's an awfully expensive pin. So is there a youth club in South London with your name on it? No, there isn't. Tristan had a habit of asking for money for projects that never materialised, and when I learned he was leaving without having set up the club, I asked for my money back. And what happened? I got my money back. Do you have a record of that? <laughs> no, of course not. There was never going to be a covering note. Here's the money I tried to con you out of. It came through the post, £150 notes in a plain brown envelope. Now, if you'll forgive me, I have a business to run, and I imagine you have bring-and-buy sales to organise. Well, I think it was him. A snake in a pinstripe suit. As usual, you are tearing ahead without a shred of evidence. No one gets to be a millionaire by being nice to people. Oh, I've never really thought of you as a class war activist. And when you get back to your half a million pound cottage, will you be heating up the tin bath in front of the fire tonight? I earned every penny of my money fair and square, but I bet you can't say the same for Richard Bincer. Let's try and dig some dirt on him. Some of us have other things to do. So just finishing off our books. Oh, you're not still wittering on about that, are you? Admit it. It's never going to be written. Agatha, my book is almost complete. Which is just as well as it's going to be published next year. Why didn't you tell me you'd found a publisher? I started to tell you a while ago, and you somehow changed the subject to speed cameras, congestion charging, and things you'd like to do to traffic wardens. But I should have been the first to know. I can organise a launch party. We don't need a launch party. It's a book about the Peninsula War. It'll sell 200 copies to colonels in Tunbridge Wells. Well, if you're going to think small, I could get the press and a sprinkling of celebrities. Who? I don't know. The cast of Dad's Army? Uh, wrong war, wrong century, and most of them are dead. <laughs> I do wish people would turn off their phones on the train. Uh, that'll be your phone, Agatha. Oh. Hello? Like anything from the buffet, sir? When did that happen? Well, I never say no to a muffin. Yes, of course. Do you like anything else for that, sir? For how long? Uh, no, thanks. That'll be 125. We'll be there in half an hour. Here you are. Thank you, sir. That was Mrs. Broxby. Mrs. Beccarelli has gone missing. Last seen mushroom picking in the woods. So, uh, I'm going to organise a search party. Uh, which celebrities are you going to have at your search party, Lulu? <clears throat> okay, uh, everybody, uh, thank you for coming. 
We are looking for anything at all belonging to Mrs. Beccarelli. Her basket, her car keys, anything that can help us trace her steps. So, if we could all hold hands facing the woods. Uh, excuse me, Mrs. Raisin. Uh, yes, Mrs. Bloxby. If we're going to hold hands, should it be boy-girl, boy-girl? It's not a dinner party. Is it really the necessary to join hands? The police won't get involved for 24 hours, so we need to be every bit as thorough as they would. Okay, everybody. Now, hold tight. Off we go. Goodness, Mr. Lacey, it's just like one of your history walks, only with a missing person and well, without the history. Um, well, yes, quite. Everyone stop. What? Uh, don't look. I'm afraid it's a dead body. How do you know? The feet sticking out of the ground are a bit of a giveaway. Hello. Morning, Reverend Bloxby. Oh, it's you. Is your wife in? Well, let's go and see. Margaret. Yes? The appalling Agatha is here again. And the appalling Agatha is well within earshot. Ah, Mrs. Raisin, sorry. Mrs. Raisin. Oh, come through to the kitchen, please. Talk to you later, Alfred. It's nice to get away from the tabloid press. I'm being pursued by a snarling pack of journalists at the moment. We hardly dare answer the door these days. I must uh, pour you a cup, cup of tea. Uh, no, no, please sit down. I'll do it. Oh, you're so kind. I can't remember if you have sugar. Uh, not usually, but I'll have three spoons, please. I need the energy. I've been talking to Mrs. Wendell. She says the police were asking about Alf's whereabouts when Mrs. Beccarelli went missing. I keep thinking they're going to take him in to help with their inquiries. You mustn't worry. There's nothing anyone can do. Oh, I know, I know. Do you know what I usually do when I'm upset? Go on, tell me. I clean the house. I find it takes my mind off things. Well, you must have a wretched life. Your house is spotless. <laughs> I don't just clean. I, I scrub behind the fridge. I polish the silver. But now I'm running out of silverware to polish. Oh, Mrs. Raisin. I'm sure they're going to take Alf away from me. But he didn't do it, Mrs. Bloxby. There are quite a few people in prison who didn't do it. Can you tell us what the body looked like in the you? Oh, for goodness sake, shut off! Out of the way, Chivers. I have a bucket of something for the next reptile who rings the doorbell. Right! <coughs> Agatha, what was that for? Oh, James, I'm sorry. I thought you were the Daily Mirror. Oh, I see. I'll never get the hang of you media types. Come in, let's get you dry. Oh. I came to get away from the press pack. I see you're under siege, too. Well, with two murders in a month, it's hardly worth their going back to London. Uh, uh, here, have a towel. Uh, Oh, hello, Chivers. I won't stroke you. I've just had a cold shower. I know what will warm you up. Mrs. Beccarelli's homemade wine. Is there no way to go to get away from his bedroom? Well, the back bedroom might be quieter. Oh, um, yes, uh, Oh, come on. What? Bring the bottle. Oh, right. Uh... This really is rather good, you know. You should try some. Oh. James, I am trying to stay focused on the task in hand. I, I'll stay focused on the glass in hand. Now, look. Hmm. Our number one suspect is still Richard Bincer. Oh, why is that? He seemed a nice enough chap. No one runs a multi-million pound snack empire by being a nice chap. Honestly, Aggie, you're clutching at cheese straw. Oh. <laughs> did you hear that, Aggie? I made a joke. I did hear, yes. Why didn't you laugh? Because I didn't want to intrude upon your private grief. Well, well, what are we going to do then? Rub our faces in boot polish and break into Bincer's office? He'll have closed-circuit TV cameras. It'd be like an episode of the Black and White Minstrel Show. <sighs> I remember that. I'd walk a million miles for one of your smiles, Aggie. You kiss me. Um, yeah, I'm terribly sorry. 
slip of the tongue. Uh, There's no need to apologise. Right, well, I, I, I must take off my clothes. I mean, I, I mean, I must go and put on dry clothes. James, where are you off to? Sorry, I, I, I do need a change of outfit, and I, I don't think any of yours will suit me. Sorry, Chivers! Did you see that, Chivers? Well, quite a busy month it's becoming. Two murders and a drunken kiss. In Agatha Raisin, Penelope Keith starred as Agatha and Malcolm Sinclair was James. Richard Binzer was played by Nicky Henson, Mrs. Bloxby by Liza Sadovy and DC Wong by Stephen Hogan, with Tina Gray as Mrs. Wendell and Ella Smith as Miss Partle. Agatha Raisin was dramatised by David Semple from the novel by M.C. Beaton and the producer was Carol Smith. Agatha Raisin by M.C. Beaton, dramatised for radio by David Semple, starring Penelope Keith as Agatha. Duck and Cover. Out of the way, Chivers. I enjoy a fry up, but I draw the line at crispy fried cat. Hello? Aggie, it's me, surprise, surprise. Roy! What are you doing up so early? It's not even ten o'clock yet. Well, I've had sleepless nights worrying about you. It was on TV last night, another murder in your village. I know. First the local curate, then his landlady. It won't do much for property prices. So, Miss Marple, who do you think did it? I really don't know. Tristan, uh, that's the curate who was killed, was very good at getting money out of people. So that's a possible motive. Well, they do say it's the root of all evil. Anyway, you haven't asked me what I'm up to at the moment. You don't need to ask Mount Vesuvius for an eruption. I'm a television producer. Oh, yes. Who are you working for? I'm a freelancer. Oh, I see. No one will have you. Actually, I have several BAFTA-winning programmes in the pipeline. Oh, now, here's a thought. Why don't I make a drama documentary about Carlsley? And we can call it, um, oh, The Village of Death. Oh, Roy, please. No. No, it'll be tasteful. There'll be very little nudity. Now, who can we get to play you? Oh, I know. Judy Dench. Why can't I play myself? Don't be silly. It'd be far too wooden. Besides, if we can get Dame Judy, it has the touch of class. Roy, it isn't funny. I actually saw the dead woman's legs sticking out of a shallow grave. Were they good legs? I don't know. Why? Joanna Lumley. Not much of a part, but she can't be choosy at her age. Roy! How can you be so insensitive? I had the best teacher in the world. Oh, I do have one other bit of news. Oh, yes. You remember James Lacey, who lives next door? Oh, yes. Six foot two with eyes of blue and a dimple on his chin. He kissed me. Ah, <gasps> you lucky devil. We were discussing the case and he just sort of puckered up. Mind you, he had had half a bottle of homemade wine. Well, that explains it. You have enough to drink and anybody becomes attractive. <laughs> Thank you, Roy. Oh, I've got to go. The doorbell's ringing and my breakfast's on fire. Serves you right. I... Hang on a minute! James! Hello, Aggie. Uh, hang on a sec. My sausages are smoking. Well, tell them to stop. It's a terrible habit. Oh, dear. Well, I won't get any Michelin stars this morning. No, but you can always find work at a crematorium. <laughs> Are you here for a reason or just to lower my self-esteem? Uh, uh, Mrs. Boxby was on the phone, looking for volunteers to clean up the village. The tabloid press have left it in a bit of a mess. I'll be around when I buried my breakfast. Anything else? And I've been taking a closer look at our number one suspect, Richard Bincer. Yes. And I no longer suspect him. Because? Well, last year he donated a quarter of a million to charity. So if Tristan did cut him out of a few thousands, it, it couldn't have hurt that much. Never underestimate the sheer vindictiveness of the super-rich. I was beginning you with the Karl Marx of the Cotswolds. Was there anything else, James? Uh, no. You don't remember anything about last night? Oh, not a lot. Mrs. Beccarelli's wine was rather strong stuff. I, I do hope I... 
didn't make a fool of myself. Not exactly. Oh, good. I, I seem to remember singing. I, I do hope I didn't frighten Trivers. You did a bit more than singing. In fact, at one point, you actually... I'll get that! Bill Wong! Well, 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 my two favourite detectives, Cagney and James Lacey. Bill, why are you giving me that suspicious look? I've not done anything wrong. Innocent as a lamb in springtime, are we? Well, I have in my hand a piece of paper. No, where have I had that before? <laughs> it's a fax we received from a Mr. Richard Binzer. Ever heard of him? The name rings a vague bell. Have you, James? Possibly. Not quite sure if I can place him. Well, that's funny. <laughs> Because two people met him in his office yesterday and he encloses a picture taken from a CCTV. Oh, it's us. Yes, I think I can't place him now. Mr. Binzer says he's happy to cooperate with the police, but he doesn't appreciate busybodies and his legal team are prepared to take action. Bill, did you know he gave £5,000 to Tristan to set up a youth club? Yes, I knew that. And Tristan pocketed the cash? I'm well aware of that too. But I also know he then returned it. We've only got Binzer's word for that. Yes. And Binzer is an extremely powerful man. You're not seriously saying you're scared of him. I'm saying that as well as solving this murder, I have to make sure no one else gets killed or harassed. And if you two are quite so keen on helping out, why not go and join Mrs. Bloxby's litter patrol? Good idea. Let's gather some rubbish. I'll have that fact. Give me that. I've nothing else to say. Except that your house stinks, and it's time you got a smoke alarm. Well... That's us off his Christmas card list. We'll make up and be friends again. We always do. Do you want to cook yourself something decent? No, I'll have my usual breakfast. Fags and fingernails. Oh, my dear, dear Mrs. Rendell, thank you so much for coming to help. Always happy to oblige, Mrs. Bloxby. I'm not one of those villagers who waltzes in and expects everything done for them. And I'm not afraid of hard graft. Oh, it's a depressing sight. 18th century graves strewn with kebab wrappers. Yes, though I'm not sure I can pick them up. I do suffer from vertigo. Who would have thought a handful of journalists could make such a mess? Good morning. Oh, look, it's Colonel Lacey. Oh, yes, and he's brought his shadow. It must be a novelty for her, seeing manual labour. Oh, dear, I've broken my fingernail. Mrs. Bloxby, oh. two more volunteer bin men for you. Oh, you are kind, Mrs. Rayson. Here, have a bin liner. Actually, may I split you up? If you and I do the church job, Mrs. Wendell, could you and James do the village green? Oh. All the wreaths have been knocked off the war memorial. It looks awful. Oh, yes, we'll make a marvellous team. You see, I suffer terribly from vertigo. But if James does all the bending over, then I can point out where things go. Oh, um, right. <laughs> um, so I'll see you for lunch, Agatha. One o'clock sharp. And I'll make sure he works up quite an appetite. <laughs> Come along, James. <sighs> Oh, I can't bear to see the village like this. It's like an old friend covered in cuts and bruises. Yes. Is there anything you wanted to talk to me about? Ah, uh, no, dear. No. Should there be? I was just wondering why you sent those two away. Oh, that. <laughs> well, I just feel that if James spends some time with Mrs. Wendell, he'll appreciate you all the more. She was only with me a few minutes, and already I feel like breaking the Sixth Commandment. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Bloxby, it's not like you to speak ill of someone. And I never thought of you as a matchmaker. Well, there's quite a bit more to me than people think. I'm not just a mousy vicar's wife who bakes little cakes. Are things still difficult at home? Well, the police seem to be leaving my husband alone now. They seem to think that the killer was someone from Tristan's past. My thoughts exactly. If only we had a time machine. Well, we don't, dear, do we? Anyway, I feel what the whole village needs right now is a bit of light relief. So I'm going to organise a charity event. Uh, what did you have in mind? Well, it suddenly came to me uh, while I was lying in the bath last night that we could raise money with this. That's a rubber duck. Exactly. Now, um, supposing we uh, filled the village pond with these and, and each one had a lucky number, we, we could have a fishing game. With respect, that's never going to be the highlight of the sporting calendar, is it? Oh. Do, do, you, do you have a better idea? Well, if you really want to get people spending, you need something they can gamble on. Oh, a day at the races. Oh, duck races! <laughs> That's the most ridiculous. Actually, that might be possible. 
Farmer Ruskin has a mill stream on his land. You could float rubber ducks down it and have bets on the outcome. Oh, goodness, it sounds just like Las Vegas. <laughs> Only uh, in the countryside uh, rather than the desert. Yes, I'll go and have a word with Farmer Ruskin. Use my feminine wiles. Yes, and I'll have a think about refreshments. We do have several bottles of Mrs. Beccarelli's homemade wine. Well, if that's for sale, people will be very free and easy with their wallets. <laughs> Is that your phone, Mrs. Raisin? I think I left mine at home. So where on earth is it coming from? I think it's coming from this tomb. Oh. You don't think someone's been buried alive, do you? Well, the headstone says 1932, so I think the batteries would have run down by now. <laughs> I think I found it. Oh, yes? It's right here, at the bottom of this urn. Oh, Mrs. Raisin, don't touch it! It could be something to do with the murder. Did, uh... Tristan have a mobile phone? Uh, yes, yes, he, he did. He, well, m maybe he dropped it here on his way to the vicarage. Perhaps there was a struggle. Well, surely the police would have found it by now. Well, finders keepers. Let's see who's been calling Tristan. Mrs. Raisin, don't! Why not? Fingerprints! I I'll go and get Bill Wong. But I thought you wanted me to help with this. Well, I also want you to stay alive. Whoever killed Tristan is very dangerous. I think you should leave it to the police. Fine. Whatever you say, I'll get on with organising a day at the races. Here, boys. Come and get your dinner. Well, Mrs Raisin, it's a grand idea, but I don't reckon these ducks will go where you tell them to. No, no, it's not that sort of duck. Omen pigeons, yes. A rare breed of pig, if you ask it nicely, but... Ducks don't really have that team spirit. No, I mean rubber ducks. Plastic ones, the kind you float in the bath. Oh, oh, that makes sense now. And at least you won't have the RSPCA breathing down your neck. Right bunch of killjoys they are. So may we borrow your millstream? You surely may, my love, you surely may. I might even have a flutter myself. So, how are you going to get the crowds in? I'm stuck out here in the middle of nowhere. We're going to give out flyers or have someone with a sandwich board. Now, you need more than that. You need someone going round all the villages saying, Roll up, roll up, roll up. A flash character. A brash character. Someone who's not afraid to make a fool of himself. I can't believe you've dragged me away from home and hearth for one of your ridiculous charity charades. Oh, shut up and put the costume on, Roy. I was not put on this earth to waddle about the home counties dressed as Mother Goose. This is Carsley Amateur Player's finest costume. Mrs Bloxby sat into the small hours sewing on the feathers. Now, your left leg goes here <sighs> and your right leg here. <coughs> Right. Oh, it's the flea bag. Well, don't come any closer. I could crush you with my web feet. Don't worry, Chivers. The silly duck man doesn't mean it. Now, I've got you a poem to read. What? To add a bit of comedy. Oh, up to now, it was a Greek tragedy. Here you are. Now, remember, projection and diction. Oh, yes. Barnyard animals mustn't mumble. I'm a lucky ducky. Ah! ah. Though I've got little legs. I spend my day a scratching hay and sometimes laying eggs. But now I'm going racing. Ah, ah. Now there's a sight to see. So come along and place your bets. It's only 50p. Oh, this is awful. Who wrote this rubbish? You're just not selling it properly. I knew we should have got Judy Dench. <laughs> One, two, one, two. And you join us for the fourth race of the afternoon. The conditions are good, not too much duckweed, and the birds themselves are under starter's orders. Triple winner Jemima Puddleluck is the much-fancied favourite, but will Plucky Jim somehow manage to fix it? And they're off. And it's an early lead for Jemima Puddleduck and Plucky Jim, but coming up on the inside lane is the great Donald. Donaldo inches into the lead. But what's this? Then he's upside down with his head beneath the water. Zip. Lucky Jim is in the lead. But the statistics are stacked against him. It's a two-duck race, but do not rule out a late challenge by Dr. Doodle-Doo. And in a hot stop, Jemima and Lucky Jim are neck and neck. And yes, the winner is Lucky! Yes, a remarkable return to form for this very daring duck. There is Jemima, 
cock-a-doodle-doo and the ugly duckling. And as Plucky takes his place in the winner's enclosure, we adjourn for five minutes with the next race at three o'clock. <laughs> some Cotswold liqueur, a glass of Cotswold sunshine for only a pound. Will you have a glass, Mrs. Wendell? Not for me, Mrs. Raisin. I'm on the Carol Vorderman detox. I mean, not that I need to. I just thought I'd see what it was like. Well, it's a powerful brew. Even the battling boggles have decided to make love, not war. Mm, she was a real magician, Mrs. Beccarelli. What do you mean by that? Oh, I spent many long evenings with her, sampling various concoctions. Her wine always had the power to loosen tongues. Loosen tongues? Are you talking about Tristan? Possibly, yes. I think he may have told her more than he should have, and she was foolish enough to let on what she knew. But what did he know that was so... Oh, ladies, I can't thank you enough. You've raised a small fortune. Oh, don't thank me, Mrs. Bloxby. It's all down to Mrs. Raisin. Oh? Well, if anyone has the power to drive people to drink, it's oh, Mrs. Speaking of drink, I'm a little worried about the Morris dancers. Alf said they've been imbibing rather too freely, and he's, he's going to have to introduce them on stage. I do hope it doesn't turn into an, an embarrassing shambles. Morris dancing? An embarrassing shambles? Surely not. Ah. Oh, look, it's your little feathered friend. Oh, yes. Uh, hello, Ducky. Well, <laughs> Aggie, that's the last time I humiliate myself for the likes of you. Oh, dear, what happened? Well, I've been to the Red Lion. I managed to persuade people to put down their pints and come and see the races. Oh, well done, you. But on my way here, I passed the children's playground and the little darling suddenly decided that swings and slides were passé and that they'd much rather follow the funny duck man and pull out some of his tail feathers. Oh, my word! Whatever did you do? I told them to pluck off. Oh, dear. Well, come on, let's get you out of the costume. Come on. Well, we may as well count the money, Mrs. Raisin. Ten, what ten... did you mean about loosening tongues? What do you think Tristan knew? Well, he'd met some very powerful people in the course of his fundraising, including a couple of millionaires, such as Richard Binzer. I know that, but he gave Binzer his money back. Oh, no, he didn't. Tristan refused. Two pounds fifty, two pounds seventy. But Tristan had the other hand, because he knew that Binzer was having an affair with someone. I don't know who, though. Two pounds ninety. Mrs. Two Wendell, pounds. if you knew all this, why haven't you told the police? I didn't think it wise. Mrs. Beccarelli told the world she knew something, and look what happened to her. So why are you in such a hurry to get back? Well, do you remember your old secretary, Lucy? Oh, yes. Shorthand speed of one word a minute and she couldn't use a fax machine. We had to use a carrier pigeon. Well, she's getting married in the morning. Is she? I hope she didn't send out the invites or you'll be standing in an empty marquee. You'll never guess who she's marrying. No, but I'm thinking three times her age with a large bank balance and a heart complaint. Your old friend, Mr. Pittman. Oh, that waste of space. I wish I'd never sold him the business. Mm. And he'd only been running it five minutes when he sat me. So I hope he does have a heart condition. That way we can have a combined wedding and funeral and I can dance on his grave. Oh, girl, marrying him. Her eyesight must be worse than I thought. Well, personally, I think it's Stockholm Syndrome. You know, when a hostage falls in love with their captor. It's often like that with bosses and secretaries. Secretaries? Roy, I've got to go. What? My train doesn't get here for 20 minutes. Uh, thank you very much for all your help, and I'll be in touch next time I need something. What? Is that all I am to you? The inside of a duck? Oh, hello, Aggie. The secretary did it. Oh, Lord, she's off again. Which secretary did what? Richard Bince's secretary killed Tristan LaBelle. <laughs> and how did you work that one out? Was it written in the tail feathers of the winning duck? Bincer is convinced he got his money back. It arrived on his desk in a plain brown envelope. But what if his secretary put it there? 
She paid the money, and then she came to Carsley to get it back from Tristan. Now, talk about acting beyond the call of duty. I'm glad I'm not your secretary. So am I. The thing is, she felt guilty because she was the one who introduced Tristan to him, which was like letting a viper into the nest. Agatha, why would a secretary commit double murder? I mean, I know you can't get the staff these days. She was having an affair with Richard Binson, <sighs> and Tristan found out, and I rather think he was threatening to tell Mrs. Binson. Now, hold your horses. The secretary couldn't have killed Mrs. Beccarelli, could she? Because we saw her in London the day Mrs. Beccarelli died. Mrs. Beccarelli had been dead 24 hours when we found her. She died the day we made the appointment. And we made that with a temporary secretary. The real one wouldn't have let me within a mile of her beloved boss. Well, all this is terribly interesting. And you're certainly giving Agatha Christie a run for her money. But do you actually have any evidence? No, of course not. But nothing else fits. <sighs> oh, I see. So you've ruled out alien abduction, international terrorism and evil twins, have you? Look, why don't you go home, take your shoes and socks off and have a nice cup of chamomile tea? Because it tastes like pond water. Now, are you going to help me or not? I think I shall opt for the latter. But if you really feel strongly, you can always go and talk to Bill Wong. Oh, don't be silly. He's far too busy restraining Morris dancers. Look, why don't we pop down to London tomorrow and follow the secretary home from work? I say what exactly? You are a multiple murderer and I claim my five-pound prize. No, of course not. We'll have to be devious. Oh, really? Do you think you can manage that? Are you coming or not? As it happens, it's out of the question. I'm having dinner with my editor. James, this is a matter of life and death. And you're going to chew the fat with some tweedy academic with elbow patches? Actually, we'll be chewing some rather fine moule marinier. And I don't think Olga wears elbow patches. Olga? Olga Bzinski, my editor. Sounds like a Russian shot putter. Well, I hope it all goes well. You and Olga can have a nice dish of borscht, and Cagney can solve this without James Lacey. Well, I've typed up the minutes of the Mandelson meeting. I've got some trunks for your trip to the Maldives, and a silver rattle for your nephew's christening. Oh, Melody. Where would I be without you? Selling the big issue at Liverpool Street Station. You sure you won't join me for dinner? Mm, not tonight. Anyway, what would your wife say? Well, I could always say the train was late. Now that I'm running them, they usually are. <laughs> How much longer do we have to keep on hiding? Not much longer. Soon. I'll get it all sorted soon, I promise. So, where are you going this evening? Dinner with my ex-boss. Oh. So there was someone else before me? Well, you've had other secretaries. I won't be making that mistake again. <laughs> so... What's your old boss up to now? Then? Well, he fared rather badly in the last recession. He now runs a bed and breakfast in the Cotswolds. Really? Just think, if you'd stuck with him, now you'd be changing sheets in some B&B. &B. Oh, no. If I'd stuck with him, he'd be a millionaire businessman. Hello, I'm sorry I'm not available. But please, do leave a message. James, where are you? Oh, of course, you're out with a shop putter. Well, I followed our suspect home from work. She went for a meal with a rather seedy middle-aged man, and he's just said goodnight on her doorstep. The address is 37 Chepstow Villas, Ladbrook Grove. He's now driving away in a battered Fiat Panda. Registration number... F oh, dear... Is there a reason you've been following me all evening? Oh, um, hello. Uh, do I know you? Sorry. I, I was thinking of buying a house in the area, and you know what they say about visiting a place at 11 o'clock when the pubs have shut. Mrs. Raisin, please stop digging. OK, I'll put down the shovel. So, do you have an explanation? I'm sorry for following you. But I had to get you on your own. Now, you may not want to hear this, but I have conclusive proof that your boss murdered Tristan LaBelle. My boss? I think so, but I may need your help. Can we talk? Well, perhaps we should go inside. It's not safe on the streets these days. I'm terribly sorry. I know this must seem very cloak and dagger. No, not at all. So how do you like your coffee? Black, no sugar. You see, I wasn't sure if that man you were with was something to do with Richard Binser. Oh, no, that was a friend. He runs a small hotel in the Lake District. Now, can I get you something to eat as you spent all evening with your nose pressed to the restaurant window? Was I that obvious? Not at all, but it pays to be perceptive in my job. 
I'm fine, thanks. Uh, which one of these is mine? Either. We both take it the same way. So, you have proof that my boss is a murderer? I think so. But I need your help to confirm it. What are you talking about? I found Tristan's mobile. It was in the graveyard where he had a struggle with his killer. How do you know it was his? I recognise the ringtone. It was Ride of the Valkyrie. Now, if we could just look at the numbers in the call log... Have you, might... you told the police? I don't trust them. They're always happy to chase the little man, but if you're a multimillionaire, they protect you. Who were you talking to earlier? Oh, just my cleaning lady, telling her I'd be staying in London tonight. So, let's have a look at this phone. I haven't got it with me. I thought I might get mugged. Where is it? In a locker at Paddington Station. Fine. I'll get a taxi and go and have a look. Right. I'd best give you the ticket. Uh, no, maybe this is a mistake. We should go to the police. We'll go to the police afterwards. Just give me the ticket. You're starting to scare me. I only want to do the right thing. And as you say, the police can't always be trusted. No, you can't trust anybody. Which is why sometimes you just have to take desperate measures. So there isn't a locker at Paddington Station. No, that's my lottery ticket. Hope you feel lucky. Oh, Mrs. Raisin. I didn't mean to kill anyone. I just wanted my money back. Only Tristan decided he was going to tell the whole world about me and Richard. I had no choice. And Mrs. Beccarelli? Oh, she knew too much. I'm not proud of what I did, but if you'd ever loved anyone like I love Richard... Look, what's done is done, but this isn't going to end with the two of you walking into the sunset. Oh, it might, Mrs. Raisin. The night is young. Just put that knife down. Oh, shut up, you stupid bitch. Help! Help! Somebody one help me! One more noise and you'll be joining Tristan. Oh, for pity's sake, the police are at the door. There's no one at the door. You're hearing things. You must be mad. Agatha! Up here! James! Agatha! Melody Paul! Oh! I'm arresting you on two charges no, of murder. No, One of no, perverting no, the constable. No! One of oh, perverting the constable. Are you all right? As well as you can be when you've had a knife pressed to your jugular. Why didn't you leave it to the police? They were on to her. If the police had called, she would have clammed up. It took another ruthless woman to get under her wire. Oh, one of these days, Agatha. One of these days, you'll learn to listen to me. Anyway, I thought you were meeting your editor. That's right, in, in Notting Hill. I picked up your message while Olga was powdering her nose. And you condescended to come and rescue me. Of course I did. I'd walk a million miles for one of your smiles. And then what happened? Did he take you in his arms and promise to love you forevermore? No, Roy. He had to get back to his editor. So he shoved me in a taxi and sent me off to Paddington Station. With a little label attached. Please look after this Aggie. So I thought I'd crash with you for a few days. That's fine. Um, I do have a rather knackered old sofa bed. Well, I hope you'll be comfortable on it. I'm having your room. I need to stretch out. Roy. Aggie. Am I wasting my time with James? Hard to say. He seems like a nice chap, but he might be a bit out of your league. You cheeky sod. Perhaps if we got you spruced up a little. Tell you what, tomorrow morning we'll go to Camden Market, get some silk stockings, a nice sexy negligee. Can we get something for me as well? Honestly, men, who needs them? We do, Roy, we do. <laughs> <laughs> In Agatha Raisin, Penelope Keith starred as Agatha and Malcolm Sinclair was James. Richard Binser was played by Nicky Henson, Mrs Bloxby by Liza Sadovy and DC Wong by Stephen Hogan. With James Holmes as Roy, Tina Gray as Mrs Wendell, Ella Smith as Miss Partle and Gerard McDermott as Farmer Ruskin. Agatha Raisin was dramatised by David Semple from the novel by M.C. Beaton and the producer was Carol Smith. Agatha Raisin by M.C. Beaton, dramatised for radio by David Semple. Starring Penelope Keith as Agatha. Buried Treasure. So, Mrs. Raisin, 
How long have you been smoking? Is this relevant? I thought you were going to hypnotise me, not write my biography. It just helps me build up a picture. It's so hard to date smokers. It has such an ageing effect on the skin. Well, you could always cut me open and count the rings. Sorry, I wasn't trying to be offensive. No, I'm sure it comes naturally. Mrs. Raisin, are you sure you want to give up? Yes, of course. Now, can we get this over with? Right. Now, breathe in. Mrs. Raisin? Oh. oh, sorry, Mrs. Boxby. I was miles away. I could tell. When James Lacey was giving us his book reading, someone was in the arms of Morpheus. Oh, dear. Was I that obvious? At first, we thought the noise was a storm brewing. But then we saw you flat on your back on the ping pong table. It's this wretched hypnotherapy. I keep falling asleep. Oh, yes. How is that going? Oh, absolute disaster, I'm afraid. Oh, why's that? Well, it actually works. I haven't had a you-know-what for over a week. Well, I thought the whole idea of the hypno-what's-it was to give up the you-know-what. Oh, no. I went to hypnotherapy so that I could tell people I'd tried and then they'd stop nagging me. Well, well perhaps you could be hypnotised to make you start again. I hope so. I need some pleasure in life. At the moment, every time I put a you-know-what in my mouth, it tastes of burning rubber. Oh, goodness. I hope my cheese straws don't have that effect on you. you. You couldn't pass them round, could you? Are there many people left? Oh, yes, they're still queuing up to get their book signed. Ah, oh, Mr Lacey is quite the local celebrity. Yes, who would have thought the Carsley ladies would be quite so interested in the Peninsula War? Just one more, Mr Lacey. It's for my son, Jeremy. I didn't know you had children, Mrs Hicks. Oh, yes. My son's at Oxford University, you know. Is he really? Which college? I just told you. Oxford University. <laughs> right. Uh, to Jeremy, best of luck with your education. Oh, he will appreciate this. He's such a gifted boy. Yes, I, I'm sure he is. <laughs> James, I... I couldn't trouble you for just one more, could I? Certainly, Mrs. Friendly. Is it for you? Oh, yes. A little something to curl up with under the duvet on these long winter nights. Oh, right. Um, uh, to Mrs. Friendly, best wishes, James Lacey. Oh, you must have signed a hundred this evening. I'm amazed your wrist can stand up to it. Yes, well, that's the army training, you know. You spent several months arm wrestling at Santa, so your wrist is ready for years and years of paperwork. Really? Uh, no, that was a joke. Uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you and your jokes, James. You are a one. Please draw anybody. Not while I'm talking to Mr. Lacey. Oh, you're awake now, are you? I was not asleep. I was listening with my eyes closed. Well, if no one else is having one. Have you thought of a sequel? I mean, there are so many other wars to write about. I'm a huge fan of the Hundred <laughs> Years War. Oh. <laughs> Good Lord, are you all right? <laughs> sorry. It's the uh, hypnotherapy. Sometimes when I put something in my mouth, it tastes of burning rubber. So, not content with drowning out the reading with your snoring, you now decide to liberally coat my copy with cheese straws. It was an accident. Funny how I'm always on the receiving end of your accidents. Oh, look, it's all over my old Anil Pashmina. Goodness, and just when they were about to come back into fashion. Right, well, uh, if we could all just give a, a big round of applause for James Lacey. <laughs> Thank you. And... I'll just get a dustpan and brush. Well, Agatha, I'm proud of you. Why is that? Because I spat out food at your book signing? <laughs> because you've given up the evil weed. If you now project pastry crumbs over people, that's a small price to pay. Hmm. Makes me even more tetchy than usual. I mean, when Mrs. Friendly started going on about her pashmina, <laughs> I just wanted to throttle her with it. I mean, the woman is a complete... Uh, would you like a lift? Mrs. Friendly, we, we were just talking about you. James, do hop in. You are only two doors down from me. Yes, and I actually live next door to you. Oh, so you do. Well, you can go in the back, but try not to spit on the upholstery. You'd best go in the front, James. You've got such long legs. Um, right. Yes. Well, James, I must say, your talk certainly spiced up the ladies' society. <laughs> I mean, it can be so dreary. But it's quite a nice way to meet the village. I mean, I never knew that Mrs. Hicks had a son at Oxford. Yes, they really have lowered their entry requirements. 
Jeremy always struck me as a bit of a yob, bright blue hair and a permanent scowl. He looked like a satanic budgie. Well, aren't we being just a teensy bit censorious? I mean, during the Regency period, a powdered blue wig was the height of fashion. I think he's a very nice young man. I hope he comes to visit soon. Actually, James, you must have met him. He came home last summer, remember? About the time we had all the burglaries and your computer was stolen. Are you implying that two things were connected? Now, there's a thought. I must tell Bill Wong. It never occurred to me that it could Can we some... leave the poor boy alone, please? As he isn't here to defend himself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, don't want to see budgies put behind bars. <laughs> James. <laughs> How are things going with your battle reenactments? Oh, it's all systems go. I just need one or two more cavalier costumes. Well, if my sewing circle can do anything to assist. What battle reenactment? Oh, you must have heard, surely. We've been discussing it at the Ladies' Society for months. I didn't hear anything. Perhaps you were asleep. Yeah, March the 31st, we're restaging the Civil War on the Village Green. Well, I wish you'd told me. I can turn my hand to a bit of sewing. I suppose now you don't have a cigarette in it. No, so, have you noticed the way her hand shakes? Oh, I don't think that'll be threading many needles. <laughs> well, thank you very much for the lift. Oh, you're welcome. Yes, um, likewise. Uh, no, Mrs. Raisin, I'll drop you off at your door. It's only 12 yards I'll away. I'll drop you off at your door. Right. Mm. Mrs. Raisin. Uh, a friendly word. Fire away, Mrs. Friendly. A number of people at the Carsley Ladies' Society have been discussing how embarrassing it is the way you fling yourself at James Lacey. The way I offer him lifts and buy six copies of his book to sign? Well, that's different. He can get on with someone like me. What's that supposed to mean? Someone with a sense of history. I mean, what do you know about the Civil War? You probably don't even know when it ended. Indeed, Mrs. Friendly, because it's only just begun. <coughs> Chivers, please put down the daddy long legs. It's all right for you. Your little pleasures don't make you fat or spotty or wrinkly. Right, I'll have one more go at lighting a cigarette. I do like cigarettes, they are delicious. I do like cigarettes, they are delicious. <laughs> oh, for heaven's sake! Hello. Yes, who is it? That's a nice way to talk to your oldest and dearest friend. Oh, Roy, it's not fair. I've lost the ability to smoke. Well, so long as you can chew your food and dress yourself. No, I've been to a hypnotherapist and he's made them taste disgusting. I've just thrown the last packet into the garden. Oh, well, his curse will wear off eventually and by then they'll have grown into a tobacco plantation. Are you calling for anything in particular or just to mock? Well, partly to mock and partly to gloat. You know you said I could never get a job in television. Oh, yes. I've just got a job in television. Doing what? Muffin the Mule stunt double? Actually, I'm a senior programme consultant. Oh, I see. You're a researcher, but they've given you a fancy job title. I'll have you know our company has made some extremely prestigious documentaries for the History Channel. Which company? Well, it's me, my friend Gary, and the bloke with a fairy microphone. How prestigious can one get? What are you working on at the moment? Oh, it's called um, Treasure Island. We go all around the country digging up the legendary lost treasures of history. And I suppose you've buried them the night before. How dare you insult our integrity? Only if we're desperate. I thought so. Roy, you wouldn't know anything about the Civil War, would you? I think Gary did something on that last year. It's always popular with the overseas market. Really? That might just come in useful. Oh, my word, Mrs. Friendly. It's all going great guns in here. We're pulling out all the stops, James. If our famous author wants 50 Dragoons uniforms, then he shall surely have them. <laughs> How am I doing, Mr. Lacey? Oh, sterling effort, Mrs. Higgs. Uh, um, the Cavaliers did have brass buttons. Oh, are you sure? Oh, definitely. I, I don't think we can go with toggles. Uh, oh. I'll get that. Don't want anyone to drop their stitches. Mrs. Hicks. Do remind me to get James's inside leg measurement. 
Didn't you take that yesterday, Mrs. Friendly? I did, but I must have mislaid it. Ladies, I oh. think you can put down your needles and threads. I have something that might make your lives a little easier. Oh, Mrs. Raisin, the suspense is killing me. Costumes from a recent film about the Civil War. Good Lord, that could be useful. Oh, I uh, or, or possibly not. What's the matter? Well, um... I was hoping for regimental coats, knee breeches, feathered hats, and um, these are all frock coats and cravats. They've all been authenticated. They're from a documentary about the Civil War. Yes, it's the American Civil War. <laughs> Still, they'll, they'll come in useful if Carsley Amateur Dramatics ever put on God with the Wind. <laughs> <laughs> well, how was I supposed to know which Civil War? You never said. Well, thank heavens you didn't go for the Spanish Civil War, or we'd all be in sombreros. <laughs> Hasta la vista, Mrs. Raisin! <laughs> Mrs. Raisin, it is nice to see you. I'm glad someone thinks so. Oh, uh, could you close the door, please? I've got flour on my fingers. Baking again, Mrs. Bloxby. Oh, I'm making a batch of scones for the Civil War reenactment. I thought that between battles we could all make peace and have a green tea. <laughs> <laughs> if only you'd been around, the real Civil War would have been so much more civil. So, uh, what can I do for you? Do have a seat. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask you a question about history. History, Mrs. Raisin? Yes. Do you know any stories about treasure being buried round here? Buried treasure? Well, there is one local legend. Oh, yes. Well, as you know, there were a lot of battles around here between Roundheads and Cavaliers, and there was one story about a, a royalist soldier, Sir Geoffrey Lamont, I think his name was, who was on the run from Cromwell. And they think that he hid out in this village. He was supposed to have had a fortune in gold and jewels, all his worldly goods, but when they found him, he did not have a penny. I see. So, either he buried his fortune somewhere in the village... Or he bought a sandwich at Mrs. Harvey's shop. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's something like that. Why, why are you so interested? Just thought I'd take up a new hobby, that's all. Has anyone ever looked for it? Well, the Historical Society did go looking a few years ago, but all they found was a supermarket trolley. Mind you, they did get a pound for it. <laughs> oh, oh, always the way. Well, it's a good story. Though I suspect it was invented by the Cotswold Tourist Board. Actually, Mrs. Raisin, I'm... Very glad you're here because there was something I wanted to ask you. Oh yes. Do you know anything at all about um gay people? Mrs. Bloxby. What do you want to know? Well, I I've got a friend, and for a long time I've been wondering if her son might be gay. It's just a suspicion. But there's been a strange kind of rift between mother and son, a tension of a friction, something in the air. Are you talking about Mrs Hicks? Oh, goodness gracious, how did you know? Well, there must be a rift between those two the size of the Cheddar Gorge. She's always talking about how clever Jeremy is, how gifted. But have you noticed? He never comes home to visit. Yes, yes, well, they, they used to be extremely close before uh, Mr Hicks died and Jeremy dyed his hair, but um, I think she may have driven him away. She, she can be very small-minded at times. Mm. Her brain is in sharp contrast to the size of her mouth. <laughs> but what do you want to ask me? Well, um, I thought that you might know some gay people, uh, you know, working in the media, and I wondered if perhaps there was a, a book or, or a leaflet that we could give Mrs Hicks that would make her realise that her son is just the same wonderful person that he was before he... Uh, yes, yes. yes. You know my friend Roy, who used to work in PR with me? Oh, yes, yes, such a nice young man. It has been rumoured that he's gay. Really? Well, it just goes to show you can't tell by looking. Yes. Perhaps I could have a word with him. Hello? Roy, it's me. I wanted to talk to you about homosexuality. Oh, 
so living in the country has had its effect on you. I suppose it's all those long walks in sensible shoes. No, it's just I've got this friend in the village. Oh, yes, a friend. Uh, yes, and we think her son might be, well, licking the other side of the stamp. And I just wondered, do you have any books or leaflets, you know, to say that gay people don't always eat babies? Well, as long as you pay the postage. Oh, you don't need to send them. You're coming up to Carsley at the weekend with your film crew. I'm not dragging myself up the M40 again. Why should I? To look for buried treasure. Britain. Land of heritage and history. But what mysterious secrets lay buried in its nooks and crannies? Over the next 26 weeks, we intend to dig and delve until this green and pleasant land looks like the surface of the moon. And so we come to the picturesque village of... Um, what's it called again? Honestly, Roy, you're hopeless. And I don't know why you're playing to the camera. They haven't even turned it on yet. I am just trying to establish the certain je ne sais quoi of this particular mise-en-scene. Do they actually use your voiceover on the finished programme? No, they don't, actually. Apparently, I do not have enough gravitas. So they take it down to Soho and Jonathan Ross does it. Tell you what, I'll have a go. No, no, you won't. You're not stealing my TV career before it's even begun. Oh, belt up. I'm doing you a favour. This is how it's done. Carsley, in the rolling green hills of the Cotswolds. A peaceful place. But put your ear to the ground and you can hear the echo of former wars being fought. For it was here in 1642 Mrs. that Raisin. Oliver Cromwell led his soldiers... Mrs. Raisin! To... Oh, Mrs. Hicks. Oh, have you met my friend, Roy? Is he the one who sent me that disgusting book? Not me, no, never. Well, someone did. And I assume it's to do with those rumours that have been spreading about my son. Oh, Jeremy, how is he these days? Oh, Jeremy's as right as rain. Though he's extremely busy with the rugby team. I mean, playing rugby. Well, that's marvellous. He certainly has no interest in the kind of smut that you see fit to peddle. I can assure you my friend would never handle anything that could remotely be described as smutty. Roy, what did you put through her letterbox? Nothing. I'll tell you what he put. It was a 200-page hardback, lavishly illustrated throughout, entitled The joy of gay sex. Oh, Roy. I was only trying to help. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. It's a very distinguished book. Really? I'm amazed they haven't serialised it on Woman's Hour. Give them time. I phoned Jeremy to tell him, and he was extremely upset. Well, I'm sorry, but no offence was intended. No, not about the book, but because I phoned him when he was in the middle of entertaining a charming young French girl called Fifi. Well, we just want to say that absolutely nothing was meant by the book. And can we have it back if you're finished with it? No. Chivers, even woodlice deserve some sort of existence. Right, well, I shall be off then. Oh, Roy, please give it another go. I'm sure there's treasure somewhere in this village. Aggie, I've been all around the week in dangling my metal detector, but it wouldn't even go pink. But it's a famous legend, the treasure of Geoffrey Lamont. Thousands of historians have written about it. Mm, well, some stories do get told time and time again. The check is in the post. Of course, you don't look fat. I'll promise I'll phone you. What wise words come from the mouths of fools. So, I shall get back to my glamorous London life and leave you to your sad provincial existence. And now I haven't even got nicotine to help me get through it. Well, you've still got the handsome historian next door. Had any more snogs? I am through with James Lacey. He doesn't want someone like me. He wants some timid little country mouse. Oh, I've just got to try and have a cigarette. Fine by me. They're out in the garden somewhere. I threw them out along with the lighter. Well, perhaps my metal detector will come in useful then. Oh, I've forgotten how you make it work. Possibly the button marked on. <gasps> what it is to be technically minded. I wonder where Chivers went. Hopefully she's fallen down a mine shaft. Oh, don't be so horrible. She always seems to get lost in my jungle. Certainly is a jungle. What happened to that fabulous designer garden I did for you? Like so much else in my life, it's gone to seed. Honestly, Aggie, you should just count your blessings. What are they, then? Well, 
Um, there's... No, sorry, I can't think of any at the moment. Hang on a minute, this is weird. What have you got? Is it my lighthouse? Oh, no, it's much bigger than that. It stretches halfway across your garden. Now, don't get your hopes up, but it could be a supermarket trolley. Do you really think this is the right? Are you sure? Agatha, don't you think it's a little premature calling in a film crew? We don't even know what it is down there. Charles, there's no point waiting till we've dug it up. Television needs drama, discovery, and adventure. Yes, the drama of finding an abandoned wheelbarrow. It's well worth a license fee. Do I detect a note of jealousy? What on earth do you mean by that? Well, you're the distinguished historian, but it won't be you getting your picture in the papers. Agatha, when your newspapers are wrapped around a battered haddock, my book will still be in the shops. Oh, so you don't think anyone's going to buy it? Look, I, I just don't see why you have to turn everything into a media circus. It trivialises it. Typical Tweedy intellectual. Just because you use mass media doesn't mean you have to be trivial. Uh, right. Now, all the blokes who are digging, um, could you take your tops off, please? We need to sex this up a little. I rest my case. Oh, Roy. Now, just get a few Vox Pops. Gary, follow me and keep your cameras on the local yokels. <clears throat> okay, ready to take this one in. Three, two... I'm standing with the famous author, James Lacey, who wrote, um, some book or other. James, how long have you been living in the Cotswolds? Getting on for two years now. And where did you live before that? Uh, is this relevant? <laughs> I'm just making conversation. And do you think we're likely to find the legendary lost treasure of Norman Lamont? Uh, Geoffrey Lamont. Whatever. Well, I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. That's the uh, reason we're standing here. Now, I've just heard in my earpiece we have now reached the actual lid of the actual treasure chest. Um, it appears to be made of iron or possibly silver or gold or um, even aluminium. It, it, it's very hard to tell. Thank heavens for Jonathan Ross. Now with me are the distinguished PR consultant, Agatha Raisin, and the distinguished... Greengrocer, Mrs. Friend. Hello. So, how did you feel about the treasure hunt? Well, of course, I pulled out all the stops to make sure it happened. I got in touch with the Historical Society to see if they'd looked here before. I phoned the press and the council. Oh, friendly by name, friendly by nature. <laughs> it's amazing how friendly you can be when there's a TV camera pointing at you. Well, I've just heard they have now unearthed the actual chest. And this is an historic moment because it's a moment when we actually look at something from history and you can't get much more historical than that. No, it, it isn't. What? That trunk is definitely not 17th century. How can you tell? Well, there are a number of factors, one of which is the luggage label on it saying, Welcome to Ibiza. Bury an old trunk in my garden. Well, this is the moment of truth. Could it be Geoffrey Lamont's treasure? Or somebody's pawn collection? They're about to open the box. Well, this is looking a little disappointing. Uh, the box uh, is filled with 21st century technology. A, a video, a mobile phone, a DVD player. That's my laptop. What? My computer that was stolen. Well, there seems to be something underneath this treasure trove, and we're, we're moving closer to see what it is. Oh! Oh! What is it, Mrs. Hicks? It's Jeremy! <laughs> Would you like a glass of water, Mrs. Raisin? No, thank you. Not on top of the six cups of coffee I've just had. Right then. Interview commenced on the 18th of February at 4pm. Are you Mrs. Agatha Raisin of 18 Lilac Lane? You should know by now, Bill. For the tape, Mrs. Raisin, for the tape. Ah, uh, yes. That's right, I am. And this afternoon, I believe, you witnessed the discovery of a body in your back garden. Well, it wasn't just me. It was half the village, a film crew and six half-naked archaeologists. And you were able to identify this body? Mm -hmm. Mrs. Raisin is nodding her head. I know that. For the tape. So who was it? It was Jeremy Hicks, who used to live across the road from me. And do you have any idea how he came to be buried in your garden? I've no idea how anything gets in my garden. Dead birds, crisp packets, vodka bottles. 
I'm surprised there was just the one dead body. Was this body in a container of any kind? Well, yes, you've got all this on film. It was a sort of enormous metal trunk. Had you ever seen this container before? Mm -hmm. Mrs. Raisin is shaking her head. Do you have to describe every little thing I do? For the tape, Mrs. Raisin. Do you have any idea how this container came to be in your garden? No, and instead of asking me fatuous questions, you should talk to Mrs. Hicks and ask why she claims she spoke to her son yesterday when he's clearly been dead for several months. D.C. Wong is raising his eyes to the heavens. What? For the tape, D.C. Wong. For the tape. Agatha. Well, you've succeeded in getting your picture in the papers. Yes, James, and that battered haddock can't come soon enough. Do they have any idea how the body got into your garden? No, but as I've had six holidays in the past two years, there's been ample opportunity. Oh, come to think of it, it's a perfect place to hide a body. I mean, the chances of you doing any gardening and finding it were fairly remote. <laughs> Do you have to turn everything into an insult? I'm sorry. Force of habit. Oh, let's go outside. I've, um, I've been talking to your friend Roy. Apparently he wanted to make a fly-on-the-wall documentary following the police around as they solved the murder. He's in him away with a flea in his ear. Typical Roy. Anyway, it won't be the police who will solve this murder. It'll be us. Oh, no. Please, no. Please, 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 no. At least I'm no longer a suspect. I mean, why would I bury a body, then invite a film crew to watch me dig it up? I don't know. Sounds like ideal viewing for Channel 4. Anyway, this would never have happened if I hadn't given up smoking. I knew no good would come of it. I've never known anyone with such a talent for justifying their appalling vices. Thank you very much. Well, let's see if the shock of seeing a corpse in my chrysanthemums has lifted the curse. <sighs> You're not starting again, are you? I certainly am. Seeing that body made me realise you never know when death's coming. So why deprive yourself? Embrace life. Yes, the NHS should really adopt that as a slogan. Embrace life. Smoke a cigarette. And the verdict? Heavenly. Well, that's got me cured. And now there's just that small matter of a murder. In Agatha Raisin, Penelope Keith starred as Agatha, and Malcolm Sinclair was James. Linda Barron played Mrs Hicks, and Joanna Brooks, Mrs Friendly. Liza Sadovy was Mrs Bloxby, and Stephen Hogan, DC Wong, with James Holmes as Roy. Agatha Raisin was dramatised by David Semple from the novel by M.C. Beaton, and the producer was Carol Smith. Agatha Raisin by M.C. Beaton, dramatised for radio by David Semple, starring Penelope Keith as Agatha. The Civil War. This is the Channel 7 train calling at Kingham, Chalbury, Hamborough and Oxford. We apologise for the late departure of this service. This was due to the late arrival of the preceding one. Is it me, or is British Rail losing the will to live? Even the excuses are disappointing. Perhaps that's why they got rid of it 20 years ago and replaced it with individual operating companies. Thank you, James. Why do I always have to sit next to the anorak? <laughs> right, let's go through the facts. One year ago, a crime wave came to Garsley and something like a dozen houses were burgled. Fast forward one year and we've now found the culprit. He's been buried in a box at the bottom of your car. At least we think he's the culprit and he's been buried with everything that was stolen in my garden. A very good place to hide a body. Under those undisturbed weeds, you could have all the war dead of the Crimea. Mm, and there's plenty of room for one more. <laughs> now, the body is Jeremy Hicks, 19-year-old son of Mrs Hicks, widow of this parish. And the police confirm he was buried a year ago. Which is odd, because the mother has been telling all and sundry that her son was at Oxford enjoying carnal relations with a French student called Fifi. So why would she lie? 
Did she know her son was rotting at the bottom of my garden? What a poetic turn of phrase, Agatha. You really should become a bereavement counsellor. Perhaps Mrs Hicks had a falling out with her son and didn't want anyone to know. Yes, because we also suspect the son was a homosexual. Uh, homosexual. What? It's from the Greek root homos, meaning same, as in same-sex attraction, as opposed to the Latin homo, meaning man. Well, I'll never solve this murder if I don't even know basic Latin. I just think if it's worth saying, you may as well say it correctly. We're not going anywhere. Well, that's no reason for sloppy pronunciation. I mean, the train. We keep grinding to a halt. Yes. Perhaps that's why Sherlock Holmes did so well. He didn't have to contend with a privatised rail network. Mm, and he didn't have a sidekick who was a complete pedant. This calls for a cigarette. Agatha, this is supposed to be a non-smoking compartment. And this is supposed to be a moving train. I'll keep my side of the bargain when they keep theirs. Oh, Mrs. Friendly. Mrs. Hicks. I just had to come and pay my condolences. Yes, of course you did. Come in. Do the police have any idea what happened yet? Oh, no. Dor, if they do, they're not saying. Sit down. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> there is a part of me that hopes they never find out. Really? The thing is, we hadn't been in contact for nearly a year. But I left his room exactly the way it was. His stereo, his clothes in a heap. Because one day I knew he'd come back to it. And part of me still feels that. I can't even tidy up now. Because it'd be like murdering him again. Oh, oh there, there, Mrs. Higgs. I mean, so natural, isn't it? For your child to go first. I can't think of anything worse in the world. But, um, there is something I, I wanted to warn you about. Oh, yes. A, a lot of people in the village are asking questions about why Jeremy left home and what happened to him. Uh, I heard Mrs. Reason and Mr. Lacey talk about it over the garden fence. They've gone up to Oxford to talk to one of his university tutors. They mustn't. I don't want them finding out about Jeremy and his private life. Enter. Ah, uh, uh, Professor oh. Wolf, I'm James Lacey and this is Agatha Raisin. We spoke uh, on the phone. Oh, so we did. Uh, please be seated. <sighs> We're not interrupting anything, are we? Uh, well, I was, um, I was just digesting my roll mops whilst contemplating all the possible anagrams of Gerard Manley Hopkins. Uh, nearly hard poems, king, uh, heap, my lord's anger, ink. They throw such light on his work, don't you think? Yes, fascinating. Mm. Well, we wanted to talk about a student of yours, uh -huh. Jeremy Hicks. Oh, Jerry! What's he been up to now? Do you know, his attendance has been so bad this term, we're thinking of having him sent down. Well, he has a very good excuse. Mm -hmm. He's dead. What? I, I'm afraid it's true. He, he, he was murdered, and we want to find out what happened to him in his final months. Jeremy? God's finger touched him, and he slept. <sighs> Professor Wolf, <sighs> we have a few questions to ask you. Well, I don't see why I should talk to you. You're not the police. No, but I'm sure there's a lot you want to get off your chest, particularly as the two of you were lovers. Who said that? Jeremy did. I think it's uh, overstating it to say we were lovers, although he did come to my room and read me his poetry. Did his <laughs> mother know about your relationship? I can see this is going to take some time. I'll, uh, I'll go and get some tea. <laughs> Agatha, how did you come to that conclusion? It wasn't hard. When I mentioned Jeremy's name, a mist seemed to form on his half-moon glasses. Can you read my thoughts the way you read his? Yes, but they're not all that interesting. What I want to know is why the professor didn't seem bothered that Jeremy had been missing for a year. Oh, these Oxford don't don't have any concept of time. Sitting in a 500-year-old college reading thousand-year-old poetry. Mm. Speaking of ancient... I wonder how Jeremy's mother felt, knowing that he was sleeping with someone old enough to be his father. Well, we don't actually know they were sleeping together. Oh, no. They sat up all night writing rhyming couplets. Look, even if they did, uh, 
engage in a, in a physical act. Is it any concern of ours? If we're investigating his murder, then yes. Why are you so embarrassed? Oh. You really are like that professor. You live in your own little dreamland and anything to do with emotions or sex terrifies you. Oh. There we are. Three cups of Earl Grey's finest. Thank you. <laughs> so, was there more to your relationship than discussing iambic pentameters? It, it, it wasn't a relationship as such. He used me as um, a confidant and told me what was in his heart. And what was that? About that one-man war he was waging with his hideous hook-nosed mother. Mm. Hook-nosed? Oh, yes. A most prominent proboscis. She made Virginia Woolf seem quite petite. Mrs Hicks disapproved of our friendship. I'm rather surprised he told her. Well, you know the way it is with young people. One day she was saying to him, You're a disgusting specimen. You never tidy your bedroom. You don't do a thing to help around the house. And he replied, Oh, and that's not all. I'm having an affair with my personal tutor. And then last June, Jeremy told me of his decision to leave home. Uh, Yes? There's a police gentleman here to see you. What? Oh, uh, well, I'm, I'm almost finished with these people. I I'll tell him you won't be long. Hold on a moment. This policeman, what does he look like? Well, um, quite short for a policeman. Oh, yes, five foot two, half Chinese. That's right. Shall I show him in? Definitely not. Just keep him waiting outside. Right. Professor, our local police officer has followed us here and he's not going to be happy that we've interfered. Is there any other way out of your office? Uh, oh, uh, well, well, you could go via the window and find out if Isaac Newton was right. Is there a cupboard? Uh, well, uh, uh, if you can squeeze in next to the E.M. Forster first editions. Agatha, the thing isn't wrong. Nonsense. Since I started smoking again, I've lost six pounds. Oh, dear. I'm not quite so agile as I used to be. Take a deep breath, James. We're going in. Enter. Right, I thought mm. I... Professor? Yes? I'm surprised to find you alone. I'm sure I heard voices from outside. Uh, yes, well, I, I, I was... Um, Communing with the spirits of Virgil and Shakespeare. Virgil and Shakespeare, eh? And which one of them has a squeaky voice? <laughs> well, well, well. So you didn't quite make it through to Narnia, then? Hello, Bill. Ah, Detective Constable Wong. There's a perfectly innocent explanation. No, there isn't, Colonel Lacey, but I'm sure back at the village we'll all think of one. Now, if you two would wait outside, I'll give you a ride in a police car later. But first of all, I want to find out what else Professor Wolf has got in his closet. Um, well, well thanks for the lift. You're welcome. It's always nice to have you two where I can see you. Do they have any idea how he was killed yet? Nice of you to ask, Mrs. Reason. Sometimes I forget why I do my job. It's not to solve crime, it's to provide you with bits of gossip. Come on, Bill. We've helped you in the past. And almost got yourself killed in the process. Well, if you must know, you was stabbed with a kitchen knife. Now, can you two do me a favour? Of course. What is it? And when you go to the funeral, make sure you ask lots of awkward questions. See if you can antagonise the whole village, snoop into everybody's private life. Bill, I can't believe you just said that. Well, neither can I. As you never seem to listen, I'm hoping that, as usual, you'll do the exact opposite to what I tell you. Not much of a turnout, really, all things considered. Well, nobody knows who they're really burying. Is it the nice young man who carried their shopping? Or a yob who was responsible for all those burglaries last year? Well, there's not a lot of him left to bury. After a year decomposing in your garden and being poked about by a pathologist in search of every single-celled life form... James! James! Speaking of single-celled life forms... Oh, James, I, <laughs> I can't bear it. It's all too much. Oh, hello, Mrs. Raisin. Hello. Yes, Mrs. Rendeza. It's a very tragic occasion. Oh, do call me Dorothy, please. 
I just can't believe that someone so young and so full of hope should be lying in the ground. Of course, it's not just losing a son, it's discovering that your little boy was a one-man crime wave. We don't know that. We only know he was buried with stolen goods. No one knows how they got there, and he can't tell us. I suppose you're right. I was one of the lucky ones. He didn't take anything from my house. No, he seemed to be quite discerning about who he stole from. But people forget. It's not just the mother who suffers. Everyone who knew him is affected. Yes, you do seem awfully affected. James, can you hold me, please? I, I think I'm going to faint. Lord, uh, where exactly uh, should I hold? Oh. Well, you're rather spoiled for choice. Oh. Look, uh, we'll get Mrs. Blocks. Oh. She's trained in first aid. <laughs> Come on, James. But, but I'm fainting. Well, you can lean against the wall, then. Oh. It's almost as plastered as you are. Don't you think you're being a little harsh? Oh, don't be so naive, James. What? It's an obvious ploy. She wants you to take her in your arms and hold her close. But she was crying. She was obviously upset. She wants you to carry her home and give her the kiss of life. All women use tricks like that. All women? No, I mean, not all of us, obviously. Only the needy ones. Right, uh, let's go and see Mrs Hicks. Well, she's just getting into her car. Oh, well, grab her before someone else does. Oh, dear, she's being besieged by women with cake tins. Mrs Hicks! Uh, Mrs Hicks! Mrs Hicks! Oh, it's you. I wondered when you'd catch up with me. I suppose we should have a word. My goodness, the women of Carsley have been busy baking. <laughs> yes, do take some away with you. They keep coming round with one cake after another, as if it somehow makes up for it. I'm sure they mean well. I'm sure they do. Here's your coffee. Oh, thank Thanks. You. I've eaten so much cake this week, I'm starting to look as if I'm pregnant. Oh, oh dear. Oh, there, there. <laughs> you have a good cry. Mrs Hicks, what did you mean when you said you wondered when we'd catch up with you? Oh, yes. Be sure your sins will find you out. I knew you'd come for me sooner or later. Sorry, I don't quite follow. Well, you two investigate murder. And I committed a murder. I killed my son. Mrs. What? what? Oh, no, not with a knife in the middle of the night. That wasn't me. But I threw him out of home. And that's why it all happened. And why did you do that? Why do you think I knew about his dalliance with his personal tutor? And I told him, well, if this professor cares for you, then he can look after you. I threw him out. But I've no idea what happened to him next. Mrs Hicks, you told us your son was doing very well at Oxford and was in a relationship with a woman. Yes, because I wanted to believe it. I kept thinking perhaps his feelings might just have been a phase and then we could have made peace one day. Yes, or if your intolerance was a phase, you could have made peace straight away. Mrs Raisin, please don't judge me. I thought a short, sharp shock would make him forget all his funny ideas. But he was much too proud. Mm, I wonder where he got that from. Thank you for the coffee, Mrs Hicks, but we've got a lot more people to see before your son can rest in peace. Agatha, don't you think you were a little harsh on her? Certainly not. She treated her son like a criminal, so he behaved like one. Jeremy was thrown out of home. He may have phoned his professor for some help and advice, but he also needed money. And luckily, it was a hot summer's night, so quite a few cottages had their windows open. Agatha, I think we may have to have a pause in the proceedings. There is the small matter of my Civil War reenactment. Oh, that thing. Just put them in chain mail and tell them to beat the hell out of each other. Uh, firstly, Royalist soldiers did not wear chain mail. Secondly, I do have to ensure both sides follow authentic military strategy. Well, you can still help with this. No, I can't, actually. I, I don't think Oliver Cromwell solved murder mysteries on the side. No, I don't suppose so. Men have no idea how to multitask. Oh, yes. Uh, apart from winning six major battles, executing the king, establishing democracy and the Commonwealth, the man was quite useless. Oh, stop whittering, James. Uh, well, if you won't help, I shall break the habit of a lifetime. Oh, dear. What are you going to do? I'm going to see Bill Wong with my evidence.
come in. Mrs. Raisin. I do have a seat. Unless you'd rather hide in my filing cabinet. I know who killed Jeremy Hicks. Do you? Who was it? Someone whose house was broken into. I think it was an act of revenge. Well, you've narrowed it down to a dozen. Everyone on your street except yourself. Well, I was on holiday. Anyway, I've got a burglar alarm. Oh, and Mrs. Friendly. You never touched hers. Oh, that is a pity. I was hoping to put her behind bars. Do you have anything else she can tell me? Uh, no. Well, it's uh, not much to go on, but it's an interesting theory. We did search every house at the time of the burglaries, but we were looking for fingerprints, not dead bodies. However, you really haven't given us any new evidence. Well, we have to start somewhere. Well, we do, Mrs. Reason, but you don't. Now, I suggest you go home, have a nice bath, and see if there's anything good on television. I wouldn't have thought so. But please leave me in peace. I've got work to do. Bone of our bone, flesh of our flesh, in Christ! Now is the time to fashion your plowshare into a sword and march under the flag of king and country. We shall set forth and Oh, for heaven's sake. <sighs> Hello? I'm on the battlefield! Would all the roundheads and the cavaliers please turn off their mobile phones? We have perfectly good heralds and messenger boys, and we may as well get the use of them. No, I can't, Doris. Look, I've got to go. Sorry, my liege. Don't mention it. Let us set forth and defeat the invader! Yay! Yay! James, I think Bill Wong's got a cheek. I mean, if it wasn't for me solving all his murders, he'd be demoted to a traffic warden. Back of the wall. Do you mind? I'm in the middle of a Civil War reenactment. Well, you and your friends can carry on killing each other. Don't mind me. But I'd have thought you'd have grown out of it by your age. I mean... Out of the way, please. Pike staff coming through. Ah! I say, it's rather good fun, isn't it? If your idea of fun is middle-aged men squelching about in chain mail. How many times do I have to tell you? There was no chain mail in the Stuart period. Uh, uh, Mrs. Blocksby, if you can put the cream teas on the trestle table next to the fake blood. Thank you. James, how did you feel when you had your laptop stolen? Oh, you're still here. Well, well if you must know, I was somewhat peeved at the first draft of my book on it. And in the end, only the maggots got to read it. Did you feel so angry you could have killed the person who did it? But it was silly. A kick up the backside would have sufficed. Maybe I'm barking up the wrong tree. No one would kill someone because they stood in the vial. Oh, I don't know. A strange man bursts into your house is going to put you on edge. And people do strange things in the heat of battle or, or the fog of war. The fog of war! Well, it was the middle of the night, and no one could see a thing. And... Agatha, mind the battering ram! Horse, how stupid! There is nothing remotely stupid about it. It's completely authentic. No, I mean me. I've been assuming the killer was a burglary victim, but it has to be the one person who claims she wasn't burgled. Sorry, I, I mean, I don't follow. Well, if you had a struggle with an intruder and ended up killing him, the last thing you'd do is call the police and report the burglary. You'd keep quiet about it. So our killer is likely to be someone who apparently wasn't burgled. Give the man a coconut. You weren't burgled. I was in Madeira. Oh, there's Mrs. Friendly. Precisely. Oh, now, hang on a minute. She's the one who invited the Historical Society and the Council to the archaeological dig. At that stage, the dig was already planned. However, the Historical Society might have advised us to look elsewhere, and the Council could have refused us permission. So if you told them in the hope they'd call it off? It's a distinct possibility. Oh, now hang on. Everything you've got is circumstantial. It has to be her. She lives next door. Who else could drag a chest through a hole in the hedge? Well, look, when this battle's finished, we might just pop round there together. But whatever you do, don't go on your own and accuse her. No, of course not. I'll just have a quiet word. <sighs> Lord. Once more, the blast of war blows in our ears. Be not afraid. We will never be free until this enemy is defeated. Well, Mrs. Raisin, I've heard of Cinderella, Rumpelstiltskin and Snow White. But this is one fairy tale too many. So you deny it? Of course I deny it. 
I was very fond of Jeremy. I wouldn't have hurt a hair on his head. Except that you didn't know whose head it was. It was the middle of the night, he'd just broken in, and Jeremy had an alarming habit of changing hairstyles. You might not even have recognised him. Of course I'd have recognised him. In the dark, too scared to turn on the light. Mrs Raisin, you really should write detective fiction. But if you go round presenting this as fact, I may have to sue you for slander. I'll see you in court. You used to keep a knife by the bed, didn't you? It made you feel safe. I do feel safe living in the country. With rural crime on the rise, police stations closing down. So when you hear a noise in the night and don't know if it's a squirrel or a killer, the knife makes you feel safe. But you never, ever want to use it. That's the last thing you want to do. There isn't a knife by my bed. You're welcome to go and have a look. It isn't there anymore. You washed off the blood, got rid of the weapon, and you buried the body with a trunk full of stolen goods. Did I, Mrs. Raisin? Did I? Now is the time to root out the intruder. Spear them with spikes and drag them to the dunghill. Cut off their heads for trophies and leave their trunks for the crows to feed on. Beg your pardon, Mr. Lacey. For heaven's sake, I'm trying to choreograph the English Civil War here. Sorry about that. Any idea where Mrs. Reason is? Off on one of her crackpot theories. Oh dear. Any idea what that theory might be? I'm intrigued, Mrs. Raisin. However did you come up with such a preposterous idea? Well, it's all down to my cat, Chivers. Chivers? Hmm. I've noticed she often disappears in my garden. Then I saw a hole in the hedge leading straight through to yours. Not an enormous hole, but it must have been bigger a year ago. Well, I'm sorry about that. It makes me a very poor gardener, but it doesn't make me a murderer. So, who have you told this outlandish story to? No one. Oh, just the police. What? I'm surprised that bothers you. If you're innocent, you have nothing to fear. If you're guilty, you should give yourself up. You'll get a shorter sentence if you admit to it. And you'll spare Mrs Hicks the agony of another day not knowing. Who the hell is that? Well, there's only one way to find out. No, it's no one. It's only Jehovah's Witnesses or, or someone selling sandalwood soap to raise money for the blind. Would you like me to get it? Don't move, Mrs Raisin. They'll soon go away. They don't appear to be going. Very persistent people, these Jehovah's Witnesses. If it's the police and you don't answer, they may take that as an admission of guilt. They might even think you've taken me hostage. What a ridiculous idea. Now, sit down, Mrs Raisin. I, I have a headache and, and I'm not in the mood for any more visitors. Fine. Well, if they go away, we'll know it wasn't the police, and you've been talking nonsense as per usual, and I suggest that in future you keep your slanderous theories... <gasps> Agatha! James, where are the police? On their way, but I thought I'd beat them to it with a highly authentic battering ram. This is my house! You have no right! This is my house! Dorothy Friendly? I'm arresting you on a charge of murder. Oh. You do not have to say anything, no. but it may harm your defense no. if you don't mention when questions no. you later rely on in court. No. Anything you do, say it in Well, thanks for helping me tidy up. You're welcome. I enjoy scrubbing fake blood off paving stones. Well, you'll be pleased to know it was such a success. They want it to be an annual event. How oh, <laughs> thrilling. So, who won? Oh, well, uh, Oliver Cromwell. It's called historical accuracy, you see. We always have to let him win. <laughs> Wouldn't it be nice if just once we could change the script? Are you talking about Jeremy? Yes, and Mrs Friendly. She's going to be sent to prison for a single moment of panic. Yes, I think you're right. There's more than one person responsible for his death. Unfortunately, it's the one with the knife in her hand who gets arrested. Time for a cigarette. And what time would that be then? Uh, between dawn and dusk? <laughs> James, I need these. Mm. Sometimes they're the only thing that makes sense. Agatha? Yes? Did you mean what you said in Oxford? About losing weight since I started again? Well, it was a bit of an exaggeration. No, 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 no. About me being like the professor, not totally in touch with my feelings. Do you think I'm... what's the phrase? 
emotionally repressed. Well, uh, how can I put this? Yes. Oh. Well, the thing is, how do you um, get in touch with your feelings if you've always tried to keep them under control and then you suddenly decide you need them? It isn't our James. We're all alone here. We're two grown-ups. You can say whatever you want to me. Right. Well, I just wanted to say, when I knew you were in the house with Mrs. Friendly and Bill told me that I had proof she was the murderer, I've never felt so scared in all my life. Because you're more than just a neighbour. You're the most wonderful friend. A friend, James? Yes. A very good friend. Thank you, James. Thank you. In Agatha Raisin, Penelope Keith starred as Agatha, and Malcolm Sinclair was James. Linda Barron played Mrs Hicks, and Joanna Brooks, Mrs Friendly, with Simon Treves as Professor Wolfe, and Stephen Hogan as DC Wong. Agatha Raisin was dramatised by David Semple from the novel by M.C. Beaton, and the producer was Carol Smith. Agatha Raisin by M.C. Beaton Dramatised for radio by David Semple Starring Penelope Keith as Agatha The Wizard of Evesham Right then, Mrs. Wendell, once more from the top and this time don't forget to breathe The audience won't enjoy it half as much if you're blue in the face Mrs. Bluxby, I do know how to inhale, thank you Well then, now, ready Mrs. Asquith? Off we go. On a tree by a river, a little tom tit. Sam Willow, tit Willow. Well, hold on a minute. I'll just get that. Uh, you carry on without me. Oh, hello, Mrs. Raisin. Mrs. Bloxby, you're not doing anything important, are you? Well, I am actually rehearsing the Gilbert and Sullivan Society at the moment. Oh, that's all right, then. I need your advice on a rather embarrassing problem. Yes, of course, I do like your hat, by the way. Are you off to Ascot? No, I'm not. The hat is there to cover up the problem. Take a look. Oh, yes, that, that, that's um, an interesting hairdo. I think, Mrs. Bloxby, it's a hair don't. I appear to have turned into a purple badger. Whatever happened? Well, since moving to the village, I've let my hair go a little. I mean, where can you get a decent haircut round here? Well, well it's Mrs. Simmons' salon by the off-license. Best place for it. Anyway, last week I decided I was no longer glad to be grey. So, I went and bought some permanent colour. Well, yes, Mrs. Chumley sells it at the chemist. And trading standards really should be notified. This was supposed to be warm caramel. It's more like cold spotted dick. Yes, it, it does seem somewhat uh, mottled. Why don't you show it to the Gilbert and Sullivan Society? They might know what to do. No, thank you. I refuse to be laughed at by the Pirates of Penzance. Do you know any good hairdressers within a 20-mile radius? Uh, well, there is a, a place over at Evesham. It's called Orlando's. Orlando's? Yes, Mr. Orlando is he's such a very talented man. He's a, he's a wizard, really. I only go once a year because it's so expensive, but oh, it's, it's a wonderful place. Such a happy atmosphere. And, and the things people say in his salon. Hello. Oh, thanks for phoning, Danny. I've had such a day of it. I mean, you wouldn't believe what's just pitched up at the salon. Have you ever seen The Bride of Frankenstein? Excuse me. Oh dear, I think she's just risen from the grave. Hold on. Look, am I going to be waiting much longer? Mr Orlando will be with you as soon as he can. It's just I'm feeling a bit self-conscious sitting in the window like a Dutch prostitute. We could always put a bag over your head like a sex offender. Can I get your coffee? I suppose so. Black, two sugars. Right. 
So, anyway, I'm flying off to Torrelinos to meet Simon's mother just as soon as I've had my tennis game. Would you like any coffee, ladies? No, thank Not you, Bobby. Me. So, where was I, Marjorie? Oh, right, yes, right. She's got this job as an au pair, right, over in Block. Oh, that's a very nice village. You get a better class of person there. Oh, well, that's what I thought. But then, right, on the first day, the little girl she's looking after says, Can we put on some of Mummy's dressing up clothes? Oh, how sweet. Oh, no, it isn't. You'll never guess what Mummy had at the back of her wardrobe. What? Whips, like chains, and a cat suit of synthetic material. No. So now we know how she can afford the house prices in Blockley. Oh. Excuse me, ladies. Coffee coming through. Your coffee, madam. Look, is it going to be much longer? I've been waiting so long, the clothes in these magazines are coming back into fashion. Someone's having a bad hair day. Someone is fed up with being ignored while you yak on your mobile about trips to Torremolinas. Do you have any idea who I am? No. Oh, should I? I am a customer. I'll see if he's ready yet. Goodness, Marjorie. Tourist season gets earlier every year. Oh, I know. Ah, uh, Mrs. Raisin, I'm so sorry to... Oh, my word. What have we here? What we have is purple hair. I feel like a poodle with alopecia. Right. And may I ask which lunatic did this to your hair? That would be the lunatic you're talking to. Oh, dear. <laughs> if it was anybody else, you could have sued for damages. <laughs> now, why, oh, why would such a beautiful woman do such a terrible thing to her hair? But don't worry, Mrs. Raisin. Put yourself completely in my hands. Hello, Chivers. Yes, it's me. Not my devastatingly attractive younger sister. I've just been to see the wizard. And he's certainly done something wonderful with my hair. Oh, I was so fed up with all those grey streaks appearing. I... Agatha. James. I saw you coming up the garden path, and I'd pop in. Oh, is it anything in particular? No, I, I just wanted to ask, uh, what are you doing tomorrow evening? Because there's a restaurant just over in Evesham, uh, Les Cartes Sans Coup. I'm guessing this might be a French establishment. Mais oui, c'est vrai. Et, et voulez-vous manger avec moi? What on earth for? <laughs> Do we need a reason? No, I just wondered if there was some special occasion. <laughs> well, if you must know, it's three years since I came to this village. Three years since your car crashed into mine and you dragged me into a web of murder and mayhem. Oh, an anniversary dinner. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, we'll drink a toast to happy times and homicide. Ladies, ladies, now, if I could have your attention, please. Excuse me, uh, could someone open the window? It's awfully hot. Oh, um, uh, perhaps Mrs. Wendell, would, would you? Oh, uh, I, I'm not sure I shall go on tiptoes with my heart, Mama, but... Uh, ah, there you are. Thank you, thank you. Now, as you all know, we have the annual Gilbert and Sullivan concert next month in Tidlington, but we still don't have any interval refreshments. Now, I know most of you are actually in the concert and it's a bit much to expect. Three little maids to rustle up savoury snacks. But is there anyone who can lend a hand? Well, I could make some sausage rolls. You, Mrs. Raisin? Yes, me, Mrs. Wendell. I'm not just a scary face. Well, I hope there won't be a repeat of last year. You promised to make fairy cakes, but they all came from a shop in London. You get a better class of fairy at Thornham and Masons. Uh, do you want me to run the stall as well? Oh, no, 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 no. Mrs. Cheney is doing that. Uh, just drop them round here the night before. Oh, thank heavens that I don't have to trek all the way to Tidlington. Hold on. I hope you are actually coming to this concert. I mean, one doesn't do it for the glory, but one does hope for some support from one's neighbours. Mrs. Wendell, I wouldn't miss it for all the tea and titty poo. Oh, good. I mean, I don't claim to be Kiri to Karnawa. Just as well. But I do enjoy my 15 minutes of fame. Yes, though with you it always seems so much longer. Right, well that's settled. I'll, I'll go and get this evening's refreshments. A nice grapefruit and poppy seed gatto. Your hair looks nice, Mrs Raisin. Thank you. I had it done at Orlando's in Evesham. Did you? Oh. Is something wrong? Oh no, it's just not a place I'd go to. Why ever not? One hears stories. What sort of stories? Oh, I, I, I don't know that I can say. I wouldn't want you to think of me as a gossip. Oh, don't bother telling me then. It probably isn't all that interesting. Well, I, I went there a year ago and I didn't care for the man. 
He seemed to have wandering hands. I cut my own hair now. Yes, I thought you did. You'll have difficulty keeping that hairstyle. I mean, it's such a hot night. One is inclined to toss about in bed. Well, I'll just use some extra hairspray. It's hardly going to lose its shape overnight. Oh, hello, Mrs. Raisin. Oh, dear. Another bad hair day. No, I'm going to a fancy dress party as a hedgehog. Well, I'm sure Mr. Orlando will be happy to uh, drop everything for you. What's that supposed to mean? Nothing. Let's just say he has his favourites. I'll go and get him. Mrs. Raisin. <laughs> oh, dear. You have had a rough night, haven't you? I'm afraid so. And that rather beautiful hairstyle you gave me is, uh, dyed. You don't need a hairdresser. You need someone to tuck you in at night. Have a seat in my new chair. Oh, good God! What was that? I'm sorry, I should have warned you. It vibrates. A little bit of soothing massage. Whatever will they think of next, and why? I'll have this sorted in no time, Mrs. Raisin. Thank you, Mr. Orlando. Oh, it's John, please. John, is that another salon opening over the road? Salon? <laughs> is that what you call it? That is an extremely grotty barber's five-pound haircuts. They wouldn't know the difference between hairdressing and sheep shearing. Sorry, I mean barbers. Yes. You have lovely thick hair, Mrs. Raisin, but you really have let it go a little. Well, that's the thing with living in the country. You're miles from a decent salon. Who do I need to impress out here in the sticks? Oh, so there's no Mr. Raisin then? Oh, yes, there is. But uh, he wouldn't know the difference between a Marcel wave and a mullet. <laughs> really? Some husbands don't know how lucky they are. Your credit card, monsieur. I hope everything was to your satisfaction. Yes, thank you. Marvellous. Oh, good. No, James, it wasn't marvellous. <laughs> Actually, no second thoughts, not marvellous. When we uh, finally found the steak, buried under a bed of rocket, it had the taste and texture of shoe leather. The wine was more like lighter fuel, which is all the more annoying when you're not allowed to smoke. And would you please tell your chef, there is a subtle difference between petit pois and mushy peas. Uh, although I have to say the creme anglaise was a jolly good effort. I will pass on your comments to the chef. Thank you for coming and for leaving. <sighs> Well, bang goes the Entente Cordiale. Oh dear, this is getting to be a habit. You take me for a meal and I end up eating the waiter. Are you ever going to mellow with age? Only when the world stops being so annoying. It must be terribly tiresome, particularly when you're always bending over backwards to be reasonable. James! Right, back to the car. <sighs> oh, hold on. Can we use another exit? Why, oh, whatever's the matter? Mrs. Raisin, we must stop meeting like this. And this must be your... This is my husband, James. Uh, am I? Uh, oh, yes, uh, I'm her husband, James. Well, talk about a small world. I just came to drop off some business cards. But would the pair of you care to join me in a drink? Oh, well, of I... course, Mr... Orlando. Mr. Orlando, it's always such a pleasure to meet my wife's friends. Life with my darling wife is always so full of surprises. Well, I'll just drop these off to the manager. I'll see you in the bar. James, I am so, 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 so sorry. Oh, well, that's all right, then. I've got nothing against arranged marriage. I'll try anything once. But it's nice to be told that you've been married. He's been pursuing me. I had to tell him I was married. It was the only way to get rid of him. What do you mean, pursuing you? Oh, well, you know, making advances, personal remarks. It just got a bit creepy. So long as he doesn't pretend to be married to you, that would be really creepy. So, what can I get you? I'll have a very dry martini. And I'll have a very bitter lemon. One dry martini, one bitter lemon, and one gin and tonic, please. Certainly, sir. So, Mr. Raisin. What? Oh, yeah, you mean me. Yes. Yes? How long have you two been married? Uh, Twenty-six. Yeah. Twenty-five, twenty-six? <laughs> <laughs> Any advance on twenty-six? Sorry, after the first two decades, it all sort of blurs into one. <laughs> I expect your wife's told you all about me? Actually, no, that's one of several things she's neglected to mention. This is Mr. Orlando, from Orlando's in the High Street. I'm responsible for your wife's new look. Of course, it's easy creating a beautiful hairstyle when you have a perfect English rose underneath it. Sorry, you lost me there. 
Oh, you mean the English rose I married? Ha <laughs> ha, yes, well, I always have been a keen gardener. <laughs> Oh, look, it's Mrs. Wendell from the Gilbert and Sullivan Society. This whole evening is turning into a comic opera. Hello, Mrs. Wendell, would you like to join us? That's me, uh, Mr. Raisin, and my English Rose wife. Uh, oh, oh. Oh. That's odd, she's run off. Sorry, is this someone you know? Yes, we're in the Carsley Lady Society, Mrs. Wendell. Hold on. You used to cut her hair, didn't you? By the look of her hair, I think she goes to the sheep shearing salon over the road. But I thought she said you were... No, Mrs. Wendell... Uh, doesn't ring any bells. So, do all of your friends head for the hills whenever they bump into you? Yes, it must be something to do with her being an English rose. Some people just don't like the prickles. Thanks for backing me up, James. Always a pleasure, darling. Hmm. But just for future reference, how long have we been married? Twenty-five years. We first met when I was driving to work. You were at the bus stop, but I accidentally splashed a puddle over you. Oh, oh yes, I remember. I was sick to the skin, but you dried me off by tying me to the roof rack. <laughs> Any children yet? Just the two. Alison, who's a huge success in advertising, and John, who's a complete drip of a librarian. Good old John. He's so lucky to have his dusty old books to hide away in. Speaking of hiding, did you see the way Mrs. Wendell ran out of the restaurant? She looked absolutely terrified. Perhaps she'd seen the prices. I think there's more to it than that. I can't work out if she's scared of you, me, or the hairdresser. Let's go and see her tomorrow. <laughs> oh, well, beats what most married couples do at the weekend. Off to the garden centre, putting up shells. No, Mrs. Raisin. I'm afraid you're making mountains out of molehills, as is your wont. No, I have a sudden attack of irritable bowel syndrome, that's all. Strange that it came on the moment you saw us. Well, it's nothing personal. I mean, I don't think I'm allergic to you. I'm very glad to hear it. Oh, no, James. I could consume you in large quantities. Ah. But whether it was the hot night or the smell of the food, I just felt a little queasy in the colon. Of course, it might not have been us you were alarmed by. It could have been Mr. Orlando. Who? My hairdresser. Oh, that Mr. Orlando. Two weeks ago, you tried to warn me away from him. Then last night, when you came face to face with him, you ran away in terror. <laughs> what it is to have a vivid imagination. Still, when one has so little else in one's life. I stopped going to Mr. Orlando because the man couldn't keep his hands to himself, though I can see that would appeal to some women. Uh, Mrs. Wendell, if there is anything, I promise we'll treat it in the strictest confidence. Well, you might. But I'm not so sure about the Agatha Raisin Broadcasting Corporation. However, I have nothing to say and a number of Gilbert and Sullivan arias to practice. Well, thank you. Thanks. Goodbye. She doesn't know her arias from her elbow. <laughs> well, we didn't get very much out of her. On the contrary, when people clam up on a particular subject, it means there's something to hide. I think Mr. Orlando may have spurned her. Or something worse. Oh, dear. She's got that look in her eye. Perhaps I should go and spend the day with my imaginary son, John, at his imaginary library. He could even be blackmailing her. I mean, the things people say in that salon will keep him in styling moose for eternity. But you've absolutely no evidence. Then I'll get some. I'm going to have a little fling with him, in spite of my insanely jealous husband. And if he threatens to reveal it, I'll have everything on tape. Agatha, you don't know what you're getting into. Oh, for heaven's sake, he's only a hairdresser. Yes, indeed. And so was Sweeney Todd. If you'd like to go through, Mr. Orlando, we'll see you now, Mrs. Raisin. Thank you, Bobby. Agatha, do sit down. Oh, thank you. Is it just me, or are you forever beating a path to my door at the moment? Right now, it's the only place I feel welcome. Oh, well, what can I do for you? Uh, wash and blow dry? You can cut it all off for all I care. What's the use of having a beautiful hairstyle if nobody notices it? Oh, oh dear. I don't think your hair is really the problem here. Mm, it's James. He's off on one of his regimental reunions again. Well, isn't it nice to have the place to yourself? I mean, when the cat's away... Oh, it's not just that. It's just... Nowadays, he seems so cold and distant. Mm, yes, 
He seemed a bit distant when I saw him, almost on another planet. So it looks like another night listening to the moral maze with a cup of cold cocoa. <laughs> you know what you need. What? You need to treat yourself to a few little luxuries. Uh, pamper yourself. A bit of aromatherapy, a massage... The only or... aromatherapy I get these days is the smell of cigarettes and coffee. Well, I live just around the corner from a health spa. They do all kinds of hydrotherapy, Indian head massage... I always thought you were a bit of a health fanatic. I noticed the vitamin pills next to your conditioners. <laughs> That's to keep my energy levels up. And believe me, with some of my dreary customers, I need it. Well, oh, it sounds like a wonderful place. How much does it cost? Oh, I can get you in for free on my membership. So, if you're footloose and fancy free this evening... Thank you for the most wonderful evening. You're welcome. I can still feel my skin tingling from that Dead Sea mud. Of course, the night doesn't have to end just yet. I could pop in for a nightcap. Some other time, John. That would be lovely, but let's not rush things. Sure. Which number are you? Number 18. Hold on a sec. John, I've told you, I don't want the neighbours to see us together. It's not that. There's a strange man lurking behind your laburnum tree. That's just the wheelie bin. Then why is your wheelie bin wearing a cardigan? There's nothing there. It's just flickering shadows. Are you sure? 99.9%. .9 it's the 0 0.1 I'm worried about. I'll walk you to the door. All right, but no further. I told you there was nothing there. It's just... Oh! oh! Hey, just who the hell is this, Agatha? It's your husband. What? Oh, yes, so it is. Sir, this is what you get up to when I'm looking after my poor disabled mother. Remember what I told you? If I catch you with another man, I'll kill myself. And kill him. I mean, obviously, I'll have to kill him first. But you get the gist of what I'm saying. Mr. Raisin, I assure you... Oh, I... it's you. So... This is your fancy man, Johnny Crimping Shirt. You're a disgrace to your profession. And you, get inside, woman. I'm going to settle this man to man. Mr. Raisin, I know how this must look, but I assure you I have no designs at all on your wife. What? Why the hell not? What's the matter with her? There's nothing the matter with her, but I've only just got divorced and I'm not looking for someone else. I bumped into Agatha at my health club and I offered to give her a lift home. It's true, James. Honestly. Right. Well, if you say so. But I'm... Warning you, if you ever lay a finger on this goddess, I'll tear you to pieces with my bare hands. Now, get inside, you shameless hussy. Stop pushing me! Oh! You seem to have dropped your tape recorder. Oh, thank you. Good night. Well, I think that went rather well. Do Get inside now, James, before I'm accused of husband battering. Agatha, is there something the matter? What do you think you were doing? It was all going so well, and then some lunatic leaps out of my laburnum tree. Aha, uh -huh. that was the element of surprise. I thought it might help the verisimilitude if you could actually see how jealous I was. Well, God save us from men thinking. And you're about as good at acting as King Herod was at babysitting. Oh, I'm terribly sorry. I'm a bit new to this insane jealousy lark. That wasn't insane jealousy. It was just insane. Agatha, why are you so angry? I am angry because I've just spent two hours in some prisoner of war drama where people actually think that carrot juice is a drink. Then suddenly I come home and I'm in the world's worst bedroom farce. So, uh, they didn't have nicotine therapy then at the health farm? If only. And now he's seen the tape recorder, so we're finished. Not necessarily. You could say you use it as a, a sort of personal organiser. Or to help you learn your lines for Rum for Your Wife. Well, did you actually find out anything? Not a lot, though he certainly has expensive tastes. Wrapping yourself in Dead Sea mud doesn't come cheap. And whilst I lay there like a depressed hippopotamus, he made subtle inquiries about what kind of car I drove, which parts of the world I'd visited. Doesn't necessarily make him a blackmailer. Oh, no? Perhaps he's a philanthropist who thinks I need a few quid. Well, I let slip a few incriminating secrets. If he is a blackmailer, I'll be hearing from him soon. I know. I'll buy him a present. His sort are always won over by some pretty bauble. Agatha, I really rather you didn't. Why not? What's the matter? While you were gone, someone slid a letter under your door. 
made up of words cut out of different newspapers. Good God! I've gone from a white whore farce to a gangster movie. What does it say? It tells you to back off. I mean, what do you think it says? Don't forget Bin Men Tuesday. Let's have a look. <sighs> to stay alive and stay healthy, stay away from Mr Orlando. So, maybe it's time for you to wash that man right out of your hair? Oh, no. I should get back in his vibrating chair as soon as possible. Oh, Mrs. Raisin, I'm not sure if Mr. Orlando can see you today. I mean, several of his regular customers have turned up, and I don't know if he'll be able Mrs. to... Mrs. Raisin. John, I've got you a little something. Oh, what's this in aid of? To say sorry for the other night. Oh, that's really sweet. I wish Simon Thank would... you, Bobby. Haven't you got a floor to sweep? Oh, your degree in staff motivation really paid off. <laughs> Cufflinks. With blue sapphires to match your eyes, like a kingfisher in flight. Oh, uh, I I'm lost for words. That's all right. I get enough of those from my husband, but I prefer a man of action. Well, we will have to be a bit more discreet. Perhaps we can meet somewhere private later. That would be lovely. Let's get your hair done. So... What would you like me to do for you? Oh, the usual. Oh, no. You may be used to getting the usual, but with me, you'll always get something special. All right, then. Let's have a bit of your wizardry. <laughs> <laughs> That's more like it. But I did have rather a busy night, so I do need my vitamin pills. Now, Bobby's really busy. Let me wash your hair. Is that about right for you? Yes, lovely, thanks. Good. So, your husband wasn't at a regimental dinner then, was he? No. He'd gone to stay with his mother, only his car broke down. Oh, naughty, naughty. Still, if he will leave a very beautiful woman unattended, it's hardly surprising that I... <laughs> John, what's the matter? Uh, uh, nothing. Uh, uh, I think I need the bathroom. Uh, uh, Bobby? Bobby, is he all right? Oh, he'll be fine. Probably just had a dodgy kebab last night. Dodgy veggie burger, more like. The colour just seemed to drain out of his face. He was looking a bit pale when I got here. He always was a sensitive flower. Shut up and give me a towel. What's happened to him? Well, I don't know, do I? I'm not a mind reader. Oh, ask if he's OK. What did your last slave die of? Mr Orlando? Uh, Mr Orlando, are you going to be much longer? This customer's waiting. Yeah. Right, you've got to break the door down. I'm not tearing my Dolce & Gabbana. Oh, for heaven's sake. Give me the fire extinguisher. Oh, oh. oh. hello, Mr Orlando. Oh. Would you, uh, would you like a glass of water? No, he bloody wouldn't. Go and get him an ambulance. Oh, right. Hello. James, it's me. Agatha. Mr. Orlando has fallen ill. Well, uh, what do you want me to do? Send a get well card? I mean really ill. Eyes bulging like a squid, white as a sheet, almost in a coma. I see. Well, uh, where are you now? I'm at his house. What? As soon as he collapsed, I took the keys out of his pocket. Well, I mean, it was the obvious thing to do. I had to find out what his secret was. Agatha, are you mad? No need to answer rhetorical question. But James, this could be my only chance. I'm sure there's something seedy going on. Now, hold, hold on. I think we've got a bad light. Do you hear crackling? Yes, I do. That's funny. I can smell burning. Get out of the house! Get out of the house now! In Agatha Raisin, Penelope Keith starred as Agatha and Malcolm Sinclair was James. Mrs Bloxby was played by Liza Sadovy and Mrs. Wendell by Tina Gray, with John Cummings as Mr. Orlando and Matthew Carter as Bobby. Agatha Raisin was dramatised by David Semple from the novel by M.C. Beaton, and the producer was Carol Smith. Agatha Raisin by M.C. Beaton, 
dramatised for radio by David Semple, starring Penelope Keith as Agatha. The Moment of Truth Hello? Roy, it's me. Aggie, how are things in the land of cream teas and crochet work? You remember that hairdresser I was telling you about? Ah, uh, the one who you thought was blackmailing his customers. I think he's dead. Oh, Aggie, not another one. I'm afraid so. Some women have the power to drive men wild. I have a gift for making them drop down dead. So how did this one end up in that great salon in the sky? Well, he was about to cut my hair when he suddenly keeled over. <gasps> I had to phone the ambulance. I mean, I don't know for sure if he's dead, but he won't be running the marathon this year. Oh, poor Aggie. Is your hair all right? Do you have no compassion? A man could be dead. My hair isn't really relevant. Sorry, I spoke. So what did you do then? Well, while the ambulance was on its way, I went and broke into his house. Well, there's compassion for you. I'm amazed you didn't become a nurse. Well, I had to find out if he really was a blackmailer. Anyway, I was in his house going through his things when somebody else broke in. Honestly, you wait all day for a break in, then two come along at once. Who was it? Jehovah's Burglars? It isn't funny. Whoever it was, and I didn't see them, set fire to the house. Did you manage to get out in one piece? Of course. Do I sound fragmented? You really should take up a less dangerous hobby, like recreational drugs or binge drinking. And that's what James said. I ran round to his house, I was still shaking, and told him what had happened. He said I should go home, have a shower, and work out why I valued my life so little. I think the silver-haired Adonis has a point. Thank you, Roy. Hold on. What happens if the police find out I was in the house? They'll think I committed the arson. That's a point. They can trace your DNA from the tiniest flake of dandruff. I do not do dandruff. Footprints, then. That's a point. I'd better burn my shoes. Aggie, I don't think it's going to make a lot of... Thanks it. for the chat. Bye. Oh, out of the way, Chivers. You may be beautiful, but you're not in flannel. Oh, honestly, what is the point of fire lighters if it takes ten minutes to actually light them? Uh, hold on! Uh, just be a minute! Oh, Chivers, are you a cat or an obstacle course? Mrs. Raisin? D.C. Wong. Oh, D.C. Wong, is it? Well, they call me Bill. Unless you're feeling guilty about something. What on earth would I feel guilty about? You tell me. Hello, Chivers. I see you've made yourself comfortable by the fire. Just what you need in a beautiful summer's day. Is it warm out? I wouldn't know. I think I'm <coughs> going down with something. That's why I've been at home, resting, all afternoon. Except for your two-hour appointment with John Orlando. Oh, that. Yes, I'd forgotten that. Strange thing to forget, when it was you who called the ambulance after he collapsed. W well, it was all such a shock. I don't want to think about him. How is he? He's seriously in a Mercister hospital. It looks as if he's... Hold on. Yes? You've got a pair of shoes on that fire. I was running out of coal. Burning shoes, eh? I guess I'll never get used to your London ways. Bill, you've never actually been married, have you? I haven't tied the knot as yet. Well, when you do, you'll discover women often get dissatisfied with their image, very suddenly. So they set fire to their shoes. I've got a lot to look forward to. Well, it's funny seeing a fire, because just after John Orlando collapsed in Salon, someone set fire to his house. Really? Yes, they did. And two women were seen running away from the crime scene. Two women? I seem surprised. Uh, no, you just don't think of arsonists going round in pairs. They weren't together. One ran out the back door and one out the front. And I'm just wondering, did one of these women run all the way back to Carsley and set fire to her shoes? Me? You surely don't think I'm responsible? Responsible, no. A bloody-minded yes. Bill. What did you do after you phoned the ambulance? I ran to my car. And then drove home? All the way home. And set forward to your shoes? Yes. I hope you're telling the truth, Agatha. Even if it does break the habit of a lifetime. 
James, can we talk? Agatha, you may not have noticed the dust sheets and the smell of paint, but I am in the middle of redecorating. Fine, I'll solve this mystery myself. You can stay here and watch paint dry. It isn't just painting. I have several jobs pending. I, I, I've just drawn up a to-do list. Oh, a to-do list. I am impressed. Some people have a life, others have a to-do list. Very well, I'll put my brush down then, shall I? I know who started the fire. Oh, yes. Who was it? A woman. Could you be a bit more specific? I mean, was it Germaine Greer or was it Her Majesty the Queen? I think it was one of John's customers. Whoever it was must have seen him collapse in the salon, then went and burnt his house down. Goodness, if I don't like my haircut, I just refuse to leave a tip. My theory is John was blackmailing a customer, but she managed to poison him, possibly put something nasty in the vitamin pills he kept by his chair. And when the poison took effect, she ran off to burn his house down and get rid of any dirt he may have had on her. So we're looking for a woman with wet hair and a smell of petrol. I'm going to see John at Mercister General Hospital. Are you coming? Well, I thought you said he was seriously ill. He'll have to come out of his coma eventually. Oh, good. One pip on the life support machine for yes, two bips for no. This will be the place. High dependency unit. Agatha, how are we going to get into him? I mean, the only connection is he's your hairdresser and he's in no condition to give a shampoo and set. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, hang on. Why don't you steal a white coat and pretend to be a consultant? I'm sure you could pull it off. Are you insane? Oh, sorry. It isn't on your to-do list. Excuse me. Can I help you? Oh, uh, um, yes. Uh, we wanted to inquire about a patient, uh, Mr. John Orlando. Are you relatives? I'm his sister, Janet. Oh, I'm so sorry. We didn't know he had a sister. But surely the police told you. Told us what? Would you like to come this way, Mrs... Uh... He's dead, isn't he? I'm so sorry. We did everything we could for you. Oh, John! Oh, oh no! Oh, dear! Darling, let me hold you. You know, uh, in my arms, sort of thing. Uh, Just take me home. Oh. <laughs> Excuse me, we do need to have all your contact details. James, get in the lift. Terribly sorry. Mustache. Excuse me. Uh, sorry, my wife and a bit of state. They were always very close, the two of them. Janet and John. Quite a lot of women here today. I wonder if they're paying their last respects or checking that he's definitely dead. Anyone you remember from the salon? So hard to tell without their curlers in. Now, um, Bobby, I know. He was John's receptionist, sweeper-upper and general pain in the... Hello? A salon. Oh, Mrs. Raisin. How are you? Uh, as well as one can be at a funeral. It hasn't really sunk in yet. We've been washed off our feet the past few days. Is the salon still going then? Oh no, it's all boarded up. I'm working at Eve's over the road. Oh yes, the five pound salon. John used to call it the sheep dip and shearing station. That was being kind. The woman who owns it's a slave driver. Oh, I do miss John. Anyway, got to go. There's a lot of my old dears here. I want to persuade them to come to Eve's instead. Ciao for now. Ciao. Um, goodbye. Uh, oh, Lord, don't look now. What is it? You know that feeling you had as a child when you run into the head boy at the tuck shop when you're meant to be doing prep? We obviously went to very different schools. Oh, I see. Afternoon, folks. Hello, Bill. Well, there's a thing. Seeing you two at Mr. Orlando's funeral. Well, that's something you'll never understand. The relationship between a woman and her hairdresser. No. Look, I'll never understand why some women burn their shoes. Anyway, why don't I give you a lift on? Just for a change, I'm going to take you two for a ride. Can I just say, I only came along to keep an eye on Agatha, and I wouldn't dream of interfering in police business. You little sneak. Can I interrupt your private chinwag and ask what I have to do to keep you two at home? I mean, should I buy you a jigsaw? Would that help? There's no law against going to funerals. Or is turning up in intensive care, pretending to be relatives? Oh dear, yeah. Point taken. There's one thing that could stop us interfering. Oh yes? Amaze me. Why don't you tell us what you know? Then we wouldn't need to snoop. I admire your cheek. Well, I'll tell you what I know if you do the same. It'll be in all the papers tomorrow, so this is your hot off the press exclusive. Oh, the front page. Mr. Orlando died due to ricin poisoning. Ricin? Isn't that what killed that Bulgarian chap back in the 70s? You know, shot with an umbrella gun. That's the stuff. It's very popular with terrorists. Anyone can manufacture it if they do a bit of homework. Mm. 
and I think I know how the poison got to him. Oh, yes? He kept a bottle of vitamin pills by his chair. He used to swallow them while he was working. Our forensics are looking into it. They also know he was a blackmailer. I told you, James, I told you. He had affairs with a couple of women and threatened to tell their husbands unless he got so much money. It was a very nasty piece of work. And who inherits his money? They left every single penny to a cat's home. He did have a wife, but they had an acrimonious divorce. She didn't even go to the funeral. So where is the wife? Well, she lives in London. Didn't even know where her husband was these days. It must come as a bit of a shock to her, finding out what her husband was really like. Oh no, you very soon learn when you've married a bad egg. Right. Well, I should drop you off here. And I'll be calling round later with a 5,000 piece jigsaw. Well, Chivers, he may have been a very nasty man, but he did leave all his money to nice little pussycats. Yes, Chivers, and that makes you our number one suspect. She's our only suspect at the moment. If only we knew the names of everyone who was in his salon when he collapsed. I wish I'd stolen his appointment book. Yes, well, you can't commit every crime on the statute books. You have to leave something for the teenagers. I mean, they haven't served an asbo on you. Hold on. The killer didn't have to be in John's salon. She could have been over the road at Eve's. She'd have seen the ambulance, realised the poison had worked, and then gone off and burnt his house down. Agatha, if this mystery is like looking for a needle in a haystack, you've just succeeded in piling on a few more bales. But at least we can get hold of her appointment book, find out who was in her salon. It'll be 25 women whom we've never heard of. Then what do we do? See if one of the names is an anagram of murderer? I think it might be someone we know. Someone who lives in this village. Don't tell me. Mrs. Bloxby, taking revenge for a rather unpleasant perm. I think it was someone who was terrified of John, who ran away from him when we bumped into her in a restaurant. What? Not Mrs. Wendell. She seems to have been avoiding me the past few weeks. I wonder why. Well, she has been a bit busy with her one-woman show, Gilbert and Sullivan's Women. I suspect the one woman refers to the idiot who went to see it. That wasn't a one-woman show. I thought the whole village was involved. In the beginning, it was Gilbert and Sullivan with a cast of thousands, but after six weeks working with her, it became a one-woman show. Mm, well, that explains why we hadn't seen her. Anyway, I don't suppose she's capable of murder. The ghosts of Gilbert and Sullivan might beg to differ. Oh, no! Sorry, ain't no more jokes. It's not that. I just remembered I promised to organise the catering for a wretched show. She'll be furious that I forgot. Yes, and she might be mildly annoyed that you're accusing her of murder. All right. I'll just let the whole thing drop. Though I'll just find out if she was in the salon. Well, Chivers, looks as though you're going to be alone again. And as for my to-do list, well, I just can't have to bury me with it. Oh, hello, Mrs. Raisin. Oh, and you're that, um... What's-his-name? That's right, but you can call me uh, Mr. What's-his-name. Hello, Bobby. Uh, Bobby, I don't mean to be rude, but uh, you don't seem to have many customers. No, it's quiet today. And tomorrow, and the day after that. Bobby, will you stop gassing on your mobile and get that floor cleaned? Oh, I didn't realise we had customers. Sorry, we're not actually customers as such. We just wanted to make an inquiry. Oh, yes. Well, a friend of ours had the most wonderful haircut. It takes years off her. But she's refusing to say where she had it done, and I'm desperate to find out. What has that got to do with me? Oh, she could have had it done here. Oh, yes. I suppose so. Uh, I got a photograph of her here from a, a recent production of the Mikado. Of course, she doesn't usually have a kimono on or the knitting needles in her hair. <laughs> Let's have a look. Gwendolyn Wendell has them rolling in the aisles. No, she doesn't ring any bells. She would have had it done on Saturday, 1st of July. Oh, well, of course, I wasn't here then. The shop opened in June, but I only moved in last week. If you like, I'll check my appointment book. Oh, thank you. Has there ever been a worse form of musical torture than the pan pipes? <laughs> I've half a mind to phone Amnesty International. Perhaps that explains the absence of customers. Yes, coming here would be like sitting in a lift being tormented with curling tongs. <laughs> yes, you're right. She came in here on 1st of July at 2.30. Oh, that helped. Thank you. Now that is very, very interesting. Oh, 
Lacey, Mrs. Raisin. Come in and put your feet up on my Algerian poofs. Ah, well, thank you. Mrs. Wendell, can I just say I am so sorry I forgot your savouries. As soon as I got to Tidlington Village Hall, I had a sinking feeling. The but absence it was... of sausage rolls was a sad loss in an otherwise exquisite theatrical experience. Did you at least enjoy the concert? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, it was a, a, a musical extravaganza unlike any other. Where did you sit? Somewhere near the back. And which bits did you like the most? Oh, the uh, Gilbert and Sullivan bits. It was all Gilbert and Sullivan. The name of the show was Gwendolyn Wendell Sings Gilbert and Sullivan. Well, then I enjoyed all of it. You're too kind. Uh, Mrs. Wendell, uh, apart from the concert, we really haven't seen you around recently, which is strange in a small village. Well, there is a reason I've been staying indoors, but I don't see why I should tell you. We're extremely keen to find out. Oh, well, then... I've been having some rather unpleasant side effects from my hormone replacement therapy, if you really want to know. Actually, perhaps we didn't. Oh, I read about that. Apparently a lot of women get hair on their chin. There's no need to draw attention to it. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean you. I just Mrs. meant Mrs. That... Wendell, we were rather surprised you didn't make it to John Orlando's funeral. Well, why should I? The man gave me one bad haircut a year ago. I don't think I owe him a wreath. No, of course. You go to the place over the road. What? Eves, that's where you have it done. No, I don't. I cut my own hair. I've never heard of Eves. That's strange, because you went there on Saturday the 1st of July. You sat facing the street, and at three o'clock you saw an ambulance arrive, and John Orlando was carried into it. So this was your golden opportunity to destroy every bit of dirt he had on you. <gasps> so you ran from the salon, and you set fire to his house. Mrs. Raisin, I've said it before, but you really should write crime fiction. Though it's unfortunate you share your name with the greatest writer who ever lived and a type of dried fruit. Oh, for God's sake, stop pretending. I was there. I saw you do it. Mrs. Raisin, I have my reasons for hating John Orlando, but I don't think you can accuse me of his murder. On the 1st of July, I was, in fact, giving my all at Tidlington Village Hall in the Gilbert and Sullivan show, and you were supposed to be in the audience. Oh, um, I think when we said we were in the audience, what we really meant to say was uh, we weren't. I guessed as much. Now, will you leave, please? I have a souffle in my agar in imminent danger of deflation. She knows more than she's saying, but for some reason she won't let us in. Indeed, not by the hair on her chinny-chin-chin. Chin. Look, I didn't mean to draw attention to it. Anyway, she'll thank me for it one day. Yes, she'll probably send you a card. It's oh so nice to know you care by pointing out my facial hair. Well, we know it wasn't the bearded lady. So we're right back to square one. Oh, no, we're not. I want to know why Eve, if that's her real name, lied to us. She claimed Mrs. Wendell was a customer. It doesn't take much working out. We told her that our friend had a wonderful haircut, and we wanted to know who did it. She naturally decides she'll take the credit in the hope of getting more business. Or there's another possibility. She had something to do with John's death, and she guessed that's what we were investigating, so she's only too happy to send us up a blind alley. But she wasn't even in the salon that day. Of course she was. Nobody sets up a business, then waits six weeks to get involved. She was lurking behind the smoke glass windows, waiting for the right moment. Well, look. If you do have this theory, I really feel you should go through the proper channels. Proper channels? Me? Bill Wong said any information should go straight to him. Oh, sod, Bill. We haven't even had a whiff of that jigsaw. Agatha, you are not to go rushing in. Rushing in? Yes, as in fools rush in. Look, Bill knows my instincts are razor sharp. That's why he always wants to know my latest theory. No, Agatha, that isn't the reason. What? He listens to you because he's obliged to, because he's a public servant. If someone phones up to say they know the killer because they saw it in a dream, the police still have to put it in the logbook. I get the feeling I'm on my own on this one. You're not on your own. I'm coming with you. To stop you making a blithering idiot of yourself. Well, I don't want you to. If there's two of us, we're going to intimidate her. I'm going in alone. <sighs> All right, then. I'll go to the police station and tell Bill Wong. James, when did you go from being the naughty boy in the tuck shop to the boring head prefect? I think it was when I grew up. All right. Well... I'll go to the salon, and you can listen in by mobile phone. I'll keep the line open, and you can wait round the corner on the high street. But what if I bump into Bill Wong? 
You can say, Hello, Bill. Agatha's having a haircut. Oh, hello, Mrs. Raisin. We were just about to shut up shop. Oh, dear. There's no way that Eve could just squeeze me in, is there? I don't see why not. It'll stop her scissors from going rusty. Evie, we've got a customer. Thanks. Your husband not with you? Well, no. James isn't my husband. Is he not? No. People often think that because we argue so much. But no, we're just good friends. Oh, I thought he seemed a bit old for you. I imagine you go for someone with a bit more oomph. I just go and see where she's got to. James, if you heard that, I'm so, so sorry. Don't mention it. It's all right, Bobby. You can go now. Thanks, I'll see you tomorrow. What? Oh, yes, of course you will. Bye, Mrs. Raisin. Uh, bye. I'll just lock up, in case we get any more customers. Can I take your jacket, Mrs. Um, Raisin? Oh, thank you. Well, what can I do you for? Just a wash and blow dry. If you'd like to come this way, please. Have a seat. Thank you. So, how's business? Not bad. Takes a little while to establish yourself. Oh, I know. I was with Mr Orlando for three years. He was an absolute wizard with hair. Well, you know. I'm not so sure he was the wizard that everyone says he was. If you ask me, your current hairstyle is well, absolutely no shape to it. Now, if you'd just like to tip your head back. Is that too hot for you? No, then, no, that's lovely. Oh, good. I want everything to be just perfect. Hey, Mr. Orlando used to do it. <laughs> do you like conditioner? Uh, uh, yes, please. Shampoo I'm using is Indian watercress. All our products are available to buy at the end of your appointment. And, oh, oh I'm so sorry. That's quite all right. You, you don't have any cats, do you? Uh, just the one. Oh, it's just I'm allergic. Really? I'm afraid so. Well, it must have been very galling when your husband left all his money to a cat's home. What? I just want to know the truth about John. I won't tell the police, I won't tell anybody, but I need to know for my own peace of mind and then you can move on, as I suspect you're already planning to do. I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, for God's sake. I saw you do it. I saw you swapping the vitamin pills. I saw you set fire to his house. I know who you are. You're Mrs. Orlando, his ex-wife. Well, that just shows how little you know. His real name wasn't Orlando. It was Morecambe. John Morecambe? Mm, doesn't quite have the same je ne sais quoi. He always did have delusions of adequacy. He said he was the world's greatest hairdresser. And ah, he wasn't worthy to wash his towels. He did have a bit of an arrogant streak. Mm, it wasn't just the affairs and the abuse. He said that I was a terrible hairdresser. When we split up, we set up rival salons in Worcester. But he poisoned people's minds against me. He drove all my customers away. Well, which of us is the successful hairdresser now? Thank you. And I promise your secret is safe. It'll go no further than this room. Oh, no. You're not trying that one. You're not getting out of here. Oh, oh. Uh, James! <laughs> James! Shouts all you like. The windows are tough and glass. James, help, help me! I'm arresting you on one charge of murder and one of attempted murder. No! I'm not going to say anything. Agatha! James, what uh, took you so long? I had to go and get Bill. I oh. couldn't hear a word of your conversation. What? You know when she hung up your jacket? Yes. Your mobile phone was in it for oh. ten minutes. It's been hanging on a hook underneath a speaker. All I could hear was the flaming pan pipes. Yes, Chivers, I have just been attacked by a psychopath, but don't worry, you'll get your tea as soon as I've stopped shaking. Hello, Chivers. You'll be pleased to know that you're no longer a suspect. 
You only killed evil mice and horrible hairy sparrows. Well, Bill <laughs> Wong was furious with me. He wants me to come to the police station as soon as I'm cleaned up. And he says if I interfere in police business again, he'll have me arrested. I'm not surprised, Agatha. They were probably on to her anyway. Yes, and they would have gone to arrest her the day after she left the country. Agatha, has it ever occurred to you that you're too old for this sort of lark? Oh, yes. Too old and nowhere near enough oomph. You've still got shampoo in your hair. Fine. I'll go and wash it out. Chivers, I have no idea what you have for dinner. Probably the finest smoked salmon, knowing Agatha. But you'll just have to wait till she's washed her hair. <laughs> I expect you're happy to have her back in one piece. God knows it would kill me if anything happened to her. <coughs> Agatha! Agatha! <laughs> James! <laughs> What's happened to your hair? What does it look like? It's all fallen out. Oh. That wasn't shampoo she used. It was a depilatory. Oh, poor thing, you poor, poor thing. Oh, hold me, James. Agatha, perhaps there should be a warning to you not to get involved in... I said hold me, not scold me. Well, someone has to scold you, since you seem incapable of keeping away from danger. Oh, for God's sake, why didn't you go home and finish your to-do list? Actually, I, I've already finished my to-do list. There's, there's only one thing I want to do, only I I have to ask your permission first. James, what are you doing on the floor? Have you lost something? Yes, Agatha. I lost it quite some time ago. Hello? Roy, it's me. Aggie. Well, what's new in the world of clotted cream and cow parts? James has just asked me to marry him. What? And was he definitely sober this time? Of course he was sober. And did you get it in writing? Some things you don't need in writing. Everyone's so happy. Mrs Bloxby says it's the best thing to happen for years. Bill Wong says he just hopes James can keep me out of mischief. Aggie, I hate to say it, but you don't sound very cheerful. I know. You see, there's just one little problem. In Agatha Raisin, Penelope Keith starred as Agatha and Malcolm Sinclair was James. DC Wong was played by Stephen Hogan and Mrs Wendell by Tina Gray. With James Holmes as Roy, Faye Rusling as Eve and Matthew Carter as Bobby. Agatha Raisin was dramatised by David Semple from the novel by M.C. Beaton and the producer was Carol Smith. Agatha Raisin by M.C. Beaton, dramatised for radio by David Semple and starring Penelope Keith as Agatha. The murderous marriage. So, Aggie, you're finally marrying Mr. Wright. Roy, I keep telling you, there's a problem. Well, bound to be. I mean, it's like a car that's been left in the garage for some years. It can be ever so hard to get it started up again. I don't have that many miles on the clock. Anyway, we have been for a test drive, and I'm pleased to say the bodywork can still cope with some dangerous bends. Oh, good, because I was going to say there's always antifreeze. Roy, my problem is that I'm already married. What? Oh, uh... Roy, are you all right? No, I'm not, actually. I've just spilt my frappuccino down the front of my brand new Dolce & Gabbana. Twenty-five years ago, I walked out on my husband. It had all been a bit of a whirlwind romance. When we finally stopped spinning, I realised it had been the biggest mistake of my life. We had absolutely nothing in common. I wanted a career. He wanted a human punch bag. Oh, Aggie. So did you get a divorce? I didn't think I needed one. I mean, my view on marriage was been there, done that, never again. And I didn't think Jimmy would even notice I was gone. The man was in a permanent alcoholic stupor. It was like being married to a beer mat. So, where is he now? Well, that's the thing. Nobody knows. I mean, I assume he's dead. 
After I left, he went downhill fast. He was last seen living in Cardboard City, but he must have gone to that great Doss house in the sky by now. Oh, you're always such a ray of sunshine, aren't you? So presumably the wedding's off until you know for sure. Uh, no, that's just the thing. It's all going ahead on the 25th of October. But you can't get married to James if your first husband's still out there marinating his liver. Look, I just have to. I can't risk losing James. I've waited nearly four years for him to propose. If he finds out about Jimmy, he'll head for the hills. Well, surely it's better he finds out before the big day rather than on it. I mean, I prefer my wedding photos to be bridegroom and bride rather than groom, groom, and bride being led to a police car. Roy, I've got to take the risk. How do you think I became a successful businesswoman? I know it's a gamble, but the sensible thing is to just press ahead and pray that he's dead. Oh, that's ever so sensible. Have you ever heard of a word called bigamy? It's in the dictionary between balmy and bonkers. Hang on. When did James actually propose? Oh, um, three months ago. So why have you only just told me? Because I knew what you'd say. What would I say? Don't do it. And that's still what I'm saying. Yes, but it's too late now. On top of everything else, I'm selling my house. No, not your dear little cottage. The lovely laburnum tree standing in a bed of cigarette butts. I want to move in with James. And with the sale of the cottage, we'll have the most wonderful life together. We'll be able to travel, see the world, eat in all the best restaurants. Well, just make sure when you leave these restaurants, you don't step over your other husband lying in the gutter. Look, he's got to be dead. He's just got to be. Wanting someone dead doesn't necessarily mean they are. Well, quite a few of my exes would be pushing up daisies. Well, that's where I want to ask a favour. I want you to go round Cardboard City and find out for sure. See if you can find anyone who knows what happened to Jimmy. Oh, what a treat. I love meeting winos in cardboard boxes. In fact, if he's not dead, I'll probably marry him myself. Uh, coming! Uh, got to go. Someone coming to look at the house. Aggie, please. This is the worst mistake since the captain of the Titanic said, no, go ahead, it's only an iceberg. Uh, thank you for your support. Goodbye. I'm just coming. Oh, Chivers, leave the wallpaper alone. I'm trying to sell this place. Oh, it's you. Good morning to you too, Mrs. Raisin. Uh, Mrs. Wendell, sorry, I was waiting for someone to look at the house. Well, wait no longer. I come with just that very purpose. But you only live round the corner. I know, but I've recently begun a new hobby. Buying up ruined old properties and turning them into something special. Well, I've spent five years ruining this place for just such an occasion. Uh, do you want to come in? I most certainly do. I have no wish to buy a pig in a poke. Well, you can come in then and poke to your heart's content. Oh, oh. Mrs. Raisin, I feel inspired. I mean, strip away the fixtures and furnishings and you've got quite a bit of potential. And just think what could be done by someone with taste. I'm trying not to. Um, are you planning to sell your own cottage? Oh, no. You don't expect me to live here, do you? No, I see this as an investment opportunity. Really? Yes. I shall convert your house into a small hotel. But, um, there are only two bedrooms. Yes. Perhaps the bon mot is not so much petite as bijou. I shall get a proper designer in to do it. Do you know Roger from the cottage on the other side? I can't say I've had the pleasure. Oh, he's such a sweet boy. At first I thought he was gay, but it turns out no, he's just Welsh. But um, don't you need a safety certificate and fire escape? Details, Mrs. Raisin, details. And this is a very good time to get into the hospitality industry. You see, Sainsbury's has a special offer on croissants. Oh, yes. Um, perhaps you'd like a look around. Indeed. Hello, Chivers. I see you've got a lot of clothes hanging about. Are you lacking in closet space? No. Actually, I'm just uh, choosing my wedding outfit. Oh, the wedding. Oh, well, I can see that dress is an old favourite. Of course, I am unable to attend. I shall be giving my Lady Windermere's fan to the people of Prendergast. Well, I only hope they find a use for it. <clears throat> it's a funny thing, Mrs. Raisin. Yes? 
I was speaking to the Reverend Bloxby, and he seemed to think you were a widow, but I always thought you were a divorcee. Uh, no. No, the Reverend Bloxby's right. Really? How long have you been a widow? The normal amount of time. Um, a few years. Oh, how peculiar. Oh, well then, my mistake. There's some change, please. There's some change. There's best some change, please. Hello. Huh? Who are you? My name is Roy. Look, do you mind if I sit down for a minute? I'm absolutely exhausted from tram uh, walking the streets for the past six hours. But, um, I wonder if you can help me. I'm looking for a gentleman of the road by the name of Jimmy Razor. Jimmy? <laughs> And uh, there's a blast from the past. What makes you think I might know? Well, I was thinking he might be a colleague of yours. I mean, you might have slept together. I mean, I'm not suggesting there was anything sexual, obviously. Although, maybe there was. It, it's not for me to say. Oh, perhaps I do know, Jimmy. Oh, what's it worth? All right. Uh, will you tell me for five pounds? Make it ten. Oh, you drive a hard bargain. Um, five and seven, eight, nine, ten. There you go. Yes. I know. I know, Jimmy. I kind of guessed that. But um, can you tell me where he is? Aye. Well? Ah, that'll cost you extra. Honestly. Look, that's all I've got, I promise. Aye. I knew, Jimmy. I knew Jimmy very well, <laughs> but he doesn't live here anymore. So where is he living? Uh, you see that big building over there? Oh, that sort of great big glass blancmange. Yeah, uh, that's the one. Well, Jimmy's got to live on that. Oh, is it a dropout centre? I, 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 I mean, um, drop in. Aye, uh, something like that. But <laughs> I wouldn't he go there? I wouldn't he go there if you paid me? <laughs> Well, uh, thanks for the information. I'd best be going. Uh, hang on a wee minute. Who are you, by the way? I told you, my name's Roy. No, uh, uh, are you the police or the, or the social? No, actually, I'm a public relations executive. Oh, I used to work in PR. Did you? Oh, lovely. Now I know what I've got to look forward to. At this point, the bride passes her bouquet to the matron of honor. Ah, oh, um, here you are, Mrs. Bloxby. Oh, thank you very much. And the best man sits. <laughs> oh, where has DC Wong got to? Oh, Lord, I think he popped out to answer his mobile. <laughs> Sorry about that. Chief Inspector having a bit of bother with joyriders. Really? Now, the congregation sits, and I... Oh. If there's one thing ruins the ambiance of a 17th century church, uh, it's 21st century technology. I, I, I think that would be your phone, dear. Really? Oh, mm. oh. Uh, <laughs> yes. Ah, yes, it would. <laughs> yes. Um, the Reverend Blobsby. Oh, I can't wait to get the flowers organised. We're decorating the altar this evening on a theme of mists and mellow fruitfulness. So uh, uh, I've got the Carsley mm. Ladies Society scouting round the hedgerows looking for pine cones. Oh, well, marvellous. <laughs> I mean, it's always such a shame when they're just swept into the garden. Oh, yes. <laughs> There's something I keep forgetting to ask you, Mrs. Reason. Yes? Well, I was talking to the Reverend Bloxby, and he says you still haven't managed to get hold of your husband's death certificate. Uh, no, not yet. But as you know, the circumstances of his death were somewhat unfortunate. Mm. Well, if it was anyone else, that would be a problem. But I do trust you implicitly. And have you sorted out your honeymoon yet? Oh, oh yes. We're off to Corsica. Sun, oh. sand, and a bracing stroll to Napoleon's birthplace. Oh. <laughs> uh, just as soon as the sale of my cottage goes through. Yeah. A little bird told me Mrs. Wendell was buying your house. Oh. Mm. A little bird told the truth. Oh, how lovely. Oh, that will be nice. You'll have Mrs. Wendell living next door to you. Yes, we'll have Mrs. Wendell living next door to us. I must say, it, it, it's the most marvellous time of year to be getting married. I mean, it's just to the point when it all seems so grey on autumnal. And suddenly, I feel as if it's springtime. Oh. No, no, really, it's all so exciting. I find it quite hard to finish my breakfast some mornings. <gasps> oh, what? Mrs. What? Reason, are you all right? Oh, uh, Mrs. Bloxby, I don't know if you've noticed, but there's a large brown rat oh. Oh. just uh, oh, yes. underneath oh. the communion oh, rail. Oh, there, yes. oh, there is. I told Alf there were some strange marks in the communion wafers. 
Still, at least it's a Church of England. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, perhaps you want to get hold of Renekill? Oh, yes, yeah. straight away. I mean, it would be awful if something like that turned up in the middle of Mrs. Raisin's wedding. <laughs> <laughs> Raisin. Mm, raisin. Ra oh, of course, you mean Jimmy. That's the one. Yes, Jimmy Raisin. One of our success stories. Uh, do you know, when we met Jim, he was in a bad way. Oh, but now he's off the drink, taking pride in his appearance, and he's even got a little job in the local library. So you mean he's alive? Yes. He wouldn't be awfully good as a librarian if he were dead. No, I suppose not. Did you say you wanted to see him? Oh, if it's not too much trouble. Um, I think it's wonderful what you do with these, um, these, um... People? That's the word. And you're a relative, are you? Um, no, a friend of a friend of a friend sort of thing. We only just found out that he was a homeless. I mean, a homeless person. Or a person with homelessness. Uh, uh, and why exactly did you want to visit him? to tell him that we care. Right. Well, um, Jimmy's not in the best of health, so I'd rather you didn't stay too long. Hmm? Uh, but if you'd like to follow me... Lovely. Ah, oh, Jimmy. Oh, hello there. Uh, you've uh, got a visitor here. Roy. Have I now? Oh, that's nice. Hello there, Jimmy. Long time no see. Yes. In fact, I can't remember when I last saw you. Right. Uh, well, I'll leave you two alone, shall I? Ah, uh, thanks, Martin. <laughs> Thank you. So, who the hell are you? Um, my name is Roy, but that's not important. I'm here on behalf of a woman called Agatha Razor. Do you remember her? You used to be married to her. Oh, no. There's no use to be. Me and Agatha are still married. Hello? Aggie, do you want the good news or the bad? Good news. Jimmy Raisin's only got six weeks to live. Oh. And the bad? He wants to come and visit you. What? Apparently, he read about your forthcoming nuptials in the Daily Telegraph. Jimmy wouldn't read the Telegraph. No, but he has been known to sleep under it. You don't get the same warmth under a tabloid. Oh, James would have to put an announcement in the one remaining broadsheet. He, um, he seems quite a nice chap, really. And I think he still carries a torch for you. I do not need to hear that. But, I mean, he's not likely to make it to the Cotswolds in his condition, is he? Oh, can you imagine the consequences if he did? Especially on your wedding day. Look, it's not going to end up that way, because on the big day, you will be outside the church on sentry duty. And if Jimmy turns up... Aggie, Aggie. I hate to say it, but I can't actually come to your wedding. What? Well, my mum's going to be in hospital. She's having a hip replacement. She's been waiting over a year. One year? I've been waiting nearly five years for my wedding. Well, let's just hope it's not like waiting for a bus. You wait five years for a husband, and then two come along. Oh, Mrs. Raisin, I can hardly believe it's finally happening. I mean, all that planning and the big day is finally here. Yes. I mean, I know you and James have been so close for so long, but I just thought he was a confirmed old bachelor married to the Daily Telegraph crossword. I know. But you have done the most wonderful thing. You followed your heart, you found happiness, you've made a miracle happen. Mrs. Bloxley. Yes. Please stop talking. Oh, right. Welcome, everyone, to the joining together in matrimony of two of our village's most colourful characters, Colonel James Lacey and Mrs Agatha Raisin. It's so good to see so many people here today. If you could all, perhaps, shuffle along your queues, there should be plenty of room for everyone. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. In the presence of uh, God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we have come together to witness... Who is that? 
So, you decided to start without me, did you? Who is this man? Nobody. Ah, this is all a very pretty sight. Much more impressive than our day at Dagenham Town Hall. Agatha, what's going on? Is this some sort of practical joke? I only wish it was, James. Well, if it's not a joke, you've got an awful lot of explaining to do. Ladies and gentlemen, the ceremony will adjourn for a few moments. May I ask Mrs. Asquith to play us some suitable music? <coughs> So, let me get this straight. You're saying you used to be married to Mrs. Reason? Oh, no. Me and Aggie are still married. And I've even got the piece of paper to prove it. Agatha, you said that he was dead. And I thought he was. Years ago, I heard he was back on the bottle, sleeping rough. He didn't have long to live. But it's always just as well to check. Oh, James, I'm sorry. Agatha, you have just made a complete fool of me in front of the entire village and tell me the worst kind of lie imaginable. I don't think sorry is really good enough. I didn't know, James. I thought he was dead. Well, I don't know if this is the right time to say it, but in the eyes of the law, ignorance is no defence. No, Alf, it is not the right time to say it. Mrs. Raisin made a mistake that her marriage had clearly broken down, so there's no reason why she shouldn't get a divorce, and, and perhaps you and James could marry at a registry office. Actually, Mrs. Bloxby, there is a reason. Because there's a little thing called trust. And when that is gone, you can't marry someone. Not today, tomorrow, or any other day. Ah, oh, don't upset yourself, Agatha. All is not lost. You've still got me. Get off me! Look, here's some money so you can get back to whatever hole you crawled out of. Well, how about a little kiss for the journey? I could kill you, Jimmy. I could kill you for what you've done to me. That's enough, Agatha. Now, I think you've done what you came here for, sir, and if I could just take a statement, then one of my men would escort you back to London. Is that so, officer? And aren't you going to arrest this woman? That is no concern to you whatsoever. Um, perhaps we could just slip out the back door and, and pop along to the vicarage and discuss all this a bit more calmly. We've got nothing to discuss. The wedding is off. And if they do choose to arrest you, Agatha, don't count on me as a character witness. James! I didn't mean it to end up like this. Look, excuse me, everybody. I really do feel we should send everyone home. And tell Mrs. Asquith she can stop playing now. Oh, it's you. Uh, yes, Mrs. Wendell, it's me. I don't know if you've heard. I have indeed. The news of your behaviour has spread through the countryside like foot and mouth disease. Yes, well, as you can imagine, right now, James doesn't want to be under the same roof as me. Well, I can't say I'm surprised. Still, hopefully one day he'll pick up the pieces and start anew with someone worthy of him. Yes, well, right now there's just the small problem of where I'm going to live, and I was wondering could I possibly stay on in my cottage? Oh, Mrs. Raisin, of course you can stay. Thank you. Thank you so much. That'll be £50 per person per night, plus a £200 deposit. No, I meant, can I buy my cottage back? Oh, I think not, Mrs. Raisin. You may see this place as a house, but to me it's more like a goose. A goose, Mrs. Wendell? A goose that's laying golden eggs. Now, you're welcome to stay, so long as you abide by my rules. Number one, no gentleman callers. I have my reputation to think of. I mean, it chills me to the bone to think I'll be having a bigamist in my back bedroom. Still, I shall boil wash the sheets in the morning. Well, I could always sleep on the floor. Rule two, breakfast is at eight o'clock sharp. It's a toasted croissant with conserves and marmalade and a soupçon of café au lait. Oh, good. Nothing like a full English. Number three, no pets. There's only room for one puss puss in this house, and my Himalayan long hair must have priority. Come along. the answer phone of James Lacey. Please leave a message. 
Uh, James, it's me. And I realise right now you'd rather have your tongue torn out than talk to me, but please believe me. I didn't want this to happen. I thought Jimmy was dead. He's certainly been dead to me for 25 years, but I was terrified of losing you, and I'll do anything I can to put things right between us. Chippers? Oh, Chippers. Has James kicked you out as well? You can stay here tonight if you're very quiet. This isn't our house anymore. It's Mrs. Wendell's bed and breakfast come prisoner of war camp. That's right. You curl up on the bed. Nothing can stop you sleeping. But I'm going for a walk. Okay, God, so it's the middle of the night and I'm stuck in a field and even if I do find my way out, I've lost everything I ever care for. Well, is there any way you could squeeze just a little bit more misery? Could you make me suffer just a little bit more? Oh, thank you so much. Oh, oh no, Agatha, it's a small one. Jimmy! What the hell are you doing here? Well, that's not very nice. And I made so much effort to come up and see you. You made my life hell 30 years ago, and as soon as I found a better one, you came to destroy that as well. You should never have walked out on me. And you shouldn't have done the things you did. I never laid a finger on you. The bruises have gone, Jimmy, but the memories won't fade. Ah, oh, don't be like that. I had to walk 80 miles to get here, you know. Sleeping in ditches, eating whatever the bin man left behind. So, how's about a kiss for your ever-loving husband? Get off me! Ooh. Hello? Mrs. Raisin. Firstly, good morning. Secondly, may I say oh. that your breakfast is now on the compost heap. Never mind, your loss is the earthworm's gain. Fair enough. Thirdly, I seem to remember telling you there were no pets at this establishment. Well, either that's a cat on the lower part of your anatomy, or you really do need to get your legs waxed. Chivers managed to climb up the drain pipe. Still, I'm sure you can always put up an electrified fence. And fourthly, the Mercedeshire police are here to see you. What? Bill Wong, you know, and um, WPC something or other. What do they want? Well, you know, I think it might be something to do with the attempted bigamy. Either that or they're holding a village fete and they want to use your wedding dress as a raffle prize. Bill, can I just say I'm so sorry. Good morning, Mrs. Raisin. This is WPC Heard. Hello. I don't have any excuse. I know what I did was wrong. Really? Yes, and I'm actually looking forward to prison. You really mean that? Indeed. After eight hours staying with Mrs. Wendell, all I can say is hooray for Holloway. Well, yes. Yeah, Mrs. Wendell, we will let you know if and when we need you. Oh, all right. I'll, I'll just get on with the dustbin. Mrs. Reason, what are you actually confessing to? Attempted bigamy. I thought Jimmy was dead. Right. Now, is that all you're admitting to? Well, what were you hoping for? That I abducted Lord Lucan? That I made wallpaper paste out of Shergar? <laughs> Did you leave a message last night on the answer phone of Mr. James Lacey? Well, yes. If I'd popped round, I'd only have had the door slammed in my face, and I didn't much fancy a broken nose. And what exactly did you say in this answer phone message? Well, oh, I don't remember every word, but I think the underlying theme was I'm sorry. Did you perhaps use the words, I'll do anything I can to put things right? Well, now you've come to mention it. Bill, what's all this about? One yeah. hour after making that call, you were observed by a local farmer having an altercation with Mr. Jimmy Raisin. Well, yes, I was. And I think I shoved him into a ditch. What did you expect me to do? Help him make a daisy chain? Shortly after this altercation, Jimmy Raisin was found dead. Do you have any explanation for this? No. No, it can't be. Agatha Raisin, believe me, I really don't want to do this, but... Hold on. What? That, 
That's him. That's him in that photograph. Which photograph, Mrs Raisin? The photograph on the television. That's Jimmy. Agatha, that is a photograph of Mr Norman Wendell, Mrs Wendell's late husband. But it's Jimmy. Can't you see? We can see very clearly, and that is not Jimmy Raisin. That is Norman Wendell. I knew him extremely well, and he died nearly five years ago. It can't be. It's Jimmy. But what's he doing on Mrs Wendell's television? She's obviously playing for time. No. Agatha Raisin, I am arresting you for the murder of Jimmy Raisin. You do not have to say anything, but it may harm your defence if you... Bill, don't... no! I'm innocent! In Agatha Raisin, Penelope Keith starred as Agatha, and Malcolm Sinclair was James. Mrs Bloxby was played by Liza Sadovy, and DC Wong by Stephen Hogan. James Holmes was Roy, Tina Gray, Mrs Wendell, John Rogan was Jimmy, and Tim Whitnell was Martin. Agatha Raisin was dramatised by David Semple, from the novel by M.C. Beaton, and the producer was Carol Smith. Agatha Raisin by M.C. Beaton, dramatised for radio by David Semple, and starring Penelope Keith as Agatha. The Disappearing Trick. Yes, Chivers, I know I've been neglecting you, but you do only get one phone call from police custody. Oh, Mrs Raisin. It must have been such an ordeal. It was indeed, Mrs Bloxby. Especially going without cigarettes for 24 hours. <sighs> Still... All that matters is getting my name cleared and the charges dropped. Oh, well, you're welcome to stay at the vicarage for as long as that takes. Oh, thank you. And thanks for looking after Chivers. Oh, it's no trouble at all. She's the perfect house guest. And every morning she brings us a nice dead squirrel for breakfast. Oh, Chivers. <laughs> now, do help yourself to some toasted tea cakes and some homemade hawthorn jelly. Is it made with actual hawthorns? That's right. We're putting together a little cookbook at the Lady Society full of recipes you can make from things you find in the hedgerow. What a pity all I ever find is dead bodies. Oh, Mrs Raisin, I I'm so sorry. I, I wasn't thinking. It's all right. It was a very short-lived marriage. And I hadn't seen Jimmy for quite a few years. Oh, well. Oh, I do hope they find who did it soon. And then your name can be cleared. Well, I can't wait around for the police to solve things. I'm off to London at the weekend to find out a bit about Jimmy's final day. Oh, Mrs Raisin, do be careful. It isn't safe in London. Although, obviously, it's not always safe around here. Quite. <laughs> Though, don't worry. I will have Roy with me. Oh, well, at least you've got someone to keep an eye on you. Yes, Roy can be deadly. Especially if you spill his Malibu and pineapple. <laughs> so... Where exactly will you be going? Well, we're heading for a drop-in centre that Jimmy used to visit. Yes, but hold on. Won't they know you've been charged with his murder? Ah. Well, uh, oh, I'll have to think of a pseudonym, won't I? Yeah. But um, before all that, I really need to talk to James. Although I know right now I'm the last person he wants to see. Oh, yes, James. What's the matter? Um, he came round this morning uh, when you were sleeping. He said he was off to stay with his sister for a few days in, in Greenwich. Oh, I see. So I get arrested for murder and he goes swanning off to see his sister. Well, it has all been a shock for him, too. Oh, he did leave me the keys to his cottage and he said you could stay there just until he got back. Oh, I wouldn't dare go into his perfect cottage. I mean, he's so pernickety. The slightest bit of fag ash on his carpet and he has a fit. Oh, dear. So I shall be heading straight for London, which means, Mrs Bloxby, you've got dead squirrel on the menu for a little while longer. Right, Aggie, walk this way and let me do the talking. As long as you don't get arrested for indecent exposure. What's that supposed to mean? Well, just because we're going to a homeless centre, do you have to dress like a Dickensian street urchin? Right, Sarah, if you could take these to the laundry, please. Hello. Oh, uh, hello. Do I know you? We met a few weeks ago. My name's Roy Silver. Oh, of course. Uh, you were an old friend of Jimmy's. Uh, and this would be... This is my mum, Mrs Silver. We came to pay our condolences and uh, to give your organisation a small donation. Oh. Huh. 
not as small as all that. <laughs> well, we know you did such wonderful things for Jimmy in his final days. Uh, what exactly was your connection with Jimmy Raisin? Well, we... Mother knew him years ago when they used to work in Fleet Street. Oh, I'd forgotten Jimmy used to work in newspapers. It's ironic he ended up sleeping in them. Well, uh, he could have written some interesting stories about his final years. If he'd only been well enough to write them down. Really? And uh, what stories would these be? Mrs Silver, I don't normally divulge information about our clients, but as he is a client no longer, Jimmy was extremely popular around here. What are you trying to say? Was he some sort of cardboard city Casanova? I mean, he was very good at getting people into his confidence. He had the kind of face that said, the confession light is on, please come in. And he became a kind of agony uncle to a lot of our clients. But how much of the agony was caused by him? Exactly. If you told him a bit too much, he could turn from confessor to executioner. Are you saying he used to blackmail people? Well, as you can imagine, most of the people who use this place are on benefits. But the odd one or two may do a bit of work cash in hand. And Jimmy would see to it that he always got his cut. Or else the DSS found out. Oh, charming. Nothing like stealing a crust of bread from the starving. I did everything I could for Jimmy. Made sure he was clean and well fed and looked after. But he wasn't exactly grateful. So if it was possible for the world to find out what kind of person he was, that would suit me down to the ground. Well, what goes around comes around. It seems at the end, Jimmy was just the same man I knew and loathed. Aggie? Yes? The sister of James. Oh, yes? Do you know where she lives? Yes, I do. As soon as I moved in with James, I copied his address book into my file of facts. You know, you can take being a control freak a bit too far. It comes when you start copying out all your partner's personal details into your diary. You never know when you might need them. Indeed. So, um, shall we pay them a little visit? No, absolutely not. I'm trying not to think about James. I'm oh, having his Sunday lunch right now. I wonder what it is. No, 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 he's better off without me. He's probably having a whale of a time. Now he hasn't got me to boss him about. James, are you actually going to eat that? No, I don't know. I just thought I'd slide it around my plate for a little longer. I did go to a lot of effort to make it. Harriet, I do appreciate all the effort you're making, my constant cups of tea, and, and the effort to pair me up with Bunty at the Bridge Club. Well, she's a very nice girl. Yeah, that woman has the personal hygiene of a warthog, a laugh like a hyena, and the appetite of a gannet. Frankly, her ideal partner would be David Attenborough. It's her, isn't it? Oh, Lord. You're letting that woman have power over you. She broke your heart, and now, thanks to her, you're all skin and bone. Yes, well, those are two of the major constituents of the human body. Look, James, you really need to move on. So why do you keep going on about her? Well, why won't you have anything to eat? Uh, well, that could be multiple reasons. Perhaps I'm simply not in the mood for monkfish. Look, it's only been a week. You can't expect me to just snap out of it. Oh! Honestly. Well, if that's the Jehovah's Witnesses, I shall tell them I'm a Satanist. Yes? Hello. Yes. Um, is, is, um, is James Lacey there? Who wants to know? Agatha Raisin. I mean, uh, that's not me, obviously. She's waiting in the car. Oh, the brazen Mrs. Raisin. Well, I always knew she was the Wicked Witch of the East, so I'm not surprised she sends munchkins to do her dirty work. What's going on, Harriet? Who, who's... Oh. It's you. Yes, James, it's me. Well, I don't suppose you've come round to borrow a cup of sugar? No, I've come here to tell you that you really need to have a word with Agatha. Uh, do I indeed? And what's there to talk about? Well, she wants to say sorry and to find out how you really feel about her. Really? Well, I'd have thought the fact that I've just moved 80 miles away from her might give some sort of clue. Well said, James. Now push off, you horrible little man. Look, I'm not going till you promise to talk to Aggie. Get your foot out of my door. You're ruining my beautiful Farrow and Hall paintwork. Well, you're not doing much for my fabulous Prada trainers. It's all right, Harriet. You can put him down. I think I'm the one you want to strangle. Agatha. James. So, um... Did you get my letters, my emails, my answer phone and text messages? I did indeed. I pressed delete so many times I may suffer from repetitive strain injury. 
James. I am so sorry about what happened and I didn't mean to hurt you. I really thought Jimmy was dead and when I found out he wasn't, well, by then it was too late. And I knew he was going to die eventually. We're all going to die eventually. You really should have waited for him to make a decent fist of it. But that's the difference between you and me. When I was in the army, if we had orders to kill, it wasn't enough for the enemy to be nearly dead or well on the way or dead-ish. They did actually have to reach a state where their toes were turning blue. I know what I did was wrong, but I only did it because I couldn't bear the thought of losing you. Alas, I had similar feelings towards you, although in retrospect I realise I was misguided. James. Your phone is ringing. It doesn't matter. This is important. I really think you should pick up. There's clearly one person in this world who wants you. Hello. Well, I hope you're pleased with yourself. What's that supposed to mean? Really? Picking on a poor woman when she's at her most vulnerable. She's about as vulnerable as a Sherman tank. When did this happen? Breaking her heart like a tiny flower crushed underfoot. I used to have a heart once. Really? Well, I find that very hard to believe. Now, if you'll excuse me, we're finishing off our Sunday lunch. Yes, of course. Well, I hope you choke on a chicken bone. Actually, we're not having chicken, we're having monkfish. Oh, yes, of course. Well, pardon me for messing with a man who eats monkfish. Indeed. I'll be there right away. Thanks. Well, James, it looks as though you'll have to avoid eye contact with me for a little bit longer. Mrs. Wendell is prepared to sell my cottage back to me, so I'll be moving next door to you in a few days. Oh, Lord. Furthermore, the police have dropped all charges, so I'm an innocent woman. Well, that's debatable. And since good things come in threes, I'm off to buy a lottery ticket. Come along, Roy. Bye. Bye. Well, Mrs. Raisin, I suppose it's all worked out rather well. Not only do you get your house back, but I've had the whole place redecorated. So I see. I've never seen so many gold light fittings. Oh, that was Roger's doing. He says you don't need to be a Dane to live like Barbara Cartland. But you know, I don't feel it's worth all the effort. I'm fed up with having to rise at six in the morning to make half a dozen breakfasts. Mrs. Wendell, apart from me, I don't think you've ever had any guests. I know, which makes the whole process all the more demoralising. The mind boggles. I mean, I've tried. Really, I've tried. I went down to a local restaurant to distribute flyers. The Waddling Duck. Do you know it? I haven't been, but on a clear day I can smell their bouillabaisse. It's supposed to have two Michelin stars, but in the whole restaurant there was only one person wearing a tie, and that had a picture of Homer Simpson on it. These are not my kind of people. These are people who go on holiday to Falaraki and share Elko Pops with people from Swindon. Well, they'd have felt at home here. Frankly, I feel this whole country has gone to the dogs. So... I've decided to move somewhere where British values are still upheld. I'm opening a small hotel on the Falkland Islands. Mrs. Wendell, uh, when do you set sail? In a few days' time, but not before my swan song performance at the village hall. We're putting on a little something with singing and dancing and scenes from Titus Andronicus. We're calling it the Carsley Talent Show. Why are you calling it that? Of course, I shall be doing what I usually do with Noel Coward. And if there's time, I shall try and wrap my tonsils round Ivor Novello. Are you coming? I think I'm busy that night. When is it? On Saturday, at one o'clock sharp. But you know, even show business doesn't have the same allure that it used to. Once the audience is sat there... Absolutely wrapped, hanging on to my every aphorism. Now they sit there unwrapping boiled sweets, hanging on till the cream tea in the interval. So you see, I'm just an old actress who's lost her motivation.
Rose, and thank you so much for helping. No bother at all, Mrs. Bloxby. Anyway, I always think these concerts sound much better from the kitchen. Yes, just listen to Mrs. Oh. Wendell. We're trying to raise money to repair the roof, but I think at this rate we might need a new one. Or a whole new village. <laughs> do, you know, do you know, there was a misprint in the programme. Apparently she's performing a medley from the Pilates of Pensals. <laughs> I tried Pilates once. They've been absolute agony, but not as much as this. <laughs> ah, but we shall miss her when she's in the Falklands. Yes, they will probably still hear her. Oh, and I pity those poor penguins. Yes! Uh, Mrs. Bloxby? Yes, dear. When did she decide to set sail? Oh, it was all rather sudden, really. I think it was just after the police dropped their charges against you. Oh, really? Yes. Well, that's the refreshments already. Shall we go and catch the end of Act One? Oh, yes. It's Bill Wong doing whatever it is he does. Oh, let's take the trolley with us, shall we? I think people might be glad of a cup of tea. Well, they've <laughs> certainly earned it. <laughs> Constable Wong, and he's oh, going to be performing oh, feats of mystery and imagination, and they'll be followed by a much welcome cup of tea. Oh, Ladies oh, and gentlemen, oh, Bill Wong. Go on, Bill. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> <laughs> now, for my first trick, I'm going to be needing a volunteer from the audience. Now, how about you, madam? Uh, oh, no, uh, uh, I'm just Oh, no, I think we all want to see Mrs. Wendell in my magic cabinet, don't we, ladies? <laughs> Go up here and mind your feather bow in the door, will you? Mrs. Wendell, in your bow. That's it. That he does it. Now, I close the door and I say the magic words. Hocus pocus, let's have a beer. Make Mrs. Wendell disappear. Oh, where is she gone? Ah. I'll just file a missing persons report and then I say, Hocus, hocus, come back, my beauty. One more beer. Not while I'm on duty. <laughs> Hang on a minute. Now, where is she gone? I'm not surprised you can't find her, Bill. Can't find your brains on a good side. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mrs. Parker. Thank, thank you. Mrs. Bloxby. Yes, dear. Uh, could you hold the fort for a minute? I have a disappearing act of my own to do. Oh, uh, yeah, yes, yes, uh, of course. Um, okay, okay. Uh, everybody, uh, tea's being served. Um, Mrs. Asquith, could you come and lend a hand? Uh, Mrs. Wendell? Oh, Mrs. Raisin. You caught me by surprise. Not half as surprised as Bill Wong was when he found his magic cabinet empty. Oh, yes, I, I feel dreadful about that. I just suddenly had an attack of claustrophobia. Indeed, there were 100 people who witnessed your terror. Ah, well, I, I must get back lots of packing and so forth. I'll come with you. Uh, well, uh, you can come as far as my threshold, but I, I'm afraid I'm far too busy to ask you in for tea. Oh, a cup of tea is the last thing I was hoping for. Very well then, but quick six, I've got lots to do. Oh, you can't go that way. What? Why ever not? Well, uh, Mulberry Street's closed with a burst water main, oh. but uh, we could cut across Hunter's Field. All right, Hunter's Field it is then. <sighs> I must say, it's come as a bit of a surprise to everyone that you're leaving, having been part of village life for so long. Really? Well, I can think of many reasons one might wish to leave England. And if you don't know them, I suggest you read the Daily Mail. Interesting that you made your decision just after the police dropped their charges against me. I wasn't aware of the precise timing. The whole world doesn't revolve around you, you know. I imagine when the police let me go and started looking for new suspects, one or two people must have been very anxious. Well, I'm sure the murderer was. Whoever he or she might be. Yes, they must have been. Almost as anxious as you were when D.C. Wong led you into a small dark cabinet and closed the door. Mrs. Raisin, you seem to be off on one of your reveries again. Hmm. How surprising. After all, we are in the exact spot where Jimmy was murdered. Are we? Oh, I didn't know that. I went for a walk in the middle of the night and I happened to bump into Jimmy. 
We had a blazing row, at the end of which I pushed him backwards into this ditch. Oh. Only I now realise Jimmy and I weren't alone. Someone had followed me here, and when I was gone, they stayed and finished off what I'd started. Oh, how very tragic. Are you all right, Mrs. Wendell? Uh, yes. Uh, why shouldn't I be? You seem to be uh, fingering your pearls. Well, it, it, it unsettles me, talking about, about that poor man. And yet you never met Jimmy. Or did you? Mrs. Raisin, what are you insinuating? Mrs. Wendell, believe me, I'm the only person in the world who knows what you went through. Jimmy had a horrible habit of hurting women. He spent weeks using his silver-tongued charm on them, but as soon as they were under his spell, he would put the boot in. Now, I don't know what he did to you, but I promise you, you don't have to suffer alone. Mrs. Raisin, of all the people in the world I could unburden my heart to, I never thought I'd choose you. I... I met Jimmy just over 20 years ago. It was when my husband Norman and I were first married. You never met Norman, did you? But he was a wonderful man. Big and broad-shouldered, but with puppy dog's eyes. And in those days, everything between us was almost perfect. Except? Except mm, we couldn't have children. Norman said not to worry, we had each other, but I kept thinking, if we didn't have a family, what was going to keep us together when my charms started to fade? My doctor seemed to think the problem lay with Norman rather than me, but he refused to accept there was a problem. He, he said, just give it time, the stork will arrive when it's good and ready. Yes, men are awfully good at burying their heads in the sand. But um, where does Jimmy come into this? On our fifth wedding anniversary, Norman whisked me away to the most wonderful hotel in West London. I mean, we're talking crystal chandeliers in every bathroom. But sometimes, if you're in the most beautiful surroundings, it only makes you realise how lonely you are inside. I know the feeling well. Jimmy Raisin was working in that hotel as a bar steward. A frightfully dangerous occupation for someone with his condition. And every evening, as I lost myself in a creme de menthe, he used to look at me with his beautiful emerald eyes. Yes, they were beautiful when they weren't swimming. Oh, Mrs. Raisin, this is so hard to say, but mm, I won't be free till I've said it. Sometimes, when Norman was snoring, I would go downstairs for a nightcap. Jimmy poured me a drink and I poured out my troubles. And after one drink led to another and another, I let him take a long, hard look into my well of loneliness. And when we were both up to our necks, so to speak, he told me that he could give me the most wonderful gift that would probably save my marriage. He could give me the gift of a baby. I can almost hear him say it. He had the power to make you believe that everything would turn out just right, just perfect, just the way you dream. I know. And all I could dream about was having a baby. I know it sounds sordid, but we were strangers in the night. For one insane moment, it seemed the answer to my prayers. Jimmy did bear an extraordinary resemblance to Norm. So if our liaison should have borne fruit, the, the baby would have had Norman's puppy dog eyes and Norman's perfect little nose. So you went to bed with Jimmy? Not to bed as such. We made love behind the bar on a packing crate containing 200 bottles of Canada Dry. Nine months later, my son Edward was born. He was gorgeous. I, I mean, he still is gorgeous. And for one magical moment, it looked like we were all going to live happily ever after. But there's always a twist in the tale? Yes. 
I forgot that as an employee of the hotel, Jimmy was able to find out where I lived, and he naturally turned up to wet the baby's head. He was a very hard man to get rid of. Indeed, and he stood on my doorstep, demanding to see our son. But Norman was home, and he heard every word. He sent Jimmy away, but the damage was already done. It poisoned our marriage. Norman never forgave me, and in time... He even turned Edward against me. I mean, Eddie's at college now, but he never phones. He never writes. When you first met me, Mrs. Wendell, you must have been a bit surprised by my surname. I mean, Raisin's not the most common of names. It did surprise me, and it wasn't long before the penny dropped. It's a very small world, Mrs. Raisin. But then, broken-hearted women always seem to gravitate towards villages, in much the same way that drunks move to big cities. A month before my wedding, you were very keen to find out if Jimmy was still alive. At first, I thought you were just being nosy. But now, I realise you wanted to know if he'd be coming to the wedding or not. That's right, Mrs. Raisin. Because the very thought of it made my blood run cold. And when I heard he was here, I could feel the hairs on the back of my neck stand on end. But I thought, stay calm, wait for him to leave. I won't see him, I won't talk to him. But you left the house in the middle of the night, and I couldn't resist the temptation to follow. <sighs> Mrs. Wendell, it took a lot of courage for you to tell me this. And now... I really think you should tell the police, because even if you run away, the pain will go with you and you'll never be free. Jimmy will have you in his power forever. I couldn't tell the police. I, I mean, they wouldn't understand what I've been through, what Jimmy led me to. Well, then I will gladly stand up in court and tell the world what a monster Jimmy was and quite how far I would have gone to get rid of him. But that's just the thing. We'll never get rid of him. What do you mean? Oh, Jimmy hasn't gone. He's still here. He's lying over there in that ditch. Mrs. Wendell, I'm not falling for that. Oh, there is someone. It's all right, ladies. It's only me. And I'd like you both to accompany me to the police station. Oh, oh poor Mrs. Wendell. Yes, I don't exactly approve of what she did, but I can understand exactly what led her to it. Mm. I do hope prison isn't too much of a trial. Oh, she's a tough old bird. Yes, yes. And of course, they do have drama groups and singing. She could even put on concerts for all the other inmates. <laughs> and for once in her life, she's got a captive audience. Mm. <laughs> right. Now, there's just the small matter of making peace with James. Oh, yes. <clears throat> James. I mean, why does he still have to avoid me? I know I did a terrible thing, but he surely knows what I've just been through. Uh, well, I, I, it's not so much that he's uh, avoiding you. It's more that he, um, he uh, isn't actually here anymore. Oh, he hasn't gone back to Greenwich, surely? Um, no, uh, a little bit further afield. Um, Corsica. What? But that's where we were going for our honeymoon. How could he? Oh, Mrs. Raisin, it hasn't been easy for James either, but I think he just wanted a little bit of peace and quiet and some time on his own. Really? Well, James, that may be what you want, but I'm coming to get you. In Agatha Raisin, Penelope Keith starred as Agatha and Malcolm Sinclair was James. Harriet was played by Belinda Lang and Mrs. Bloxby by Liza Sadovy. Stephen Hogan was DC Wong. James Holmes, Roy, Tina Gray, Mrs. Wendell, and Tim Whitnell was Martin. Agatha Raisin was dramatised by David Semple from the novel by M.C. Beaton, and the producer was Carol Smith. Agatha Raisin by M.C. Beaton. Dramatised for radio by David Semple and starring Penelope Keith as Agatha. 